section one of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lynn thompson the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight by anonymous translated by richard francis burton section one when it was the seven hundred and seventy-seventh night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the old queen heard the handmaid's words, she was wroth with sore wrath because of her, and cried, How shall there be accord between man and jinn? But Saif al-Muluk replied, Indeed I will conform to thy will, and be thy page, and die in thy love, and will keep with thee covenant and regard none but thee so right soon shalt thou see my truth and lack of falsehood and the excellence of my manly dealing with thee inshallah the old woman pondered for a full hour with brow earthwards bent after which she raised her head and said to him o thou beautiful youth wilt thou indeed keep compact and covenant he replied yes by him who raised the heavens and dispread the earth upon the waters i will keep faith and troth thereupon quoth she i will win for thee thy wish inshallah but for the present go thou into the garden and take thy pleasure therein and eat of its fruits that have neither like in the world nor equal whilst i send for my son shahyal and confabulate with him of the matter nothing but good shall come of it so allah please for he will not gainsay me nor disobey my commandment and i will marry thee with his daughter badia al jamal so be of good heart for she shall assuredly be thy wife o saif al muluk the prince thanked her for those words and kissing her hands and feet went forth from her into the garden while she turned to marjana and said to her Go seek my son Shayal, wherever he is, and bring him to me. So Marjana went out in quest of King Shayal, and found him, and set him before his mother. On such wise fared it with them. But as regards Saif al Muluk, whilst he walked in the garden, lo and behold, five jinn of the people of the blue king espied him, and said to one another, Whence cometh yonder white, and who brought him hither? Haply tis he who slew the son and heir of our lord and master the blue king presently adding but we will go about with him and question him and find out all from him so they walked gently and softly up to him as he sat in a corner of the garden and sitting down by him said to him o beauteous youth thou didst right well in slaying the son of the blue king and delivering him from daulat khatoun for he was a treacherous hound and he tricked her and had not allah appointed thee to her she had never won free no never but how didst thou slay him saif al muluk looked at them and deeming them of the garden folk answered i slew him by means of this ring which is on my finger therewith they were assured that it was he who had slain him so they seized him two of them holding his hands whilst other two held his feet and the fifth his mouth lest he should cry out and king shayal's people should hear him and rescue him from their hands then they lifted him up and flying away with him ceased not their flight till they came to their king and set him down before him saying o king of the age we bring thee the murderer of thy son where is he asked the king and they answered this is he so the blue king said to saif al muluk how slewest thou my son the core of my heart and the light of my sight without aught of right for all he had done thee no ill deed quoth the prince yea verily i slew him because of his violence and frowardness in that he used to seize kings daughters and sever them from their families and carry them to the ruined well and the high-builded castle of japhet son of noah and entreat them lewdly by debauching them I slew him by means of this ring on my finger, and Allah hurried his soul to the fire and the abiding place dire. 
therewithal the king was assured that this was indeed he who slew his son so presently he called his wazirs and said to them this is the murtherer of my son sans shadow of doubt so how do you counsel me to deal with him shall i slay him with the foulest slaughter or torture him with the terriblest torments or how quoth the chief minister cut off his limbs one a day another beat him with a grievous beating every day till he die a third cut him across the middle a fourth chop off all his fingers and burn him with fire a fifth crucify him and so on each speaking according to his reed now there was with the blue king an old emir versed in the vicissitudes and experienced in the exchanges of the times and he said o king of the age verily i would say to thee somewhat and thine is the reed whether thou wilt hearken or not to my say now he was the king's privy counsellor and the chief officer of his empire and the sovereign was wont to give ear to his word and conduct himself by his counsel and gainsay him not in aught so he rose and kissing ground before his liege lord said to him o king of the age if i advise thee in this matter wilt thou follow my advice and grant me indemnity quoth the king set forth thine opinion and thou shalt have immunity then quoth he o king of the age and this slay this one nor accept my advice nor hearken to my word in very sooth i say that his death were now inexpedient for that he is thy prisoner and in thy power and under thy protection so when as thou wilt thou mayst lay hand on him and do with him what thou desirest have patience then o king of the age for he hath entered the garden of iram and is become the betrothed of badia al jamal daughter of king shayal and one of them thy people seized him there and brought him hither and he did not hide his case from them or from thee so an thou slay him assuredly king shayal will seek blood revenge and lead his host against thee for his daughter's sake and thou canst not cope with him nor make head against his power so the king hearkened to his counsel and commanded to imprison the captive thus fared it with saif al muluk but as regards the old queen grandmother of badia al jamal when her son shayal came to her she dispatched marjana in search of saif al muluk but she found him not and returning to her mistress said i found him not in the garden so the ancient dame sent for the gardeners and questioned them of the prince quoth they we saw him sitting under a tree when behold five of the blue king's folk alighted by him and spoke with him after which they took him up and having gagged him flew away with him when the old queen heard the damsel's words it was no light matter to her and she was wroth with exceeding wrath so she rose to her feet and said to her son king shayal art a king and shall the blue king's people come to our garden and carry off our guests unhindered and thou alive and she proceeded to provoke him saying it behoveth not that any transgress against us during thy lifetime answered he o mother of me this man slew the blue king's son who was a genie and allah threw him into his hand he is a genie and i am a genie how then shall i go to him and make war on him for the sake of a mortal but she rejoined go to him and demand our guest of him and if he be still alive and the blue king deliver him to thee take him and return but an he have slain him take the king and all his children and harem and household depending on him then bring them to me alive that i may cut their throats with my own hand and lay in ruins his reign except thou go to him and do my bidding i will not acquit thee of my milk and my rearing of thee shall be counted unlawful and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and seventy-eighth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the grandmother of badia al jamal said to shayal fare thee to the blue king and look after saif al muluk if he be still in life come with him hither but an he have slain him 
take that king and all his children and harem and the whole of his dependents and protégés and bring them here alive that i may cut their throats with my own hand and ruin his realm except thou go to him and do my bidding i will not acquit thee of my milk and my rearing of thee shall be accounted unlawful thereupon shayal rose and assembling his troops set out in deference to his mother desiring to content her and her friends and in accordance with what so had been foreordained from eternity without beginning nor did they leave journeying till they came to the land of the blue king who met them with his army and gave them battle the blue king's host was put to the rout and the conquerors having taken him and all his sons great and small the grandees and officers bound and brought them before king shayal who said to the captain o azrak where is the mortal saif al muluk who willem was my guest answered the blue king o shayal thou art a genie and i am a genie and isn't on account of a mortal who slew my son that thou hast cast this deed yea the murther of my son the core of my liver and solace of my soul how couldst thou work such work and spill the blood of so many thousand jinn he replied leave this talk knowest thou not that a single mortal is better in allah's sight than a thousand jinn if he be alive bring him to me and i will set thee free and all whom i have taken of thy sons and people but an thou have slain him i will slaughter thee and thy sons quoth malik al azrak o king is this man of more account with thee than my son and quoth shayal verily thy son was an evil-doer who kidnapped king's daughters and shut them up in the ruined well and the high-builded castle of japhet son of noah and entreated them lewdly then said the blue king he is with me but make thou peace between us so he delivered the prince to shayal who made peace between him and the blue king and al azrak gave him a bond of absolution for the death of his son then shayal conferred robes of honour on them and entertained the blue king and his troops hospitably for three days after which he took saif al muluk and carried him back to the old queen his own mother who rejoiced in him with an exceeding joy and Shairal marvelled at the beauty of the prince, and his loveliness and his perfection. Then the prince related to him his story from beginning to end, especially what did befall him with Badia al Jamal. And Shayal said, O my mother, since tis thy pleasure that this should be, I hear and I obey all that to command it pleaseth thee. Wherefore do thou take him and bear him to Sarandib? and there celebrate his wedding and marry him to her in all state for he is a goodly youth and hath endured horrors for her sake so she and her maidens set out with saif al muluk for sarandib and entering the garden belonging to the queen of hind foregathered with daulat khatun and badia al jamal then the lovers met and the old queen acquainted the two princesses with all that had passed between saif al muluk and the blue king and how the prince had been near hand to a captive's death but in reputation is no fruition then king taj al muluk father of daulat khatun assembled the lords of his land and drew up the contract of marriage between saif al muluk and badia al jamal and he conferred costly robes of honour and gave banquets to the lieges then saif al muluk rose and kissing ground before the king said to him o king pardon i would fain ask of thee somewhat but i fear lest thou refuse it to my disappointment taj al muluk replied by allah though thou soughtest my soul of me i would not refuse it to thee after all the kindness thou hast done me quoth saif al muluk i wish thee to marry the princess daulat khatun to my brother said and we will both be thy pages i hear and obey answered taj al muluk and assembling his grandees a second time let draw up the contract of marriage between his daughter and said after which they scattered gold and silver and the king bade decorate the city so they held high festival and saif al muluk went in unto badia al jamal and said went in unto daulat khatun 
on the same night moreover Saif al muluk abode forty days with badia al jamal at the end of which she said to him o king's son say me is there left in thy heart any regret for aught and he replied allah forfend i have accomplished my quest and there abideth no regret in my heart at all but i would fain meet my father and my mother in the land of egypt and see if they continue in welfare or not so she commanded a company of her slaves to convey them to egypt and they carried them to cairo where saif al muluk and said foregathered with their parents and abode with them a week after which they took leave of them and returned to sarandib city and from this time forwards whenever they longed for their folk they used to go to them and return then saif al muluk and badia al jamal abode in all solace of life and its joyance as did said and daulat khartoum till there came to them the destroyer of delights and severer of societies and they all died good muslims so glory be to the living one who dieth not who createth all creatures and decreeth to them death and who is the first without beginning and the last without end this is all that hath come down to us of the story of saif al muluk and badia al jamal and allah alone wotteth the truth but not less excellent than this tale is the history of hassan of bazora there was once of days of yours and in ages and times long gone before a merchant who dwelt in the land of bassora and who owned two sons and wealth galore in due time allah the all-hearing the all-knowing decreed that he should be admitted to the mercy of the most high so he died and his two sons laid him out and buried him after which they divided his gardens and estates equally between them and of his portion each one opened a shop presently the elder son hassan hight a youth of passing beauty and loveliness symmetry and perfect grace betook himself to the company of lewd folk women and low boys frolicking with them in gardens and feasting them with meat and wine for months together and occupying himself not with his business like as his father had done for that he exulted in the abundance of his good after some time he had wasted all his ready money so he sold all his father's lands and houses and played the wastrel until there remained in his hand nothing neither little nor muchel nor was one of his comrades left who knew him he abode thus and hungered he and his widowed mother three days and on the fourth day as he walked along unknowing whither to wend there met him a man of his father's friends who questioned him of his case he told him what had befallen him and the other said o oh my son i have a brother who is a goldsmith and thou wilt thou shalt be with him and learn his craft and become skilled therein hassan consented and accompanied him to his brother to whom he commended him saying in very sooth this is my son do thou teach him for my sake so hassan abode with the goldsmith and busied himself with the craft and allah opened to him the door of gain and in due course he set up shop for himself one day as he sat in his booth in the bazaar there came up to him an ajami a foreigner a persian with a great white beard and a white turban on his head having the semblance of a merchant who after saluting him looked at his handiwork and examined it knowingly it pleased him and he shook his head saying by allah thou art a cunning goldsmith what may be thy name hassan replied the other shortly the persian continued to look at his wares whilst hassan read in an old book he hent in hand and the folk were taken up with his beauty and loveliness and symmetry and perfect grace till the hour of mid-afternoon prayer when the shop became clear of people and the persian accosted the young man saying o oh, my son thou art a comely youth what book is that thou hast no sire and i have no son and i know an art than which there is no goodlier in the world and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section 1
when it was the seven hundred and seventy-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Persian accosted the young man, saying, O my son, thou art a comely youth, thou hast no sire, and I have no son, and I know an art, than which there is no goodlier in the world. Many have sought of me instruction therein, but I consented not to instruct any of them in it. Yet hath my soul consented that I teach it to thee, for thy love hath gotten hold upon my heart, and I will make thee my son, and set up between thee and poverty a barrier. So shalt thou be quit of this handicraft, and toil no more with hammer and anvil, charcoal and fire. Hassan asked, O oh my lord, and when wilt thou teach me this? And the Persian answered, To-morrow, inshallah, I will come to thee betimes, and make thee in thy presence fine gold of this copper. Whereupon Hassan rejoiced, and sat talking with the Persian till nightfall, when he took leave of him, and going in to his mother, saluted her with the salam, and ate with her. But he was dazed, without memory or reason, for that the stranger's words had gotten hold upon his heart. So she questioned him, and he told her what had passed between himself and the Persian, which when she heard, her heart fluttered, and she strained him to her bosom, saying, O oh my son, beware of hearkening to the talk of the folk, and especially of the Persians, and obey them not in aught, for they are sharpers and tricksters, who profess the art of alchemy, and swindle people, and take their money, and devour it in vain. Replied Hassan, O oh, my mother, we are paupers, and have nothing he may covet that he should put a cheat on us. Indeed, this Persian is a right worthy sheikh, and the signs of virtue are manifest on him. Allah hath inclined his heart to me, and he hath adopted me to son. She was silent in her chagrin, and he passed the night without sleep, his heart being full of what the Persian had said to him. Nor did slumber visit him for the excess of his joy therein. But when morning morrowed, he rose and, taking the keys, opened the shop, whereupon, behold, the Persian accosted him. Hassan stood up to him and would have kissed his hands, but he forbade him from this, and suffered it not, saying, O oh, Hassan, set on the crucible and apply the bellows. So he did as the stranger bade him, and lighted the charcoal. Then said the Persian, O oh, my son, hast thou any copper? And he replied, I have a broken platter. So he bade him work the shears, and cut it into bittocks, and cast it into the crucible, and blow up the fire with the bellows, till the copper became liquid. When he put hand to turban, and took therefrom a folded paper, and opening it, sprinkled thereout into the pot about half a dram of what looked like yellow coal or eye-powder. Then he bade Hassan blow upon it with the bellows, and he did so, till the contents of the crucible became a lump of gold. When the youth saw this, he was stupefied and at his wit's end, for the joy he felt, and taking the ingot from the crucible, handled it and tried it with the file, and found it pure gold, of the finest quality, whereupon his reason fled, and he was dazed with excess of delight, and bent over the Persian's hand to kiss it. But he forbade him, saying, Art thou married? And Hassan replied, No. He said, Carry this ingot to the market, and sell it, and take the price in haste, and speak not. So Hassan went down into the market, and gave the bar to the broker, who took it and rubbed it upon the touchstone, and found it pure gold. So they opened the biddings at ten thousand dirhams, and the merchants bid against one another for it up to fifteen thousand dirhams, at which price he sold it, and taking the money, went home and told his mother all that had passed, saying, O oh, my mother, I have learnt this art and mystery. But she laughed at him, saying, there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say
when it was the seven hundred and eightieth night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hassan the goldsmith told his mother what he had done with the ajami and cried i have learnt this art and mystery she laughed at him saying there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great and she was silent for vexation he took a metal mortar and returning to the shop laid it before the persian who was still sitting there and asked him o oh, my son what wilt thou do with this mortar hassan answered let us put it into the fire and make it lumps of gold the persian laughed and rejoined o oh, my son art thou jinn mad that thou wouldst go down into the market with two ingots of gold in one day knowest thou not that the folk would suspect us and our lives would be lost now o oh my son as i teach thee this craft thou must practise it but once in each twelve month for that will suffice thee from year to year cried hassan true o oh my lord and sitting down in his open shop set on the crucible and cast more charcoal on the fire quoth the persian what wilt thou o oh my son and quoth hassan teach me this craft there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great exclaimed the persian laughing verily o oh my son thou art little of wit and in no wise fitted for this noble craft did ever any during all his life learn this art on the beaten way or in the bazaars if we busy ourselves with it here the folk will say of us these practice alchemy and the magistrates will hear of us and we shall lose our lives wherefore o oh my son as thou desire to learn this mystery forthright come thou with me to my house so hassan barred his shop and went with that ajami but by the way he remembered his mother's words and thinking in himself a thousand thoughts he stood still with bowed head the persian turned and seeing him thus standing laughed and said to him art thou mad what i in my heart purpose thee good and thou misdoubtest i will harm thee presently adding but if thou fear to go with me to my house i will go with thee to thine and teach thee there hassan replied tis well o uncle and the persian rejoined go thou before me so hassan led the way to his own house and entering told his mother of the persian's coming for he had left him standing at the door she ordered the house for them and when she had made an end of furnishing and adorning it her son bade her to go to one of the neighbors lodgings so she left her home to them and wended her way whereupon Hassan brought in the Persian, who entered after asking leave. Then he took in hand a dish, and going to the market returned with food, which he set before the Persian, saying, Eat, O my lord, that between us there may be bread and salt, and may Almighty Allah do vengeance upon the traitor to bread and salt. The Persian replied with a smile, True, O my son, who knoweth the virtue and worth of bread and salt then he came forward and ate with hassan till they were satisfied after which the ajami said o oh my son hassan bring us somewhat of sweetmeats so hassan went to the market rejoicing in his words and returned with ten sauces of sweetmeats of which they both ate and the persian said may allah abundantly requite thee o oh my son it is the like of thee with whom folk company and to whom they discover their secrets and teach what may profit him then he said o oh, hassan bring the gear but hardly did hassan hear these words than he went forth like a colt led out to grass in springtide and hastening to the shop fetched the apparatus and set it before the persian who pulled out a piece of paper and said o oh, hassan by the bond of bread and salt wert thou not dearer to me 
that my son i would not let thee into the mysteries of this art for i have none of the elixir left save what is in this paper but by and by i will compound the simples whereof it is composed and i will make it before thee know o my son hassan that to every ten pounds of copper thou must set half a drachm of that which is in this paper and the whole ten will presently become unalloyed virgin gold presently adding o my son o hassan there are in this paper three ounces egyptian measure and when it is spent i will make the other and more hassan took the packet and finding therein a yellow powder finer than the first said to the persian o oh my lord what is the name of this substance and where is it found and how is it made but he laughed longing to get hold of the youth and replied of what dost thou question indeed thou art a forward boy do thy work and hold thy peace so hassan arose and fetching a brass platter from the house shore it in shreds and threw it into the melting pot then he scattered on it a little of the powder from the paper and it became a lump of pure gold when he saw this he joyed with exceeding joy and was filled with amazement and could think of nothing save the gold but whilst he was occupied with taking up the lumps of metal from the melting pot the persian pulled out of his turban in haste a packet of cretan bang which if an elephant smelt he would sleep from night to night and cutting off a little thereof put it in a piece of the sweetmeat then he said o oh, hassan thou art become my very son and dearer to me than soul and wealth and i have a daughter whose like never have eyes beheld for beauty and loveliness symmetry and perfect grace now i see that thou befittest none but her and she none but thee wherefore if it be allah's will i will marry thee to her replied hassan i am thy servant and what so good thou dost me will be a deposit with the almighty and the persian rejoined o my son have fair patience and fair shall betide thee therewith he gave him the piece of sweetmeat and he took it and kissing his hand put it in his mouth knowing not what was hidden for him in the after time for only the lord of futurity knoweth the future but hardly had he swallowed it than he fell down head foregoing heels and was lost to the world whereupon the persian seeing him in such a calamitous case rejoiced exceedingly and cried oh thou hast fallen into my snares o gallows carrion o dog of the arabs this many a year have i sought thee and now i have found thee o hassan and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and eighty-first night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hassan the goldsmith ate the bit of sweetmeat given to him by the ajami and fell fainting to the ground the persian rejoiced exceedingly and cried this many a year have i sought thee and now i have found thee then he girt himself and pinioned hassan's arms and binding his feet to his hands laid him in a chest which he emptied to that end and locked it upon him moreover he cleared another chest and laying therein all hassan's valuables together with the piece of the first gold lump and the second ingot which he had made locked it with a padlock then he ran to the market and fetching a porter took up the two chests and made off with them to a place within sight of the city where he set them down on the seashore hard by a vessel at anchor there now this craft had been freighted and fitted out by the persian and her master was waiting him so when the crew saw him they came to him and bore the two chests on board then the persian called out to the rice or captain saying up and let us be off 
for I have done my desire and won my wish. So the skipper sang out to the sailor, saying, Weigh anchor and set sail, and the ship put out to sea with a fair wind. So far concerning the Persian, but as regards Hassan's mother, she awaited him till supper time, but heard neither sound nor news of him. So she went into the house, and finding it thrown open, entered and saw no one there, and missed the two chests and their valuables. Wherefore she knew that her son was lost, and that doom had overtaken him. And she buffeted her face, and rent her raiment, crying out and wailing, and saying, Alas, my son, ah! Alas, the fruit of my vitals, ah! And she recited these couplets. My patience fails me and grows anxiety, and with your absence growth of grief I see. By Allah, patience went what time ye went. Loss of all hope, how suffer patiently? When lost, my loved one, how can joy I sleep? Who shall enjoy such life of low degree? Thou art gone, and desolating house and home. Hast foul the fount, erst flowed from foulness free. Thou wast my fame, my grace, mid folk, my stay. Mine aid was thou in all adversity. Perish the day when from mine eyes they bore my friend, till sight I thy return to me. And she ceased not to weep and wail till the dawn, when the neighbors came in to her and asked her of her son, and she told them what had befallen him with the Persian, assured that she should never, never see him again. Then she went round about the house, weeping and wending. She espied two lines written upon the wall, so she sent for a scholar who read them to her, and they were these. Layla's phantom came by night, when drowsiness had overcome me, toward morning while my companions were sleeping in the desert. But when we awoke to behold the nightly phantom, I saw the air vacant, and the place of visitation was distant. When Hassan's mother heard these lines, she shrieked and said, Yes, O oh my son, indeed the house is desolate, and the visitation place is distant. Then the neighbors took leave of her, and after they had prayed that she might be vouchsafed patience and speedy reunion with her son, went away. But she ceased not to weep all watches of the night and tides of the day, and she built a middlemost the house, a tomb whereupon she let write Hassan's name and the date of his loss, and thenceforward she quitted it not, but made a habit of incessantly biding thereby night and day. Such was her case, but touching her son Hassan and the Ajami, this Persian was a Magian, who hated Moslems with exceeding hatred, and destroyed all who fell into his power. He was a lewd and filthy villain, a hankerer after alchemy, an astrologer and a hunter of hidden hordes, such a one as he of whom quoth the poet, a dog, dog-fathered by dog-grandsire bred, no good in dog from dog-race issued, e'en for a gnat no resting-place gives he, who is composed of seed by all men shed. The name of this accursed was Barum, the Guabra, and he was wont, every year, to take a Muslim and cut his throat for his own purposes. So when he had carried out his plot against Hassan the goldsmith, they sailed on from dawn till dawn, when the ship made fast to the shore for the night, and at sunrise, when they set sail again, Baram bade his black slaves and white servants bring him the chest wherein were Hassan. They did so, and he opened it, and taking out the young man made him sniff up vinegar and blew a powder into his nostrils. Hassan sneezed and vomited the balm. Then, opening his eyes, he looked about him right and left, and saw himself a middleward the sea on board a ship in full sail, and saw the Persian sitting by him, whereupon he knew that the accursed 
Magian had put a cheat on him, and that he had fallen into the very peril against which his mother had warned him. So he spake the saying which shall never shame the sayer, to wit, There is no majesty and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. Verity, we are Allah's, and unto him we are returning. O oh my God, be thou gracious to me in thine appointment. Give me patience to endure this thine affliction, O Lord of the three worlds. Then he turned to the Persian and bespoke him, softly saying, O oh my father, what fashion is this, and where is the covenant of bread and salt, and the oath thou swearest to me? But Barum stared at him and said, O oh dog! knoweth the like of me bond of bread and salt i have slain of use like thee a thousand save one and thou shalt make up the thousand and he cried out at him and hassan was silent knowing that the fate shaft had shot him and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section two Section 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Will Thompson, Franklin, Pennsylvania. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, 1821 to 1890. Section 3. When it was the 782nd night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Hassan beheld himself fallen into the hands of the damned Persian, he bespoke him softly, but gained not thereby. For the Ajami cried out at him in wrath, so he was silent, knowing that the fate shaft had shot him. Then the accursed bathed loose his pinion bonds, and they gave him a little water to drink, whilst the Magian laughed and said, By the virtue of the fire and the light and the shade and the heat, methought not thou wouldst fall into my nets, but the fire empowered me over thee and helped me to lay hold upon thee, that I might win my wish and return and make thee a sacrifice to her so she may accept of me. Quoth Hassan, Thou hast foully betrayed bread and salt. Whereupon the Magus raised his hand and dealt him such a buffet that he fell and, biting the deck with his foreteeth, swooned away, whilst the tears trickled down his cheeks. Then the Geber bade his servants light him a fire, and Hassan said, What wilt thou do with it? Replied the Magian, This is the fire, lady of light and sparkles bright this it is i worship and if thou wilt worship her even as i verily i will give thee half my monies and marry thee to my maiden daughter thereupon hassan cried angrily at him woe to thee thou art a miscreant magian who to fire dost pray in lieu of the king of omnipotent sway creator of night and day and this is not but a calamity among creeds at this the Magian was wroth, and said to him, Wilt thou not then conform with me, O dog of the Arabs, and enter my faith? But Hassan consented not to this. So the accursed Geber arose, and, prostrating himself to the fire, bade his pages throw him flat on his face. They did so, and he beat him with a hide whip made of plaited thongs, till his flanks were laid open, whilst he cried aloud for aid, but none aided him and besought protection, but none protected him. Then he raised his eyes to the all-powerful king, and sought of him succor in the name of the chosen prophet. And indeed patience failed him, his tears ran down his cheeks like rain, and he repeated these couplets twain. In patience, O oh my God, thy doom forecast, I'll bear, and thereby come thy grace at last. They've dealt us wrong, transgressed, and ordered ill. Haply thy grace shall pardon what is past. 
Then the Magian bade his negro slaves raise him to a sitting posture, and bring him somewhat of meat and drink. So they set food before him, but he consented not to eat or drink, and Bahram ceased not to torment him day and night during the whole voyage, whilst Hassan took patience and humbled himself in supplication before Almighty Allah, to whom belong honor and glory, whereby the Geber's heart was hardened against him. They ceased not to sail the sea three months, during which time Hassan was continually tortured, till Allah Almighty sent forth upon them a foul wind, and the sea grew black and rose against the ship, by reason of the fierce gale. Whereupon quoth the captain and crew, By Allah, this is all on account of yonder youth, who hath been these three months in torture with this Magian. Indeed, this is not allowed of God the Most High. Then they rose against the Magian, and slew his servants and all who were with him, which, when he saw, he made sure of death, and feared for himself. So he loosed Hassan from his bonds, and, pulling off the ragged clothes that he had on, clad him in others, and made excuses to him, and promised to teach him the craft, and restore him to his native land, saying, O my son, return me not evil, for that I have done with thee. Quoth Hassan, how can I ever rely upon thee again? And quoth Bahram, O my son, but for sin there were no pardon. Indeed, I did all these doings with thee but to try thy patience, and thou knowest that the case is altogether in the hands of Allah. So the crew and captain rejoiced in Hassan's release, and he called down blessings on them and praised the Almighty and thanked him. With this the wind was stilled, and the sky cleared, and with a fair breeze they continued their voyage. Then said Hassan to Bahram, O master, whither wendest thou? Replied the Magian, O my son, I am bound for the mountain of clouds, where is the elixir which we use in alchemy. And the Geber swore to him by the fire and the light that he had no longer any cause to fear him. So Hassan's heart was set at ease, and rejoicing at the Persian's words, he continued to eat and drink and sleep with the Magian, who clad him in his own raiment. They ceased not sailing on other three months, when the ship came to anchor off a long shoreline of many-colored pebbles, white and yellow and sky-blue and black and every other hue, and the Magian sprang up and said, Let us go ashore, for we have reached the place of our wish and will. So Hassan rose and landed with Bahram, after the Persian had commended his goods to the captain's care. They walked on inland, till they were far enough from the ship to be out of sight when Bahram sat down and, taking from his pocket a kettle drum of copper and a silken strap worked in gold with characts, beat the drum with the strap until there arose a cloud of dust from the further side of the waste. Hassan marveled at the Magian's doings and was afraid of him. He repented of having come ashore with him and his color changed. But Bahram looked at him and said, What aileth thee, O my son? By the truth of the fire and the light thou hast naught to fear from me. And, were it not that my wish may never be won save by thy means, I had not brought thee ashore. So rejoice in all good, for yonder cloud of dust is the dust of somewhat we will mount, and which will aid us to cut across this walled, and make easy to us the hardships thereof. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and eighty-third night, she continued, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Persian said to Hassan, In very sooth, yonder dust cloud is the cloud of something we will mount, and which will aid us to cut across this wall, and will make easy to us the hardships thereof. Presently the dust lifted off three she dromedaries, one of which Bahram mounted, and Hassan another. Then they loaded their victual on the third, and fared on seven days, till they came to a wide champagne and, descending into its mist, they saw a dome vaulted upon four pilasters of red gold. So they alighted, and, entering thereunder, ate and drank and took their rest. Anon Hassan chanced to glance aside, and, seeing from afar a something lofty, said to the Magian, What is that, O Nuncle? Bahram replied, Tis a palace. And quoth Hassan, Wilt thou not go thither? that we may enter and there repose ourselves and solace ourselves with inspecting it? But the Persian was wroth and said, Name not to me yonder palace, 
for therein dwelleth a foe, with whom there befell me somewhat whereof this is no time to tell thee. Then he beat the kettle drum, and up came the dromedaries, and they mounted and fared on other seven days. On the eighth day the Magian said, O Hassan, what seest thou? Hassan replied, I see clouds and mists twixt east and west. Quoth Bahram, That is neither clouds nor mists, but a vast mountain and a lofty, whereon the clouds split. And there are no clouds above it, for its exceeding height and surpassing elevation. Yon mount is my goal, and thereon is the need we seek. Tis for that I brought thee hither, for my wish may not be won save at thy hands. Hassan, hearing this, gave his life up for lost, and said to the Magian, By the right of that thou worshippest, and by the faith wherein thou believest, I conjure thee to tell me what is the object wherefore thou hast brought me. Bahram replied, Save by means of an herb, which groweth in the place where the clouds pass, and whereon they split. Such a sight is yonder mountain, upon whose head the herb groweth, and I purpose to send thee up thither to fetch it, and when we have it, I will show thee the secret of this craft which thou desirest to learn. Hassan answered in his fear, "'Tis well, O my master. And indeed he despaired of life and wept for his parting from his parent and people and patrial stead, repenting him of having gainsaid his mother and reciting these two couplets. Consider but thy Lord, his work shall bring comfort to thee with quick relief and near. Despair not when thou sufferest sorest bane, in vain how many blessed boons appear. They ceased not faring on till they came to the foothills of that mountain, where they halted, and Hassan saw thereon a palace, and asked Bahram, What be yonder palace? Whereto he answered, Tis the abode of the Jan and ghouls and satans. Then the Magian alighted, and making Hassan also dismount from his dromedary, kissed his head and said to him, Bear me no ill will anent that I did with thee, for I will keep guard over thee in thine ascent to the palace, and I conjure thee not to trick and cheat me of aught thou shalt bring therefrom, and I and thou will share equally therein. And Hassan replied, To hear is to obey. Then Bahram opened a bag, and taking out a handmill and a sufficiency of wheat, ground the grain and kneaded the three round cakes of the flour, after which he lighted a fire and baked the bannocks. Then he took out the copper kettle drum and beat it with the broidered strap, whereupon up came the dromedaries. He chose out one and said, Hearken, O my son, O Hassan, to what I am about to enjoin on thee. And Hassan replied, Tis well. Bahram continued, Lie down on the skin, and I will sew thee up therein and lay thee on the ground, whereupon the racham birds will come to thee and carry thee up to the mountain top. Take this knife with thee, and, when thou feelest that the birds have done flying and have set thee down, slit open therewith the knife, and come forth. The vultures will then take fright at thee, and fly away. Whereupon do thou look down from the mountain head, and speak to me, and I will tell thee what to do. So he sewed him up in the skin, placing therein three cakes and a leathern bottle full of water, and withdrew to a distance. Presently the vulture pounced upon him, and taking him up, flew away with him to the mountain top, and there set him down. As soon as Hassan felt himself on the ground, he slipped the skin, and coming forth, called out to the Magian, who hearing his speech rejoiced and danced for excessive joy, saying to him, Look behind thee, and tell me what thou seest. Hassan looked, and, seeing many rotten bones and much wood, told Bahram, who said to him, This be what we need and seek. Make six bundles of the wood, and throw them down to me, for this is wherewithal we do alchemy. So he threw him the six bundles, and when he had gotten them into his power, he said to Hassan, O gallows bird, I have won my wish of thee, and now, if thou wilt, thou mayst abide on this mountain, or cast thyself down to the earth and perish. So saying, he left him and went away, and Hassan exclaimed, There is no majesty, and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. This hound hath played traitor with me. And he sat bemoaning himself and reciting these couplets. When God upon a man possessed of reasoning, hearing and sight, his will in aught to pass would bring, he stops his ears and blinds his eyes and draws his wit, 
from him as one draws out the hairs to paste that cling till his decrees fulfilled he gives him back his wit that therewithal he may receive admonishing so say thou not of aught that haps how happened it for fate and fortune fixed do order everything and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and eighty-fourth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the magian sent hassan to the mountain top and made him throw down all he required he presently reviled him and left him and wended his ways and the youth exclaimed there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great this damned hound hath played the traitor then he rose to his feet and looked right and left after which he walked on along the mountain top in mind making certain of death he fared on thus till he came to the counter slope of the mountain along which he saw a dark blue sea dashing with billows clashing and yeasting waves each as it were a lofty mount so he sat down and repeated what he might of the quran and besought allah the most high to ease him of his troubles or by death or by deliverance from such strait then he recited for himself the funeral prayer and cast himself down into the main but the waves bore him up by allah's grace so that he reached the water unhurt and the angel in whose charge is the sea watched over him so that the billows bore him safe to land by the decree of the most high thereupon he rejoiced and praised almighty allah and thanked him after which he walked on in quest of something to eat for stress of hunger and came presently to the place where he had halted with the magian bahram then he fared on a while till behold he caught sight of a great palace rising high in air and he knew it for that of which he had questioned the persian and he had replied therein dwelleth a foe of mine hasan said to himself by allah needs must i enter yonder palace perchance relief awaiteth me there so coming to it and finding the gate open he entered the vestibule where he saw seated on a bench two girls like twin moons with a chess cloth before them and they were at play one of them raised her head to him and cried out for joy saying by allah here is the son of adam and methinks tis he who bahram the magian brought hither this year so hasan hearing her words cast himself at their feet and wept with sore weeping and said yes o my ladies by allah i am indeed that unhappy then said the younger damsel to her elder sister bear witness against me o my sister that this is my brother by covenant of allah and that i will die for his death and live for his life and joy for his joy and mourn for his mourning so saying she rose and embraced him and kissed him and presently taking him by the hand and her sister with her led him into the palace where she did off with his ragged clothes and brought him a suit of king's raiment wherewith she arrayed him moreover she made ready all manner of viands and set them before him and sat and ate with him she and her sister then said they to him tell us thy tale with yonder dog the wicked the wizard from the time of thy falling into his hands to that of thy freeing thee from him and after we will tell thee all that hath passed between us and him so thou mayst be on thy guard against him and thou see him again hearing these words and finding himself thus kindly received hasan took heart of grace and reason returned to him and he related to them all that had befallen him with the magian from first to last then they asked didst thou ask him of this palace and he answered yes but he said name it not to me for it belongeth to ghouls and satans at this the two damsels waxed wroth with exceeding wrath and said did that miscreant style us ghouls and satans and hasan answered yes cried the younger sister by allah i will surely do him die with the foulest death and make him to lack the wind of the world quoth hasan and how wilt thou get at him to kill him for he is a crafty magician and quoth she he is in a garden by name al mushayad and there is no help but that i slay him before long then said her sister sooth spake hasan in everything he hath recounted to us of this cur but now tell him our tale 
that all of it may abide in his memory. So the younger said to him, Know, O my brother, that we are the daughters of a king of the mightiest kings of the Jan, having marids for troops and guards and servants. And Almighty Allah blessed him with seven daughters by one wife, but of his folly such jealousy and stiff-neckedness and pride beyond compare get hold upon him, that he would not give us in marriage to any one, and, summoning his wazirs and emirs, he said to them, Can ye tell me of any place untrodden by the tread of men and jinn, and abounding in trees and fruits and rills? And quoth they, What wilt thou therewith, O king of the age? And quoth he, I desire there to lodge my seven daughters. Answered they, O king, the place for them is at the castle of the mountain of clouds, built by an ifrit of the rebellious jinn, who revolted from the covenant of our lord Solomon, on whom be the peace. Since his destruction, none hath dwelt there, nor man nor jinni, for it is cut off, and none may win to it. And the castle is girt about with trees and fruits and rills, and the water running around it is sweeter than honey and colder than snow. No one who is afflicted with leprosy or elephantiasis or what not else drinketh thereof, but he is healed forthright. Hearing this, our father sent us hither, with an escort of his troops and guards, and provided us with all that we need here. When he is minded to ride to us, he beateth a kettle drum, whereupon all his hosts present themselves before him. And he chooseth whom he shall ride, and dismisseth the rest. But, when he desireth that we shall visit him, he commandeth his followers, the enchanters, to fetch us and carry us to the presence, so he may solace himself with our society, and we accomplish our desire of him, after which they again carry us back hither. Our five other sisters are gone a-hunting in our desert, wherein our wild beasts past compt or calculation, and, it being our turn to do this, we to abide at home to make ready for them food. Indeed, we had besought Allah, extolled and exalted be he, to vouchsafe us a son of Adam to cheer us with his company, and praised be he who hath brought thee to us. So be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes cool and clear, for no harm shall befall thee. Hassan rejoiced and said, Alhamdulillah, laud to the Lord who guideth us into the path of deliverance and inclineth hearts to us. Then his sister rose, and, taking him by the hand, led him into a private chamber, where she brought out to him linen and furniture that no mortal can avail unto. Presently, the other damsels returned from hunting and birding, and their sisters acquainted them with Hassan's case, whereupon they rejoiced in him, and going into him in his chamber, saluted him with the salam, and gave him joy of his safety. Then he abode with them in all the solace of life and its joyance, riding out with them to the chase, and taking his pleasure with them whilst they entreated him courteously, and cheered him with converse till his sadness ceased from him, and he recovered health and strength, and his body waxed stout and fat, by dint of fair treatment and pleasant time among the seven moons in that fair palace with its gardens and flowers. For indeed he led the delightsomest of lives with the damsels who delighted in him, and he yet more in them. And they used to give him drink of the honeydew of their lips, these beauties with the high bosoms, adorned with grace and loveliness, the perfection of brilliancy and in shape very symmetry. Moreover, the youngest princess told her sisters how Bahram the Magian had made them of the ghouls and demons and satans, and they swear that they would surely slay him. Next year the accursed Geber again made his appearance, having with him a handsome young Muslim, as he were the moon, bound hand and foot, and tormented with grievous tortures, and alighted with him below the palace walls. Now Hassan was sitting under the trees by the side of the stream, and when he espied Bahram, his heart fluttered, his hue changed, and he smote hand upon hand. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 3section 4 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 8 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by sylvia mb 
in washington state the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight by anonymous translated by richard francis burton eighteen twenty one to eighteen ninety section four when it was the seven hundred and eighty-fifth night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hasan the goldsmith saw the magian his heart fluttered his hue changed and he smote hand upon hand then he said to the princesses o my sisters help me to the slaughter of this accursed for here he is come back and in your grasp and he leadeth with him captive a young moslem of the sons of the notables whom he is torturing with all manner of grievous torments lief would i kill him and console my heart of him and by delivering the young moslem from his mischief and restoring him to his country and kith and kin and friends fain would i lay up merit for the world to come by taking my wreak of him this will be an alms-deed from you and ye will reap the reward thereof from the almighty allah we hear and we obey allah and thee o our brother o hasan replied they and binding chin veils armed themselves and slung on their swords after which they brought hasan a steed of the best and equipped him in panoply and weaponed him with goodly weapons then they all sallied out and found the magian who had slaughtered and skinned a camel ill using the young moslem and saying to him sit thee in this hide so hasan came behind him without his knowledge and cried out at him till he was dazed and amazed then he came up to him saying hold thy hand o accursed o enemy of allah and foe of the moslems o dog o traitor o thou that flame dost obey o thou that walkest in the wicked one's ways worshipping the fire and the light and swearing by the shade and the heat herewith the magian turned and seeing hasan thought to wheedle him and said to him o my son how didst thou escape and who brought thee down to earth hasan replied he delivered me who hath appointed the taking of thy life to be at my hand and i will torture thee even as thou torturedest me the whole way long o miscreant o atheist thou hast fallen into the twist and the way thou hast missed and neither mother shall avail thee nor brother nor friend nor solemn covenant shall assist thee for thou saidest o accursed whoso betrayeth bread and salt may allah do vengeance upon him and thou hast broken the bond of bread and salt wherefore the almighty hath thrown thee into my grasp and far is thy chance of escape from me rejoined bahram by allah o my son o hasan thou art dearer to me than my sprite and the light of my eyes but hasan stepped up to him and hastily smote him between the shoulders that the sword issued gleaming from his throat tendons and allah hurried his soul to the fire and abiding place dire then hasan took the magian's bag and opened it then having taken out the kettle drum he struck it with the strap whereupon up came the dromedaries like lightning so he unbound the youth from his bonds and setting him on one of the camels loaded him another with victual and water saying wend whither thou wilt so he departed after almighty allah had thus delivered him from his strait at the hands of hasan when the damsels saw their brother slay the magian they joyed in him with exceeding joy and got round him marvelling at his valour and prowess and thanked him for his deed and gave him joy of his safety saying o hasan thou hast done a deed whereby thou hast healed the burning of him that thirstest for vengeance and pleased the king of omnipotence then they returned to the palace and he abode with them eating and drinking and laughing and making merry and indeed his sojourn with them was joyous to him and he forgot his mother but while he led with them this goodly life one day behold there arose from the further side of the desert a great cloud of dust that darkened the welkin and made towards them when the princesses saw this they said to him rise o hasan run to thy chamber and conceal thyself or an thou wilt go down into the garden and hide thyself among the trees and vines but fear not for no harm shall befall thee so he arose and entering his chamber locked the door upon himself and lay lurking in the palace presently the dust opened out and showed beneath it a great conquering host as it were a surging sea coming from the king the father of the damsels now when the troops reached the castle the princesses received them with all honour and hospitably entertained them three days after which they questioned them of their case and tidings and they replied saying we come from the king in quest of you they asked and what would the king with us and the officers answered 
one of the kings maketh a marriage festival and your father would have you be present thereat and take your pleasure therewith the damsels inquired and how long shall we be absent from our place and they rejoined the time to come and go and to sojourn may be two months so the princess arose and going into the palace sought hasan acquainted him with the case and said to him verily this place is thy place and our house is thy house so be of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool and clear and feel nor grief nor fear for none can come at thee here but keep a good heart and a glad mind till we return to thee the keys of our chambers we leave with thee but o oh, our brother we beseech thee by the bond of brotherhood in the very deed not to open such a door for thou hast no need thereto then they farewelled him and fared forth with the troops leaving hasan alone in the palace it was not long before his breast grew straightened and his patience shortened solitude and sadness were very heavy on him and he sorrowed for his severance from them with passing chagrin the palace for all its vastness waxed small to him and finding himself sad and solitary he bethought him of the damsels and their pleasant converse and recited these couplets the wide plain is narrowed before these eyes and the landscape troubles this heart of mine since my friends went forth by the loss of them joy fled and these eyelids rail floods of brine sleep shunned these eyeballs for parting woe and my mind is worn with sore pain and pine would i wot and time shall rejoin our lots and the joys of love with night talk combine and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and eighty-sixth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that after the departure of the damsels hasan sat in the palace sad and solitary and his breast was straitened by severance he used to ride forth a-hunting by himself in the wold and bring back the game and slaughter it and eat thereof alone but melancholy and disquiet redoubled on him by reason of his loneliness so he arose and went round about the palace and explored its every part he opened the princess's apartments and found therein riches and treasures fit to ravish the beholder's reason but he delighted not in aught thereof by reason of their absence his heart was fired by thinking of the door they had charged him not to approach or open on any account and he said in himself my sister had never enjoined me not to open this door except there were behind it somewhat whereof she would have none to know but by allah i will arise and open it and see what is within though within it were sudden death then he took the key and opening the door saw therein no treasure but he espied a vaulted and winding staircase of yamani onyx at the upper end of the chamber so he mounted the stair which brought him out upon the terrace roof of the palace whence he looked down upon the gardens and verdures full of trees and fruits and beasts and birds warbling praises of allah the one the all-powerful and said in himself this is that they forbade to me he gazed upon these pleasances and saw beyond a surging sea dashing with clashing billows and he ceased not to explore the palace right and left till he ended at a pavilion builded with alternate courses two bricks of gold and one of silver and jacinth and emerald and supported by four columns and in the centre he saw a sitting-room paved and lined with a mosaic of all manner precious stones such as rubies and emeralds and balluses and other jewels of sorts and in its midst stood a basin brimful of water over which was a trellis work of sandalwood and aloes wood reticulated with rods of red gold and wands of emerald and set with various kinds of jewels and fine pearls each sized as a pigeon's egg the trellis was covered with a climbing vine bearing grapes like rubies and beside the basin stood a throne of ling aloes latticed with red gold inlaid with great pearls and comprising very coloured gems of every sort and precious minerals each kind fronting each and symmetrically disposed about it the birds warbled with sweet tongues and various voices celebrating the praises of allah the most high brief it was a palace such as nor caesar nor chosroes ever owned but hasan saw therein none of the creatures of allah whereat he marvelled and said in himself i wonder to which of the kings this place pertaineth or is it many-columned iram whereof they tell for who among mortals can avail to the like of this and indeed he was amazed at the spectacle 
and sat down in the pavilion and cast glances around him marvelling at the beauty of its ordnance and at the lustre of the pearls and jewels and the curious work which therein were no less than at the gardens and orchards aforesaid and at the birds that hymned the praises of allah the one the almighty and he abode pondering the traces of him who the most high had enabled to rear that structure for indeed he is much of might and presently behold he espied ten birds flying toward the pavilion from the heart of the desert and knew that they were making the palace and bound for the basin to drink of its waters so he hid himself for fear they should see him and take flight they lighted on a great tree and a goodly encircled round about it and he saw amongst them a bird of marvel beauty the goodliest of them all and the nine stood around it and did it service and hasan marvelled to see it peck them with its bill and lorded over them while they fled from it he stood gazing at them from afar as they entered the pavilion and perched on the couch after which each bird rent open its neck skin with its claws and issued out of it and lo it was but a garment of feathers and there came forth therefrom ten virgins maids whose beauty shamed the brilliancy of the moon they all doffed their clothes and plunging into the basin washed and fell to playing and sporting with one another whilst the chief bird of them lifted up the rest and ducked them down and they fled from her and dared not put forth their hands to her when hasan beheld her thus he took leave of his right reason and his sense was enslaved so he knew that the princesses had not forbidden him to open the door save because of this for he fell passionately in love with her for what he saw of her beauty and loveliness symmetry and perfect grace as she played and sported and splashed the others with the water he stood looking upon them whilst they saw him not with eye gazing and heart burning and soul to evil prompting and he sighed to be with them and wept for longing because of the beauty and loveliness of the chief damsel his mind was amazed at her charms and his heart taken in the net of her love lo was loosed in his heart for her sake and there waxed on him a flame whose sparks might not be quenched and desire whose signs might not be hidden presently they came up out of that basin whilst hasan marvelled at their beauty and loveliness and the tokens of inner gifts in the elegance of their movements then he cast a glance at the chief damsel who stood mother naked and there was manifest to him what was between her thighs a goodly rounded dome on pillars borne like the bowl of silver or crystal which recalled to him the saying of the poet when i took up her shift and discovered the terrace roof of her case i found it as straight as my humour or eke my worldly ways so i thrust it incontinent in half way and she heaved a sigh for what dost thou sigh quoth i for the rest of it sure she says then coming out of the water they all put on their dresses and ornaments and the chief maiden donned a green dress wherein she surpassed for loveliness all the fair ones of the world and the lustre of her face outshone the resplendent full moons she excelled the branches with the grace of her bending gait and confounded the wit with apprehension of disdain and indeed she was as saith the poet a maiden twas the dresser's art had decked with cunning slight the sun thou'd stay had robbed her cheek and shone with borrowed light she came to us apparelled fair in under vest of green like as the ripe pomegranate hides beneath its leafy screen and when we asked her what might be the name of what she wore she answered in a quaint reply that double meaning bore the desert's heart we penetrate in such apparel dressed and pierce heart therefore is the name by which we call the vest and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and eighty-seventh night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hasan saw the damsels issue forth from the basin the chief maiden robbed his reason with her beauty and loveliness compelling him to recite the couplets forequoted and after dressing they sat talking and laughing whilst he stood gazing on them drowned in the sea of his love burning in the flames of passion and wandering in the wadi of his melancholy thought and he said to himself by allah my sister forbade me not to open the door but for cause of these maidens and for fear lest i should fall in love with one of them how o hasan shalt thou woo and win them how bring down a bird flying in the vasty firmament 
by allah thou hast cast thyself into the bottomless sea and snared thyself in a net whence there is no escape i shall die desolate and none shall wot of my death and he continued to gaze on the charms of the chief damsel who was the loveliest creature allah had made in her day and indeed she outdid in beauty all human beings she had a mouth magical as solemn seal and hair blacker than the night of estrangement to the love despairing man her brow was bright as the crescent moon of the feast of ramazan and her eyes were like the eyes wherewith gazelles scan she had polished nose straight as a cane and cheeks like blood-red anemones of new Oman, lips like coralline and teeth like strung pearls and carcanets of gold virgin to man and a neck like an ingot of silver above a shape like a wand of bam her middle was full of folds a dimpled plain such as enforceth the distracted lover to magnify allah and extol his might and name and her navel an ounce of musk sweetest of savour could contain she had thighs great and plump like marble columns twain or bolsters stuffed with down from ostrich tain and between them a somewhat as it were a hummock great of span or a hare with ears back lain while terrace roof and pilasters completed the plan and indeed she surpassed the bow of the Myrobalan with her beauty and symmetry and the indian rattan for she was even as saith of them the poet whom love did unman her lip dews rival honey sweets that sweet virginity keener than hindi scimitar the glance she casts at thee she shames the bending bow of bon with graceful movement slow and as she smiles her teeth appear with leaven's brilliancy when i compared with rosa bloom the tintage of her cheeks she laughed in scorn and cried whoso compares with rosary my hue and breasts granados terms is there no shame in him how should pomegranates bear on boughs such fruit in form or bleed now by my beauty and mine eyes and heart and eke by heaven of favours mine and by the hell of my unclemency they say she is a garden rose in the very pride of bloom and yet no rose can ape my cheek nor branch my symmetry if any garden own a thing which unto me is life what then is that he comes to crave of me and only me they ceased not to laugh and play whilst hasan stood still a-watching them forgetting meat and drink till near the hour of mid-afternoon prayer when the beauty the chief damsel said to her mates o king's daughters it waxeth late and our land is afar and we are weary of this stead come therefore let us depart to our own place so they all arose and donned their feather vests and becoming birds as they were before flew away all together with the chief lady in their midst then hasan despairing of their return would have arisen and gone down into the palace but could not move or even stand wherefore the tears ran down his cheeks and passion was sore on him and he recited these couplets may god deny me boon of troth if i after your absence sweets of slumber know yea since that severance never close mine eyes nor rest repose me since departed you twould seem as though you saw me in your sleep would heaven the dreams of sleep were real true indeed i dote on sleep though needed not for sleep may bring me that dear form to view then hasan walked on little by little heeding not the way he went till he reached the foot of the stairs whence he dragged himself to his own chamber then he entered and shutting the door lay sick eating not nor drinking and drowned in the sea of his solitude he spent the night thus weeping and bemoaning himself till the morning and when it morrowed he repeated these couplets the birds took flight at eve and winged their way and sinless he who died of love's death-blow i'll keep my love-tale secret while i can but and desire prevail its needs must show night brought me nightly vision bright as dawn while nights of my desire lack morning glow i mourn for them while they heart freest sleep and winds of love on me their plaything blow free i bestow my tears my wealth my heart my wit my sprite a most gain who most bestow the worst of woes and banes is enmity beautiful maidens deal us to our woe favour they say is forbidden to the fair and shedding lover's blood their laws allow that naught can love six do but lavish soul and stake in love play life on single throw i cry in longing ardour for my love lover can only weep and wail love low 
when the sun rose he opened the door went forth of the chamber and mounted to the stead where he was before then he sat down facing the pavilion and awaited the return of the birds till nightfall but they returned not wherefore he wept till he fell to the ground in a fainting fit when he came to after his swoon he dragged himself down the stairs to his chamber and indeed the darkness was come and straitened upon him was the whole world and he ceased not to weep and wail himself through the live-long night till the day broke and the sun reigned over hill and dale its rays serene he ate not nor drank nor slept nor was there any rest for him but by day he was distracted and by night distressed with sleeplessness delirious and drunken with melancholy thought and excess of love-longing and he repeated the verses of the love-distraught poet o thou who shamest sun in morning sheen the branch confounding yet with nascence blessed would heaven i wot and time shall bring return and quench the fires which flame unmanifest bring us together in a close embrace thy cheek upon my cheek thy breast abreast who saith in love dwell sweetness when in love are bitterer days than aloes bitterest and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section four recorded by sylvia m b in washington state section five of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight by anonymous translated by richard francis burton eighteen twenty one through eighteen ninety section five when it was the seven hundred and eighty eighth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hasan the goldsmith felt love redoubled upon him he recited those lines and as he abode thus in the stress of his love distraction alone and finding none to cheer him with company behold there arose a dust cloud from the desert wherefore he ran down and hid himself knowing that the princesses who owned the castle had returned before long the troops halted and dismounted round the palace and the seven damsels alighted and entering put off their arms and armour of war as for the youngest she stayed not to doff her weapons and gear but went straight to hasan's chamber where finding him not she sought for him till she lighted on him in one of the sleeping closets hidden feeble and thin with shrunken body and wasted bones and indeed his colour was changed and his eyes sunken in his face for lack of food and drink and for much weeping by reason of his love and longing for the young lady when she saw him in this plight she was confounded and lost her wits but presently she questioned him of his case and what had befallen him saying tell me what aileth thee o my brother that i may contrive to do away with thine affliction and i will be thy ransom whereupon he wept with sore weeping and by way of reply he began reciting lover when parted from the thing he loves has naught save weary woe and bane to bear inside is sickness outside living low his first his fancy and his last despair when his sister heard this she marvelled at his eloquence and loquent speech and his readiness at answering her in verse and said to him o my brother when didst thou fall into this thy case and what hath betided thee that i find thee speaking in song and shedding tears that throng allah upon thee o my brother and by the honest love which is between us tell me what aileth thee and discover to me thy secret nor conceal from me aught of that which hath befallen thee in our absence for my breast is straitened and my life is troubled because of thee he sighed and railed tears like rain after which he said i fear o my sister if i tell thee that thou wilt not aid me to win my wish but wilt leave me to die wretchedly in mine anguish she replied no by allah o my brother i will not abandon thee though it cost me my life so he told her all that had befallen him and that the cause of his distress and affliction was the passion he had conceived for the young lady whom he had seen when he opened the forbidden door and how he had not tasted meat nor drink for ten days past then he wept with sore weeping and recited these couplets restore my heart as twas within my breast let mine eyes sleep again then fly from me 
deem ye the knights have had the might to change love's vow who changeth may he never be his sister wept for his weeping and was moved to ruth for his case and pitied his strangerhood so she said to him o my brother be of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool and clear for i will venture being and risk existence to content thee and devise thee a device wherewith though it cost me my dear life and all i hold dear thou mayest get possession of her and accomplish thy desire if such be the will of allah almighty but i charge thee o my brother keep the matter secret from my sisterhood and discover not thy case to any one of them lest my life be lost with thy life and they questioned thee of opening the forbidden door replied to them i opened it not no never but i was troubled at heart for your absence and by my loneliness here and yearning for you and he answered yes this is the right read so he kissed her head and his heart was comforted and his bosom broadened he had been nigh upon death for excess of affright for he had gone in fear of her by reason of his having opened the door but now his life and soul returned to him then he sought of her somewhat of food and after serving it she left him and went in to her sisters weeping and mourning for him they questioned her of her case and she told them how she was heavy at heart for her brother because he was sick and for ten days no food had found way into his stomach so they asked the cause of his sickness and she answered the reason was our severance from him and our leaving him desolate for these days we have been absent from him were longer to him than a thousand years and scant blame to him seeing he is a stranger and solitary and we left him alone with none to company with him or hearten his heart more by token that he is but a youth and maybe he called to mind his family and his mother who is a woman in years and bethought him that she weepeth for him all whiles of the day and watches of the night ever mourning his loss and we used to solace him with our society and divert him from thinking of her when her sisters heard these words they wept in stress of their distress for him and said wahali for allah he is not to blame then they went out to the army and dismissed it after which they went into hasan and saluted him with the salam when they saw his charms changed with yellow colour and shrunken body they wept for very pity and sat by his side and comforted him and cheered him with converse relating to him all they had seen by way of the wonders and rarities and what had befallen the bridegroom with the bride they abode with him thus a whole month tendering him and caressing him with words sweeter than syrup but every day sickness was added to his sickness which when they saw they bewept him with sore weeping and the youngest wept even more than the rest at the end of this time the princesses having made up their minds to ride forth a-hunting and a-birding invited their sister to accompany them but she said by allah o my sisters i cannot go forth with you whilst my brother is in this plight nor indeed till he be restoreth to health and there are seeds from him that which is with him of affliction rather will i sit with him and comfort him they thanked her for her kindness and said to her allah will requite thee all thou dost with this stranger then they left her with him in the palace and rode forth taking with them twenty days victual and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and eighty-ninth night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that the princesses mounted and rode forth a hunting and a birding after leaving in the palace their youngest sister sitting by hasan's side and as soon as the damsel knew that they had covered a long distance from home she went in to him and said o my brother come show me the place where thou sawest the maidens he rejoiced in her words making sure of winning his wish and replied bismillah on my head then he essayed to rise and show her the place but could not walk so she took him up in her arms holding him to her bosom between her breasts and opening the staircase door carried him to the top of the palace and he showed her the pavilion where he had seen the girls and the basin of water wherein they had bathed then she said to him set forth to me o my brother their case and how they came so he described to her what so he had seen of them and especially the girl of whom he was enamoured but hearing these words she knew her and her cheeks paled and her case changed quoth he o oh, my sister what aileth thee to wax wan and be troubled and quoth she o oh, my brother know thou that this young lady is the daughter of a sovereign of the jan of one of the most puissant of their kings 
and her father had dominion over men and jinn and wizards and cohens and tribal chiefs and guards and in countries and cities and islands galore and hath immense wealth in store our father is a viceroy and one of his vassals and none can avail against him for the multitude of his many and the extent of his empire and the muchness of his monies he hath assigned to his offspring the daughters thou sawest a tract of country a whole year's journey in length and breadth a region girt about with a great river and a deep and thereto none may attain nor man nor jan he hath an army of women smiters with swords and lungers with lances five and twenty thousand in number each of whom when as she mounteth steed and donneth battle-gear eveneth a thousand knights of the bravest moreover he hath seven daughters who in valour and prowess equal and even excel their sisters and he hath made the eldest of them the damsel whom thou sawest queen over the country aforesaid and who is the wisest of her sisters and in valour and horsemanship and craft and skill and magic excels all the folk of her dominions the girls who companied with her are the ladies of her court and guards and grandees of her empire and the plumed skins wherewith they fly are the handiwork of enchanters of the jan now an thou wouldst get possession of this queen and wed this jewel seld seen and enjoy her beauty and loveliness and grace do thou pay heed to my words and keep them in thy memory they resort to this place on the first day of every month and thou must take seat here and watch for them and when thou seest them coming hide thee near the pavilion sitting where thou mayest see them without being seen of them and beware again beware lest thou show thyself or we shall all lose our lives when they doff their dress note which is the feather suit of her whom thou lovest and take it and it only for this it is that carrieth her to her country and when thou hast mastered it thou hast mastered her and beware lest she wile thee saying o thou who hast robbed my raiment restore it to me because here am i in thine hands and at thy mercy for an thou give it to her she will kill thee and break down over us palace and pavilion and slay our sire know then thy case and how thou shalt act when her companions see that her feather suit is stolen they will take flight and leave her to thee and beware lest thou show thyself to them but wait till they have flown away and she despaireth of them whereupon do thou go into her and hail her by the hair of her head and drag her to thee which being done she will be at thy mercy and i read thee discover not to her that thou hast taken the feather suit but keep it with care for so long as thou hast it in hold she is thy prisoner and in thy power seeing that she cannot fly to her country save with it and lastly carry her down to thy chamber where she will be thine when hasan heard her words his heart became at ease his trouble ceased and affliction left him so he rose to his feet and kissing his sister's head went down from the terrace with her into the palace where they slept that night he medicined himself till morning morrowed and when the sun rose he sprang up and opened the staircase door and descending to the flat roof sat there till supper-tide when his sister brought him up somewhat of meat and drink and a change of clothes and he slept and thus they continued doing day by day until the end of the month when he saw the new moon he rejoiced and began to watch for the birds and while he was thus behold up they came like lightning as soon as he espied them he hid himself where he could watch them unwatched by them and they lighted down one and all of them and putting off their clothes descended into the basin all this took place near the stead where hasan lay concealed and as soon as he caught sight of the girl he loved he arose and crept under cover little by little towards the dresses and allah veiled him so that none marked his approach for they were laughing and playing with one another till he laid hand on the dress now when they had made an end of their diversion they came forth of the basin and each of them slipped on her feather suit but the damsel he loved sought for her plumage that she might put it on but found it not whereupon she shrieked and beat her cheeks and rent her raiment her sisterhood came to her and asked what ailed her and she told them that her feather suit was missing wherefore they wept and shrieked and buffeted their faces and they were confounded wotting not the cause of this and knew not what to do 
Presently the night overtook them, and they feared to abide with her, lest that which had befallen her should befall them also. So they farewelled her, and flying away, left her alone upon the terrace roof of the palace, by the pavilion basin. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seven hundred and ninetieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Hasan had carried off the girl's plumery, she sought it, but found it not, and her sisterhood flew away, leaving her alone. When they were out of sight, Hasan gave ear to her, and heard her say, Oh, who has taken my dress and stripped me? I beseech thee to restore it to me and cover my shame, so may Allah never make thee taste of my tribulation. But when Hasan heard her speak thus, with speech sweeter than syrup, his love for her redoubled, passion got the mastery of his reason, and he had not patience to endure from her. So springing up from his hiding place, he rushed upon her, and laying hold of her by the hair, dragged her to him and carried her down to the basement of the palace and set her in his own chamber where he threw over her a silken cloak and left her weeping and biting her hands then he shut the door upon her and going to his sister informed her how he had made prize of his lover and carried her to his sleeping closet and there quoth he she is now sitting weeping and biting her hands when his sister heard this she rose forthright and betook herself to the chamber where she found the captive weeping and mourning so she kissed ground before her and saluted her with the salam and the young lady said to her o king's daughter do folk like you do such foul deed with the daughters of kings thou knowest that my father is a mighty sovereign and that all the liege lords of the jinn stand in awe of him and fear his majesty for that there are with him magicians and sages and cohens and satans and marids such as none may cope withal and under his hand are folk whose number none knoweth save Allah. How then doth it become you, O daughters of kings, to harbour mortal men with you, and disclose to them our case and yours? Else how should this man, a stranger, come at us? Hasan's sister made reply, O king's daughter, in very sooth this human is perfect in nobleness, and purposeth thee no villainy, but he loveth thee, and women were not made save for men. Did he not love thee? had he not fallen sick for thy sake and well nigh given up the ghost for desire of thee and she told her the whole tale how hasan had seen her bathing in the basin with her attendants and fallen in love with her and none had pleased him but she for the rest were all her handmaids and none had availed to put forth a hand to her when the princess heard this she despaired of deliverance and presently hasan's sister went forth and brought her a costly dress wherein she robed her then she set before her somewhat of meat and drink and ate with her and heartened her heart and soothed her sorrows and she ceased not to speak her fair with soft and pleasant words saying have pity on him who saw thee once and became as one slain by thy love and continued to console her and caress her quoting fair says and pleasant instances but she wept till daybreak when her trouble subsided and she left shedding tears knowing that she had fallen into the net and that there was no deliverance for her then said she to hasan's sister o king's daughter with this my strangerhood and severance from my country and sisterhood which allah wrote upon my brow patience becometh me to support what my lord hath foreordained therewith the youngest princess assigned her a chamber in the palace than which there was none goodlier and ceased not to sit with her and console her and solace her heart till she was satisfied with her lot and her bosom was broadened and she laughed and there seized from her what troubled and oppression possessed her by reason of her separation from her people and country and sisterhood and parents thereupon hasan's sister repaired to him and said arise go in to her in her chamber and kiss her hands and feet so he went in to her and did this and bussed her between the eyes saying o princess of fair ones and life of sprites and beholder's delight be easy of heart for i took thee only that i might be thy bondsman till the day of doom and this my sister will be thy servant for i o oh my lady desired not but to take thee to wife after the law of allah and the practice of his apostle and whenas thou wilt i will journey with thee to my country and carry thee to baghdad city and abide with thee there moreover 
i will buy thee handmaidens and negro chattels and i have a mother the best of women who will do thee service there is no goodlier land than our land everything therein is better than elsewhere and its folk are a pleasant people and bright of face now as he bespake her thus and strave to comfort her what while she answered him not a syllable lo there came a knocking at the palace gate so hasan went out to see who was at the door and found there the six princesses who had returned from hunting and birding whereat he rejoiced and went to meet them and welcomed them they wished him safety and health and he wished them the like after which they dismounted and going each to her chamber doffed their soiled clothes and donned fine linen then they came forth and demanded the game for they had taken a store of gazelles and wild cows hares and lions hyenas and others so their suite brought out some thereof for butchering keeping the rest by them in the palace and hasan girt himself and fell to slaughtering for them in due form whilst they sported and made merry joying with great joy to see him standing amongst them hale and hearty once more when they had made an end of slaughtering they sat down and addressed themselves to get ready somewhat for breaking their fast and hasan coming up to the eldest princess kissed her head and on likewise did he with the rest one after other whereupon said they to him indeed thou humblest thyself to us passing measure o our brother and we marvel at the excess of the affection thou showest us but allah forfend that thou shouldst do this thing which it behoveth us rather to do with thee seeing thou art a man and therefore worthier than we who are of the jinn therefore his eyes brimmed with tears and he wept sore so they said to him what causeth thee to weep indeed thou troublest our pleasant lives with thy weeping this day twould seem thou longest after thy mother and native land and things be so we will equip thee and carry thee to thy home and thy friends he replied by allah i desire not to part from you then they asked which of us hath vexed thee that thou art thus troubled but he was ashamed to say not troubleth me save love of a damsel lest they should deny and disavow him so he was silent and would tell them nothing of his case then his sister came forward and said to them he hath caught a bird from the air and would have you help him to tame her whereupon they all turned to him and cried where hath thy service every one of us and whatsoever thou seekest that will we do but tell us thy tale and conceal from us naught of thy case so he said to his sister do thou tell them for i am ashamed before them nor can i face them with these words and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section five recorded by sylvia m b in washington state Section six of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume eight, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, eighteen twenty one through eighteen ninety section six when it was the seven hundred and ninety-first night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that hasan said to his sister do thou tell them my tale for before them i stand abashed nor can i face them with these words so she said to them o my sisters when we went away and left alone this unhappy one the palace was straitened upon him and he feared lest some one should come in to him for ye know the sons of adam are light of wits so he opened the door of the staircase leading to the roof of his loneliness and trouble and sat there looking upon the wadi and watching the gate in his fear lest any should come thither one day as he sat thus suddenly he saw ten birds approach him making for the palace and they lighted down on the brink of the basin which is in the pavilion terrace he watched these birds and saw amongst them one goodlier than the rest which pecked the others and flouted them whilst none of them dared put out a claw to it presently they set their nails to their neck collars and rending their feather suits came forth therefrom and became damsels each and every 
like the moon on fullest night then they doffed their dresses and plunging into the water fell to playing with one another whilst the chief damsel ducked the others who dared not lay a finger on her and she was fairest of favour and most famous of form and most fetious of finery they ceased not to be in this case till near the hour of mid-afternoon prayer when they came forth of the basin and donning their feather shifts flew away home thereupon he waxed distracted with a heart of fire for love of the chief damsel and repenting him that he had not stolen her plumery wherefore he fell sick and abode on the palace roof expecting her return and abstaining from meat and drink and sleep and he ceased not to be so till the new moon showed when behold they again made their appearance according to custom and doffing their dresses went down into the basin so he stole the chief damsel's feather suit knowing that she could not fly save therewith hiding himself carefully lest they sight him and slay him then he waited till the rest had flown away when he arose and seized the damsel carrying her down from the terrace into the castle her sisters asked where is she and she answered she is with him in such a chamber quoth they describe her to us o our sister so quoth she she is fairer than the moon on the night of fullness and her face is sheenier than the sun the dew of her lips is sweeter than honey and her shape is straighter and slenderer than the cane one with eyes black as night and brow flower white a bosom jewel bright breasts like pomegranates twain and cheeks like apples twain a waist with dimples overlain a navel like a casket of ivory full of musk and grain and legs like columns of alabastrine vein she ravisheth all hearts with nature cold eyne and a waist slender fine and hips of heaviest design in speech that heals all pain and pine she is goodly of shape and sweet of smile as she were the moon in fullest sheen and shine when the princesses heard these phrases they turned to hasan and said to him show her to us so he arose with them all love distraught and carrying them to the chamber wherein was the captive damsel opened the door and entered preceding the seven princesses now when they saw her and noted her loveliness they kissed the ground between her hands marvelling at the fairness of her favour and the significance which showed her inner gifts and said to her by allah o daughter of the sovereign supreme this is indeed a mighty matter and hadst thou heard tell of this mortal among women thou hadst marvelled at him all thy days indeed he loveth thee with passionate love yet o king's daughter he seeketh not lewdness but desireth thee only in the way of lawful wedlock had we known that maids can do without men we had impeached him from his intent albeit he sent thee no messenger but came to thee in person and he telleth us that he hath burnt the feather dress else had we taken it from him then one of them agreed with the princess and becoming her deputy in the matter of the wedding contract performed the marriage ceremony between them whilst hasan clapped palms with her laying his hand in hers and she wedded him to the damsel by consent after which they celebrated her bridal feast as beseemeth king's daughters and brought hasan in to her so he rose and rent the veil and oped the gate and pierced the forge and break the seal whereupon affection for her waxed in him and he redoubled in love and longing for her then since he had gotten that which he sought he gave himself joy and improvised these couplets thy shape's temptation eyes as hoary's fame and sheddeth beauty's sheen that radiance rare my glance portrayed thy glorious portraiture rubies one half and gems the third part were musk made a fifth sixth was ambergris the sixth a pearl but pearl without compare eve never bare a daughter even in thee nor breathes thy like in cooled celestial air and thou would torture me tis want of love and if thou pardon tis thy choice i swear then o world brightener and o end of wish loss of thy charms who could in patience bear and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and ninety-second night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hasan went in unto the king's daughter and did away with her maidenhead he enjoyed her with exceeding joy and affection for her waxed in him and he redoubled in love longing for her so he recited the lines aforesaid now the princesses were standing at the door and when they heard his verses they said to her o king's daughter hearest thou the words of this mortal 
how canst thou blame us seeing that he maketh poetry for love of thee and indeed he hath so done a thousand times when she heard this she rejoiced and was glad and felt happy and hasan abode with her forty days in all solace and delight joyance and happiest plight whilst the damsels renewed festivities for him every day and overwhelmed him with bounty and presents and rarities and the king's daughter became reconciled to her sojourn amongst them and forgot her kith and kin at the end of the forty days hasan saw in a dream one night his mother mourning for him and indeed her bones were wasted and her body had waxed shrunken and her complexion had yellowed and her favour had changed the while he was in excellent case when she saw him in this state she said to him o my son o hasan how is it that thou livest thy worldly life at thine ease and forgettest me look at my plight since thy loss i do not forget thee nor will my tongue cease to name thy name till i die and i have made thee a tomb in my house that i may never forget thee would heaven i knew if i shall live o my son to see thee by my side and if we shall ever again foregather as we were thereupon hasan awoke from sleep weeping and wailing the tears railed down his cheeks like rain and he became mournful and melancholy his tears dried not nor did sleep visit him but he had no rest and no patience was left to him when he arose the princesses came in to him and gave him good morrow and made merry with him as was their wont but he paid no heed to them so they asked his wife concerning his case and she said i can not quoth they question him of his condition so she went up to him and said what aileth thee o my lord whereupon he moaned and groaned and told her what he had seen in his dream and repeated these two couplets indeed afflicted sore are we and all distraught seeking for union yet we find no way and love's calamities upon us grow and love though light with heaviest weight doth weigh his wife repeated to the princesses what he said and they hearing the verses had pity on him and said to him in allah's name do as thou wilt for we may not hinder thee from visiting thy mother nay we will help thee to thy wish by what means we may but it behoveth that thou desert us not but visit us though it be only once a year and he answered to hear is to obey be your behest on my head and eyes then they arose forthright and making him ready victual for the voyage equipped the bride for him with raiment and ornaments and everything of price such as defy description and they bestowed on him gifts and presents which pens of ready writers lack power to set forth then they beat the magical kettle drum and up came the dromedaries from all sides they chose of them such as could carry all the gear they had prepared amongst the rest five and twenty chests of gold and fifty of silver and mounting hasan and his bride on others rode with them three days wherein they accomplished a march of three months then they bade them farewell and addressed themselves to return whereupon his sister the youngest damsel threw herself on hasan's neck and wept till she fainted when she came to herself she repeated these two couplets near dawn the severance day on any wise that robs of sleep these heavy-lidded eyes from us and thee it hath fair union torn it wastes our force and makes our forms its prize her verses finished she farewelled him straightly charging him when as he should have come to his native land and have foregathered with his mother and set his heart at ease to fail not of visiting her once in every six months and saying if aught grieve thee or thou fear aught of vexation beat the magian's kettle-drum whereupon the dromedary shall come to thee and do thou mount and return to us and persist not in staying away he swore thus to do and conjured them to go home so they returned to the palace mourning for their separation from him especially the youngest with whom no rest would stay nor would patience her call obey but she wept night and day thus it was with them but as regards hasan and his wife they fared on by day and night over plain and desert sight and valley and stony heights through noontide glare and dawn's soft light and allah decreed them safety so they reached bassorah city without hindrance and made their camels kneel at the door of his house hasan then dismissed the dromedaries and going up to the door to open it heard his mother weeping and in a faint strain from a heart worn with parting pain and on fire with consuming bane reciting these couplets how shall he taste of sleep who lacks repose who wakes a night when all in slumber wone he owned wealth and family and fame yet fared from house and home and exile lone 
live coal beneath his ribs he bears for bane and mighty longing mightier near was known passion hath seized him passion mastered him yet is he constant while he maketh moan his case for love proclaimeth i that he as prove his tears is wretched woe-begone when hasan heard his mother weeping and wailing he wept also and knocked at the door a loud knock quoth she who is at the door and quoth he open whereupon she opened the door and knowing him at first sight fell down in a fainting fit but he ceased not to tend her till she came to herself when he embraced her and she embraced him and kissed him whilst his wife looked on mother and son then he carried his goods and gear into the house while his mother for that her heart was comforted and allah had reunited her with her son versified with these couplets fortune had ruth upon my plight pitied my long long bane and blight gave me what i would liefest sight and set me free from all affright so pardon i the sin that sinned ned she in days evanished quite e'en to the sin she sinned when she bleached my hair parting silver and white and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and ninety-third night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that hasan with his mother then sat talking and she asked him how farest thou o my son with the persian whereto he answered o my mother he was no persian but a magian who worshipped the fire not the all-powerful sire then he told her how he dealt with him and that he had journeyed with him to the mountain of clouds and sewed him up in camel skin and how the vultures had taken him up and set him down on the summit and what he had seen there of dead folk whom the magian had deluded and left to die on the crest after they had done his desire and he told her how he had cast himself from the mountain top into the sea and allah the most high had preserved him and brought him to the palace of the seven princesses and how the youngest of them had taken him to brother and he had sojourned with them till the almighty brought the magian to the place where he was and he slew him moreover he told her of his passion for the king's daughter and how he had made prize of her and of his seeing her in sleep and all else that had befallen him up to the time when allah vouchsafed them reunion she wondered at his story and praised the lord who had restored him to her in health and safety then she arose and examined the baggage and loads and questioned him of them so he told her what was in them whereat she joyed with exceeding joy then she went up to the king's daughter to talk with her and bear her company but when her eyes fell on her her wits were confounded at her brilliancy and she rejoiced and marvelled at her beauty and loveliness and symmetry and perfect grace and she sat down beside her cheering her and comforting her heart while she never ceased to repeat alhamdulillah o oh my son for thy return to me safe and sound next morning early she went down into the market and bought mighty fine furniture and ten suits of the richest raiment in the city and clad the young wife and adorned her with everything seemly then said she to hasan o my son we cannot tarry in this town with all this wealth for thou knowest that we are poor folk and the people will suspect us of practising alchemy so come let us depart to baghdad the house of peace where we may dwell in the caliph's sanctuary and thou shalt sit in a shop to buy and sell in the fear of allah to whom belong might and majesty and he shall open to thee the door of blessings with this wealth hasan approved her counsel and going forth straightway sold the house and summoned the dromedaries which he loaded with all his goods and gear together with his mother and wife then he went down to the tigris where he hired him a craft to carry them to baghdad and embarked therein in all his possessions and his mother and wife they sailed up the river with a fair wind for ten days till they drew in sight of baghdad at which they all rejoiced and the ship landed them in the city where without stay or delay hasan hired a storehouse in one of the caravansaries and transported his goods thither he lodged that night in the khan and on the morrow he changed his clothes and going down into the city inquired for a broker the folk directed him to one and when the broker saw him he asked him what he lacked quoth he i want a house a handsome one and spacious so the broker showed him the houses at his disposal and he chose one that belonged to one of the wazirs and buying it of him for a hundred thousand gold dinars gave him the price then he returned to his caravansary and removed all his goods and money to the house after which he went down to the market and bought all the mansion needed of vessels and carpets and other household stuff besides servants and eunuchs including a little black boy for the house 
he abode with his wife in all solace and delight of life three years during which time he was vouchsafed by her two sons one of whom he named nasir and the other mansur but at the end of this time he bethought him of his sisters the princesses and called to mind all their goodness to him and how they had helped him to his desire so he longed after them and going out to the market streets of the city bought trinkets and costly stuffs and fruit confections such as they had never seen or known his mother asked him the reason of his buying these rarities and he answered i purpose to visit my sisters who showed me every kind of kindness and all the wealth that i at present enjoy is due to their goodness and munificence wherefore i will journey to them and return soon inshallah quoth she o oh my son be not long absent from me and quoth he know o my mother how thou shalt do with my wife here is her feather dress in a chest buried underground in such a place do thou watch over it lest haply she hap on it and take it for she would fly away she and her children and i should never hear of them again and should die of grieving for them wherefore take heed o my mother while i warn thee that thou name this not to her thou must know that she is the daughter of a king of the jinn than whom there is not a greater among the sovereigns of the jann nor a richer in troops and treasure and she is mistress of her people and dearest to her father of all he hath moreover she is passing high-spirited so do thou serve her thyself and suffer her not to go forth the door neither look out of the window nor over the wall for i fear the air for her when it bloweth and if aught befell her of the calamities of this world i should slay myself for her sake she replied o oh, my son i take refuge with allah from gainsaying thee am i mad that thou shouldst lay this charge on me and i disobey thee therein depart o my son with heart at ease and please allah soon thou shalt return in safety and see her and she shall tell thee how i have dealt with her but tarry not o my son beyond the time of travel and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section six recorded by sylvia m b in washington state Section 7 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, 1821-1890. to 1890. Section 7 when it was the seven hundred and ninety-fourth night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hasan had determined to visit the princesses he gave his mother the orders we have mentioned now as fate would have it his wife heard what he said to his mother and neither of them knew it then hasan went without the city and beat the kettle drum whereupon up came the dromedaries and he loaded twenty of them with rarities of al iraq after which he returned to his mother and repeated his charge to her and took leave of her and his wife and children one of whom was a yearling babe and the other two years old then he mounted and fared on without stopping night or day over hills and valleys and plains and wastes for a term of ten days till on the eleventh he reached the palace and went in to his sisters with the gifts he had brought them the princesses rejoiced at his sight and gave him joy of his safety whilst his sister decorated the palace within and without then they took the presents and lodging him in a chamber as before asked him of his mother and his wife and he told them that she had borne him two sons then the youngest princess seeing him well and in good case joyed with exceeding joy and repeated this couplet if ever ask for news of you from whatso breezes pass and never any but yourselves can pass across my mind then he abode with them in all honour and hospitality for three months spending his time in feasting and merry-making joy and delight hunting and sporting so fared it with him but as regards his wife she abode with his mother two days after her husband's departure and on the third day she said to her glory be to god have i lived with him three years and shall i never go to the bath then she wept and hasan's mother had pity on her condition and said to her o oh, my daughter here we are strangers and thy husband is abroad were he at home he would serve thee himself but as for me i know no one however o oh my daughter i will heat thee water and wash thy head in the hammam bath which is in the house answered the king's daughter o oh my lady 
hadst thou spoken thus to one of the slave girls she had demanded to be sold in the sultan's open market and had that abode with thee men are excusable because they are jealous and their reason telleth them that if a woman go forth the house happily she will do frowardness but women o oh my lady are not all equal and alike and thou knowest that if woman have a mind to aught whether it be the haman or what not else none hath power over her to guard her or keep her chaste or debar her from her desire for she will do whatso she willeth and not restraineth her but her reason and her religion then she wept and cursed fate and bemoaned herself and her strangerhood till hasan's mother was moved to ruth for her case and knew that all she said but was truth and that there was nothing for it but to let her have her way so she committed the affair to allah extolled and exalted be he and making ready all that they needed for the bath took her and went with her to the hammam she carried her two little sons with her and when they entered they put off their clothes and all the women fell to gazing on the princess and glorifying god to whom belonged might and majesty for that he had created so fair a form the women of the city even those who were passing by flocked to gaze upon her and the report of her was noised about in baghdad till the bath was crowded that there was no passing through it now it chanced there was present on that day and on the rare occasion with the rest of the women in the hammam one of the slave girls of the commander of the faithful harun al rashid by name tofa the lutenist and she finding the hammam overcrowded and no passing for the throng of women and girls asked what was to do and they told her of the young lady so she walked up to her and considering her closely was amazed at her grace and loveliness and glorified god magnified be his majesty for the fair forms he hath created the sight hindered her from her bath so that she went not farther in nor washed but sat staring at the princess till she had made an end of bathing and coming forth of the caldarium donned her raiment whereupon beauty was added to her beauty she sat down on the divan whilst the women gazed upon her then she looked at them and veiling herself went out tofa went out with her and followed her till she saw where she dwelt when she left her and returned to the caliph's palace and ceased not wending till she went in to the lady zubaydah and kissed ground between her hands whereupon quoth her mistress o tofa why hast thou tarried in the hammam she replied o my lady i have seen a marvel never saw i its like amongst men or women and this it was that distracted me and dazed my wit and amazed me so that i forgot even to wash my head asked zubaydah and what was that and tofa answered o my lady i saw a damsel in the bath having with her two little boys like moons i never espied her like nor before her nor after her neither is there the fellow of her form in the whole world nor her peer amongst ajams or turks or arabs by the munificence o my lady and thou toldest the commander of the faithful of her he would slay her husband and take her from him for her like is not to be found among women i asked of her mate and they told me that he is a merchant hasan of basorhait moreover i followed her from the bath to her own house and found it to be that of the wazir with the two gates one opening on the river and the other on the land indeed o oh my lady i fear lest the prince of the true believers hear of her and break the law and slay her husband and take lovely s with her and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and ninety-fifth night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when tofa after seeing the king's daughter described her beauty to the lady zubaydah ending with indeed o my mistress i fear lest the prince of true believers hear of her and break the law and slay her mate and take her to wife zubaydah cried woe to thee o tofa say me doth this damsel display such passing beauty and loveliness that the commander of the faithful should on her account barter his soul's good for his worldly lust and break the holy law by allah needs must i look on her and if she be not as thou sayest i will bid strike off thy head o strumpet there are in the caliph's seraglio three hundred and three score slave girls after the number of the days of the year yet is there none amongst them so excellent as thou describest tofa replied no by allah o my lady nor is there her like in all baghdad no nor amongst the arabs or the Dalamites, nor hath allah to whom belong might and majesty created the like of her thereupon zubaydah called for masrur the eunuch who came and kissed the ground before her and she said to him o masrur 
go to the wazir's house that with the two gates one giving on water and the other on the land and bring me the damsel who dwelleth there also her two children and the old woman who is with her and haste thou and tarry not said master i hear and i obey and repairing to hasan's house knocked at the door quoth the old woman who is at the door and quoth he masrur the eunuch of the commander of the faithful so she opened the door and he entered and saluted her with the salam whereupon she returned his salute and asked his need and he replied the lady zubaydah daughter of al kasim and queen spouse of the commander of the faithful harun al rashid sixth of the sons of al abbas paternal uncle of the prophet whom allah bless and keep summeth thee to her thee and thy son's wife and her children for the women have told her anent her and her beauty rejoined the old woman o oh, my lord masrur we are foreigner folk and the girl's husband my son who is abroad and far from home hath strictly charged me not to go forth nor let her go forth in his absence neither show her to any of the creatures of allah almighty and i fear me if aught befall her and he come back he will slay himself wherefore of thy favour i beseech thee o masrur require us not of that whereof we are unable masrur retorted o my lady if i knew aught to be feared for you in this i would not require you to go the lady zubaydah desireth but to see her and then she may return so disobey not or thou wilt repent and like as i take you i will bring you both back in safety inshallah hasan's mother could not gainsay him so she went in and making the damsel ready brought her and her children forth and they all followed masrur to the palace of the caliphate where he carried them in and seated them on the floor before the lady zubaydah they kissed ground before her and called down blessings upon her and zubaydah said to the young lady who was veiled wilt thou not uncover thy face that i may look on it so she kissed the ground between her hands and discovered a face which put to shame the full moon in the height of heaven zubaydah fixed her eyes on her and let their glances wander over her whilst the palace was illumined by the light of her countenance whereupon the queen and the whole company were amazed at her beauty and all who looked on her became gin mad and unable to bespeak one another as for zubaydah she rose and making the damsel stand up strained her to her bosom and seated her by herself on the couch moreover she bade decorate the palace in her honour and calling for a suit of the richest raiment and a necklace of the rarest ornaments put them upon her then said she to her o liege lady of fair ones verily thou astoundest me and fillest mine eyes what arts knowest thou she replied o my lady i have a dress of feathers and could i but put it on before thee thou wouldst see one of the fairest of fashions and marvel thereat and all who saw it would talk of its goodliness generation after generation zubaydah asked and where is this dress of thine and the damsel answered tis with my husband's mother do thou seek it for me of her so zubaydah said to the old woman o my lady the pilgrimess o my mother go forth and fetch us her feather dress that we may solace ourselves by looking on what she will do and after take it back again replied the old woman o my lady this damsel is a liar hast thou ever seen any of womankind with a dress of feathers indeed this belongeth only to birds but the damsel said to the lady zubaydah as thou livest o my lady she hath a feather dress of mine and it is in a chest which is buried in such a store closet in the house so zubaydah took off her neck a rivery of jewels worth all the treasures of chosroes and caesar and gave it to the old woman saying o my mother i conjure thee by my life take this necklace and go and fetch us this dress that we may divert ourselves with the sight thereof and after take it again but she sware to her that she had never seen any such dress and wist not what the damsel meant by her speech then the lady zubaydah cried out at her and taking the key from her called masrur and said to him as soon as he came take this key and go to the house then open it and enter a store closet there whose door is such and such and a middlemost of it thou wilt find a chest buried take it out and break it open and bring me the feather dress which is therein and set it before me and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and ninety-sixth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the lady zubaydah having taken the key from hasan's mother handed it to masrur saying take this key and open such a closet then bring forth of it the chest 
break it open bring me the feather dress which is therein and set it before me hearkening and obedience replied he and taking the key went forth whereupon the old woman arose and followed him weeping eyed and repenting of her having given ear to the damsel and gone with her to the bath for her desire to go thither was but a device so she went with him to the house and opened the door of the closet and he entered and brought out the chest then he took therefrom the feather dress and wrapping it in a napkin carried it to the lady zubaydah who took it and turned it about marvelling at the beauty of its make after which she gave it to the damsel saying is this thy dress of feathers she replied yes o my lady and at once putting forth her hand took it joyfully then she examined it and rejoiced to find it whole as it was not a feather gone so she rose and came down from beside the lady zubaydah and taking her sons in her bosom wrapped herself in the feather dress and became a bird by the ordinance of allah to whom belong might and majesty whereat zubaydah marvelled as did all who were present then she walked with a swaying and graceful gait and danced and sported and flapped her wings whilst all eyes were fixed on her and all marvelled at what she did then said she with fluent tongue is this goodly o my ladies and they replied yes o princess of the fair all thou dost is goodly said she and this o my mistresses that i am about to do is better yet then she spread her wings and flying up with her children to the dome of the palace perched on the saloon roof whilst they all looked at her wide-eyed and said by allah this is indeed a rare and peregrine fashion never saw we its like then as she was about to take flight for her own land she bethought her of hasan and said hark ye my mistresses and she improvised these couplets o oh, who has quitted these abodes and fairest leaf and light to other objects of thy love with fain and fastest flight deemest thou that bided i with you in solace and in joy or that my days amid you all were clear of bane and blight when i was captive tain of love and snared in his snare he made of love my prison and he fared for me forthright so when my fear was hidden he made sure that near should i pray to the one the omnipotent to render me my right he charged his mother keep the secret with all the care she could in closet shut and treated me with enemies despite but i o heard their words and held them fast in memory and hoped for fortune fair and weal and blessings infinite my faring to the hammam bath then proved to me the means of making minds of folk to be confounded at my sight wondered the bride of al rashid to see my brilliancy when she beheld me right and left with all of beauty dight then quoth i o our caliph's wife i once was wont to own a dress of feathers rich and rare that did the eyes delight and it were now on me thou shouldst indeed see wondrous things that would efface all sorrows and disperse all sores of sprite then deigned our caliph's bride to cry where is that dress of thine and i replied in house of him that kept darkling as the night so down upon it pounced masrur and brought it unto her and when twas there each feather cast a ray of beaming light therewith i took it from his hand and opened it straightway and saw its plumed bosom and its buttons pleased my sight and so i clad myself therein and took with me my babes and spread my wings and flew away with all my mane and might saying o husband's mother mine tell him when cometh he and ever wouldest meet her thou from house and home must flee when she had made an end of her verses the lady zubaydah said to her wilt thou not come down to us that we may take our fill of thy beauty o fairest of the fair glory be to him who hath given thee eloquence and brilliance but she said far be from me that the past return should see then said she to the mother of the hapless wretched hasan by allah o my lady o mother of my husband it irketh me to part from thee but whenas thy son cometh to thee and upon him the nights of severance longsome shall be and he craveth reunion and meeting to see and whenas breezes of love and longing shake him dolefully let him come in the islands of wak to me then she took flight with her children and sought her own country whilst the old woman wept and beat her face and moaned and groaned till she swooned away when she came to herself she said to the lady zubaydah o oh, my lady what is this thou hast done and zubaydah said to her o oh, my lady the pilgrimess i knew not that this would happen and hadst thou told me of the case and acquainted me with her condition i had not gainsaid thee nor did i know until now that she was of the flying jinn 
else i had not suffered her to don the dress nor permitted her to take her children but now o my lady words profit nothing so do thou acquit me of offence against thee and the old woman could do no otherwise than shortly answer thou art acquitted then she went forth the palace of the caliphate and returned to her own house where she buffeted her face till she swooned away when she came to herself she pined for her daughter-in-law and her grandchildren and for the sight of her son and versified with these couplets your fairing on the parting day drew many a tear from me who must your flying from the home long mourn in misery and cried i for the parting pang in anguish like as fire and tear-floods chafed mine eyelids sore that near of tears were free yes this is severance ah shall we ere joy return of you for your departure hath deprived my power of privacy ah would they had returned to me in covenant of faith and they return perhaps restore of past these eyne may see then arising she dug in the house three graves and betook herself to them with weeping all whiles of the day and watches of the night and when her son's absence was longsome upon her and grief and yearning and unquiet waxed upon her she recited these couplets deep in mine eyeballs ever dwells the phantom form of thee my heart when throbbing or at rest holds fast thy memory and love of thee doth never cease to course within my breast as course the juices in the fruits which deck the branchy tree and every day i see thee not my bosom straitened is and even censures excuse the woes in me they see o thou whose love hath gotten hold the foremost in the heart of me whose fondness is excelled by mine insanity fear the compassionate in my case and some compassion show love of thee makes me taste of death in bitterest pungency and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section seven recorded by sylvia m b in washington state section eight of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight by anonymous translated by richard francis burton eighteen twenty one through eighteen ninety section eight when it was the seven hundred and ninety seventh night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that hasan's mother bewept through the watches of the night and the wiles of the day her separation from her son and his wife and children on this wise it fared with her but as regards hasan when he came to the princesses they conjured him to tarry with them for three months after which long sojourn they gave him five loads of gold and the like of silver and one load of victual and accompanied him on his homeward way till he conjured them to return whereupon they farewelled him with an embrace but the youngest came up to him to bid him adieu and clasping his neck wept till she fainted then she recited these two couplets when shall the severance fire be quenched by union love with you when shall i win my wish of you in days that were renew the parting day affrighted me and wrought me dire dismay and doubleth woe o master mine by the sad word adieu anon came forward the second princess and embraced him and recited these two couplets farewelling thee indeed is like to bidding life farewell and like the loss of zephyr tis to lose thee far our sight thine absence is a flaming fire which burneth up my heart and in thy presence i enjoy the gardens of delight presently came forward the third and embraced him and recited these two couplets we left not taking leave of thee when bound to utter goal from aught of ill intention or from weariness and dole thou art my soul my very soul the only soul of me and how shall i farewell myself and say adieu my soul after her came forward the fourth and embraced him and recited these two couplets not guard me weep save where and when of severance spake he persisting in his cruel will with sore persistency look at this pearl-like ornament i've hung upon mine ear tis of the tears of me compact this choicest jewelry in her turn came forward the fifth and embraced him and recited these two couplets ah fare thee not for i've no force thy fairing to endure nor e'en to say the world farewell before my friend is sped 
nor any patience to support the days of severance nor any tears on ruined house and wasted home to shed next came the sixth and embraced him and recited these two couplets i cried as the camels went off with them and love pained my vitals with sorest pain had i a king who would lend me rule i'd seize every ship that dares sail the main lastly came forward the seventh and embraced him and recited these couplets when thou seest parting be patient still nor let foreign parts deal thy soul affright but abide expecting a swift return for all hearts hold parting in sore despite and eke these two couplets indeed i'm heartbroken to see thee start nor can i farewell thee ere thou depart allah woteth i left not to say adieu save for fear that saying would melt your heart hasan also wept for parting from them till he swooned and repeated these couplets indeed ran my tears on the severance day like pearls i threaded in necklace way the cameleer drove his camels with song but i lost heart patience and strength and stay i bade them farewell and retired in grief from tryst place and camp where my dearlings lay i turned me unknowing the way nor joyed my soul but in hopes to return some day oh listen my friend to the words of love god forbid thy heart forget all i say o oh, my soul when thou partest with them part too with all joys of life nor for living pray then he farewelled them and fared on diligently night and day till he came to baghdad the house of peace and sanctuary of the abbaside caliphs unknowing what had passed during his wayfare at once entering his house he went in to his mother to salute her but found her worn of body and wasted of bones for excess of mourning and watching weeping and wailing till she was grown thin as a toothpick and could not answer him a word so he dismissed the dromedaries then asked her of his wife and children and she wept till she fainted and he seeing her in this state searched the house for them but found no trace of them then he went to the store closet and finding it open and the chest broken and the feather dress missing knew forthright that his wife had possessed herself thereof and flown away with her children then he returned to his mother and finding her recovered from her fit questioned her of his spouse and babes whereupon she wept and said o oh, my son may allah amply requite thee their loss these are their three tombs when hasan heard these words of his mother he shrieked a loud shriek and fell down in a fainting fit in which he lay from the first of the day till noontide whereupon anguish was added to his mother's anguish and she despaired of his life however after a while he came to himself and wept and buffeted his face and rent his raiment and went about the house clean distraught reciting these two couplets folk have made moan of passion before me of past years and live and dead for absence have suffered pains and fears but that within my bosom i harbour with mine eyes i've never seen the like of nor heard with mine ears then finishing his verses he bared his brand and coming up to his mother said to her except thou tell me the truth of the case i will strike off thy head and kill myself she replied o oh, my son do not such deed put up thy sword and sit down till i tell thee what hath passed so he sheathed his scimitar and sat by her side while she recounted to him all that had happened in his absence from first to last adding o oh, my son but that i saw her weep in her longing for the bath and feared that she would go and complain to thee on thy return and thou wouldst be wroth with me i had never carried her thither and were it not that the lady zubaydah was wroth with me and took the key from me by force i had never brought out the feather dress though i died for it but thou knowest o my son that no hand may measure length with that of the caliphate when they brought her the dress she took it and turned it over fancying that somewhat might be lost thereof but she found it uninjured wherefore she rejoiced and making her children fast to her waist donned the feather vest after the lady zubaydah had pulled off to her all that was upon herself and clad her therein in honour of her and because of her beauty no sooner had she donned the dress than she shook and becoming a bird promenaded about the palace whilst all who were present gazed at her and marvelled at her beauty and loveliness then she flew up to the palace roof and perching thereon looked at me and said whenas thy son cometh to thee and the nights of separation upon him longsome shall be and he craveth reunion and meeting to see and whenas the breezes of love and longing shake him dolefully 
let him leave his native land and journey to the islands of wak and see me this then is her story and what befell in thine absence and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and ninety-eighth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that as soon as hasan's mother had made an end of her story he gave a great cry and fell down in a fainting fit which continued till the end of the day when he revived and fell to buffeting his face and writhing on the floor like a scotched snake his mother sat weeping by his head until midnight when he came to himself and wept sore and recited these couplets pause ye and see his sorry state since when ye fain withdrew haply when wrought your cruelty you'll have the grace to rue for an ye look upon him you'll doubt of him by sickness stress as though by allah he were one before ye never knew he dies for nothing save for love of you and he would be numbered amid the dead did not he moan and groan for you and deem not pangs of severance sit all lightly on his soul tis heavy load on lover wight twere lighter and ye slew then having ended his verse he rose and went round about the house weeping and wailing groaning and bemoaning himself five days during which he tasted nor meat nor drink his mother came to him and conjured him till he broke his fast and besought him to leave weeping but he hearkened not to her and continued to shed tears and lament whilst she strove to comfort him and he heeded her not then he recited these couplets beareth for love a burden sore this soul of me could break a mortal's back however strong that be i am distraught to see my case and languor grows making my day and night indifferent in degree i own to having dreaded death before this day this day i hold my death mine only remedy and hasan ceased not to do thus till daybreak when his eyes closed and he saw in a dream his wife griefful and repentant for that which she had done so he started up from sleep crying out and reciting these two couplets their image bides with me near quits me near shall fly but holds within my heart most honourable stead but for reunion hope i'd see me die forthright and but for phantom form of thee my sleep had fled and as morning morrowed he redoubled his lamentations he abode weeping-eyed and heavy-hearted wakeful by night and eating little for a whole month at the end of which he bethought him to repair to his sisters and take counsel with them in the matter of his wife so haply they might help him to regain her accordingly he summoned the dromedaries and loading fifty of them with rarities of al Iraq, committed the house to his mother's care and deposited all his goods in safe keeping except some few he left at home then he mounted one of the beasts and set out on his journey single-handed intent upon obtaining aidance from the princesses and he stayed not till he reached the palace of the mountain of clouds when he went in to the damsels and gave them presents in which they rejoiced then they wished him joy of his safety and said to him o oh, our brother what can ail thee to come again so soon seeing thou wast with us but two months since whereupon he wept and improvised these couplets my soul for loss of lover sped i sight nor life enjoying neither life's delight my case is one whose cure is all unknown can any cure the sick but dr white oh who has reft my sleep joys leaving me to ask the breeze that blew from that fair sight blew from my lover's land the land that owns those charms so sore a grief in soul excite o oh, breeze that visitest her land perhaps breathing her scent thou mayst revive my sprite and when he ended his verse he gave a great cry and fell down in a fainting fit the princesses sat round him weeping over him till he recovered and repeated these two couplets haply and happily may fortune bend her reign bringing my love for times a freak of jealous strain fortune may prosper me supply mine every want and bring a blessing where before were bon and bane then he wept till he fainted again and presently coming to himself recited the two following couplets my wish mine illness mine unease by allah own art thou content then i in love contented wone dost thou forsake me thus sans crime or sin meet me in ruth i pray and be our parting gone then he wept till he swooned away once more and when he revived he repeated these couplets sleep fled me by my side wake ever shows and hoard of tear-drops from these eyne eye flows for love they weep with beads cornelian like 
and growth of distance greater dolence grows lit up my longing o my love in me flames burning neath my ribs with fiery throes remembering thee a tear i never shed but in it thunder roars and leaven glows then he wept till he fainted away a fourth time and presently recovering recited these couplets ah for lo of love and longing suffer ye as suffer we say as pine we and as yearn we for you are pining ye allah do the death of love what a bitter draught is his would i wot of love what plans and what projects nurseth he your faces radiant fair though afar from me they shine are mirrored in our eyes whatsoever the distance be my heart must ever dwell on the memories of your tribe and the turtle dove reneweth all as oft as moaneth she ho thou dove who passest night tide in calling on thy fear thou doublest my repine bringing grief for company and leavest thou mine eyelids with weeping unfulfilled for the dearlings who departed whom we never more may see i melt for the thought of you at every time and hour and i long for you when night showeth cheek of blackest glee now when his sister heard these words and saw his condition and how he laid fainting on the floor she screamed and beat her face and the other princesses hearing her scream came out and learning his misfortune and the transport of love and longing and the passion and distraction that possessed him they questioned him of his case he wept and told them what had befallen in his absence and how his wife had taken flight with her children wherefore they grieved for him and asked him what she said at leave-taking answered he o my sisters she said to my mother tell thy son whenas he cometh to thee and the nights of severance upon him longsome shall be and he craveth reunion and meeting to see and whenas the winds of love and longing shake him dolefully let him fare in the islands of wak to me when they heard his words they signed one to other with their eyes and shook their heads and each looked at her sister whilst hasan looked at them all then they bowed their heads groundwards and bethought themselves a while after which they raised their heads and said there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great presently adding put forth thy hand to heaven and when thou reachest thither then shalt thou win to thy wife and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the seven hundred and ninety-ninth night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the princesses said to hasan put forth thy hand to heaven and when thou reachest thither then shalt win to wife and children thereat the tears ran down his cheeks like rain and wet his clothes and he recited these couplets pink cheeks and eyes and pupa black have dealt me sore despite and when as wake overpowered sleep my patience fled in fright the fair and sleek-limbed maidens hard of heart with all laid waste my very bones till not a breath is left for man to sight Horus, who fair with gait of grace as rose or sandy mound did allah's saints behold their charms they dote thereon forthright faring as fair is the garden breeze that bloweth in the dawn for love of them a sore unrest and troubles rack my sprite i hung my hopes upon a maid a leveling fair of them for whom my heart still burns with low in laws a hell they light a dearling soft of sides and hot and graceful in her gait her grace is white as morning but her hair is black as night she stirreth me but ah how many heroes have her cheeks upstirred for love and eke her eyes that mingle black and white then he wept whilst the princesses wept for his weeping and they were moved to compassion and jealousy for him so they fell to comforting him and exhorting him to patience and offering up prayers for his reunion with his wife whilst his sister said to him o oh, my brother be of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool and clear and be patient so shalt thou win thy will for whoso hath patience and waiteth that he seeketh attaineth patience holdeth the keys of relief and indeed the poet saith let destiny with slackened rein its course appointed fair and lie thou down to sleep by night with heart devoid of care for twixt the closing of an eye and the opening thereof god hath it in his power to change a case from foul to fair so hearten thy heart and brace up thy resolve for the son of ten years dieth not in the ninth weeping and grief and mourning gender sickness and disease 
wherefore do thou abide with us till thou be rested and i will devise some device for thy winning to thy wife and children inshallah so it please allah the most high and he wept sore and recited these verses and i be healed of disease in frame i'm unhealed of illness in heart and sprite there is no healing disease of love save lover and loved one to reunite then he sat down beside her and she proceeded to talk with him and comfort him and question him of the cause and the manner of his wife's departure so he told her and she said by allah o my brother i was minded to bid thee burn the feather dress but satan made me forget it she ceased not to converse with him and caress him in company with him other ten days whilst sleep visited him not and he delighted not in food and when the case was longsome upon him and unrest waxed in him he versified with these couplets a beloved familiar o'er reigns my heart and allah's ruling reigns evermore she hath all the arab's united charms this gazelle who feeds on my bosom's core though my skill and patience for love of her fail i weep whilst i wot that tis vain to deplore the dearling hath twice seven years as though she were moon of five nights and of five plus four when the youngest princess saw him and thus distracted for love and longing for passion and the fever heat of desire she went into her sisterhood weeping eyed and woeful hearted and shedding copious tears threw herself upon them kissed their feet and besought them to devise some device for bringing hasan to the islands of wak and effecting his reunion with his wife and wees she ceased not to conjure them to further her brother in the accomplishment of his desire and to weep before them till she made them weep and they said to her hearten thy heart we will do our best endeavour to bring about this reunion with this family inshallah and he abode with them a whole year during which his eyes never could retain their tears now the sisterhood had an uncle brother german to their sire and his name was abd al kadus or slave of the most holy and he loved the eldest with exceeding love and was wont to visit her once a year and do all she desired they had told him of hasan's adventure with the magian and how he had been able to slay him whereat he rejoiced and gave the eldest princess a pouch which contained certain perfumes saying o daughter of my brother an thou be in concern for aught or if aught irk thee or thou stand in any need cast of these perfumes upon fire naming my name and i will be with thee forthright and will do thy desire this speech was spoken on the first of muharram and the eldest princess said to one of the sisterhood lo the year is wholly past and my uncle is not come rise bring me the fire-sticks and the box of perfumes so the damsel arose rejoicing and fetching what she sought laid it before her sister who opened the box and taking thence a little of the perfume cast it into the fire naming her uncle's name nor was it burnt out ere appeared a dust cloud at the farther end of the wadi and presently lifting it discovered a sheikh riding on an elephant which moved at a swift and easy pace and trumpeted under the rider as soon as he came within sight of the princesses he began making signs to them with his hands and feet nor was it long ere he reached the castle and alighting from the elephant came in to them whereupon they embraced him and kissed his hands and saluted him with a salaam then he sat down whilst the girls talked with him and questioned him of his absence quoth he i was sitting but now with my wife your aunt when i smelt the perfumes and hastened to you on this elephant what wouldst thou o daughter of my brother quoth she o uncle indeed we longed for thee as the year is past and tis not thy wont to be absent from us more than a twelvemonth answered he i was busy but i purpose to come to you to-morrow wherefore they thanked him and blessed him and sat talking with him and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section eight recorded by sylvia Emby in washington state section nine of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight by anonymous translated by richard francis burton eighteen twenty one through eighteen ninety section nine when it was the eighth hundredth night she said 
it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the girls sat down to chat with their uncle the eldest said to him o my uncle we told thee the tale of hasan of bassorah whom bahram the magian brought and how he slew the wizard and how after enduring all manner of hardships and horrors he made prize of the supreme king's daughter and took her to wife and journeyed with her to his native land replied he yes and what befell him after that quoth the princess she played him false after he was blessed with two sons by her for she took them in his absence and fled with them to her own country saying to his mother whenas thy son returneth to thee and asketh for me and upon him the knights of severance longsome shall be and he craveth reunion and meeting to see and whenas the breezes of love and longing shake him dolefully let him come in the islands of wak to me when abd al kadus heard this he shook his head and bit his forefinger then bowing his brow groundwards he began to make marks on the earth with his finger-tip after which he again shook his head and looked right and left and shook his head a third time whilst hasan watched him from a place where he was hidden from him then said the princesses to their uncle return us some answer for our hearts are rent in sunder but he shook his head at them saying o my daughters verily hath this man wearied himself in vain and cast himself into grievous predicament and sore peril for he may not gain access to the islands of wak with this the princesses called hasan who came forth and advancing to sheikh abd al kudus kissed his hand and saluted him the old man rejoiced in him and seated him by his side whereupon quoth the damsels o uncle acquaint our brother hasan with that thou hast told us so he said to hasan o my son put away from thee this bin forte dur for thou canst never gain access to the islands of wak though the flying jinn and the wandering stars were with thee for that betwixt thee and these islands are seven wadis and seven seas and seven mighty mountains how then canst thou come in at the stead and who shall bring thee thither wherefore allah upon thee o my son do thou reckon thy spouse and sons as dead and turn back forthright and weary not thy sprite indeed i give thee good counsel and thou wilt but accept it hearing these words from the sheikh hasan wept till he fainted and the princesses sat round him weeping for his weeping whilst the youngest sister rent her raiment and buffeted her face till she swooned away when sheikh abd al kadus saw them in this transport of grief and trouble and mourning he was moved to ruth for them and cried be ye silent then said to hasan o my son hearten thy heart and rejoice in the winning of thy wish and it be the will of allah the most high presently adding rise o my son take courage and follow me so hasan arose forthright and after he had taken leave of the princesses followed him rejoicing in the fulfilment of his wish then the sheikh called the elephant and mounting took hasan up behind him and fared on three days with their knights like the blinding leaven till he came to a vast blue mountain whose stones were all of azure hue and a middlemost of which was a cavern with a door of chinese iron here he took hasan's hand and led him down and alighting dismissed the elephant then he went up to the door and knocked whereupon it opened and there came out to him a black slave hairless as he were an ifrit with brand in his right hand and a targe of steel in the left when he saw abd al kadus he threw sword and buckler from his grip and coming up to the sheikh kissed his hand thereupon the old man took hasan by the hand and entered with him whilst the slave shut the door behind them when hasan found himself in a vast cavern and a spacious through which ran an arched corridor and they ceased not faring on therein a mile or so till it abutted upon a great open space and thence they made for an angle of the mountain wherein were two huge doors cast of solid brass the old man opened one of them and said to hasan sit at the door whilst i go within and come back to thee in haste and beware lest thou open it and enter then he fared inside and shutting the door after him was absent during a full sidereal hour after which he returned leading a black stallion thin of flank and short of nose which was ready bridled and saddled with velvet housings and when it ran it flew and when it flew the very dust in vain would pursue and brought it to hasan saying mount so he mounted and abd al kadus opened the second door beyond which appeared a vast desert then the twain passed through the door into that desert 
and the old man said to him o my son take this scroll and wend thou whither this steed will carry thee when thou seest him stop at the door of a cavern like this alight and throw the reins over the saddle-bow and let him go he will enter the cavern which do thou not enter with him but tarry at the door five days without being weary of waiting on the sixth day there will come forth to thee a black shake clad all in sable with a long white beard flowing down to his navel as soon as thou seest him kiss his hands and seize his skirt and lay it on thy head and weep before him till he take pity on thee and he will ask thee what thou wouldst have when he saith to thee what is thy want give him this scroll which he will take without speaking and go in and leave thee wait at the door other five days without wearying and on the sixth day expect him and if he come out to thee himself know that thy wish will be won but if one of his pages come forth to thee know that he who cometh forth to thee purposeth to kill thee and the peace for know o my son that whoso self imperileth doeth himself to death and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was eight hundred and first night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that after handing the scroll to hasan shaykh abd al kadus told him what would befall him and said whoso self imperileth doeth himself to death but also who ventureth not advantageth not however an thou fear for thy life cast it not into danger of destruction but an thou fear not up and do thy will for i have expounded to thee the whole case yet shouldest thou be minded to return to thy friends the elephant is still here and he will carry thee to my nieces who will restore thee to thy country and return thee to thy home and allah will vouchsafe thee a better than this girl of whom thou art enamoured hasan answered the shaykh saying and how shall life be sweet to me except i win my wish by allah i will never turn back till i regain my beloved or my death overtake me and he wept and recited these couplets for loss of lover mine and stress of love i dree i stood bewailing self in deep despondency longing for him the spring camp's dust i kissed and kissed but this bred more of grief and galling reverie god guard the gone who in our hearts must e'er abide with nearing woes and joys which still the farther flee they say me patience but they bore it all away on parting day and left me naught save tormentry and naught affrighted me except the word he said forget me not when gone nor drive from memory to whom shall turn i hope in whom when you are lost who were my only hopes and joys and woes of me but ah the pang of home returned when parting thus how joyed at seeing me return mine enemy then well away this twas i guarded me against and ah thou low of love double thine ardency and fled for i my friends i'll not survive the flight yet an they deign return o oh joy o oh ecstasy never by allah tears and weeping i'll contain for loss of you but tears on tears and tears will rain when abd al kadus heard his verse he knew that he would not turn back from his desire nor would words have effect on him and was certified that naught would serve him but he must imperil himself though it lose him his life so he said to him know o my son that the islands of wak are seven islands wherein is a mighty host all virgin girls and the inner isles are peopled by satans and marids and warlocks and various tribesmen of the jinn and whoso entereth their land never returneth thence at least none hath done so to this day so allah upon thee return presently to thy people for know that she whom thou seekest is the king's daughter of all these islands and how canst thou attain to her hearken to me o my son and haply allah will vouchsafe thee in her stead a better than she o my lord answered hasan though for the love of her i were cut in pieces yet should i but redouble in love and transport there is no help but that i enter the wak islands and come to the sight of my wife and children and inshallah i will not return save with her and with them said the shaykh then nothing will serve thee but thou must make the journey hasan replied nothing and i only ask of thee thy prayers for help and aidance so haply allah will reunite me with my wife and children right soon then he wept for stress of longing and recited these couplets you are my wish of creatures brightest light i deem you leaf as hearing fain as sight you hold my heart 
which hath become your home and since you left me lords right sore is my plight then think not i have yielded up your love your love which set this wretch in fierce affright you went and went my joy when as you went and waned and waxed wan the brightest light you left me lone to watch the stars in woe railing tears like a raindrops infinite thou art longsome to the white who pining lies on wake moon gazing through the night o night wind and thou pass the tribe where they abide give them my greeting life is fain of flight and tell them somewhat of the pangs i bear the loved one kenneth not my case aright then he wept with sore weeping till he fainted away and when he came to himself sheikh abd al kadus said to him o my son thou hast a mother make her not taste the torment of thy loss hasan replied by allah o my lord i will never return except with my wife or my death shall overtake me and he wept and wailed and recited these couplets by love's right not of farness thy slave can estrange nor am i one to fail in my fealty i suffer such pains that i tell my case to folk they'd cry madness clean witless is he then ecstasy love longing transport and lo whose case is such case how shall ever he be with this the old man knew that he would not turn from his purpose though it cost him his life so he handed him the scroll and prayed for him and charged him how he should do saying i have in this letter given a strict charge concerning thee to abu al ruwaysh son of bilkis daughter of muin for he is my sheikh and my teacher and all men and jinn humble themselves to him and stand in awe of him and now go with the blessing of god hasan forthright set out giving the horse the rein and it flew off with him swiftlier than lightning and stayed not in its course ten days when he saw before him a vast loom black as night walling the world from east to west as he neared it the stallion neighed under him whereupon there flocked to it horses in number as the drops of rain none could tell their tale or against them prevail and fell to rubbing themselves against it hasan was affrighted at them and fared forwards surrounded by the horses without drawing rein till he came to the cavern which sheikh abd al kudus had described to him the steed stood still at the door and hasan alighted and bridged the bridle over the saddle-bow whereupon the steed entered the cavern whilst the rider abode without as the old man had charged him pondering the issue of his case in perplexity and distraction and unknowing what would befall him and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and second night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that hasan dismounting from the steed stood at the cavern mouth pondering the issue of his case and unknowing what might befall him he abode standing on the same spot five days with their nights sleepless mournful tear-eyed distracted perplexed pondering his severance from home and family comrades and friends with weeping eyelids and heavy heart then he bethought him of his mother and of what might yet happen to him and of his separation from his wife and children and of all that he had suffered and he recited these couplets with you is my heart cure a heart that goes and from hill foot of eyelids the tear rill flows and parting and sorrow and exile and dole and farness from country and throw that o'erthrows not in a mind save a lover distracted by love far parted from loved one and wilted by woes and tis love that hath brought me such sorrow say where is the noble of soul who such sorrows unknows hardly had hasan made an end of his verses when out came the sheikh abu al ruwaysh a blackamoor and clad in black raiment and at first sight he knew him by the description that abd al kadus had given him he threw himself at his feet and rubbed his cheeks on them and seizing his skirt laid it on his head and wept before him quoth the old man what wantest thou o my son whereupon he put out his hand to him with the letter and abu al ruwaysh took it and re-entered the cavern without making him any answer so hasan sat down at the cave mouth in his place other five days as he had been bidden whilst concern grew upon him and terror redoubled on him and restlessness got hold of him and he fell to weeping and bemoaning himself for the anguish of estrangement and much watching and he recited these couplets glory to him who guides the skies the lover sore in sorrow lies who hath not tasted of love's food knows not what mean its miseries 
did i attempt to stem my tears rivers of blood would fount and rise how many an intimate is hard of heart and pains in sorest wise and she with me her word would keep of tears and sighs i'd fain devise but i'm forgone rejected quite ruin on me hath cast her eyes at my fell pangs fell wildlings weep and not a bird for me but cries hasan ceased not to weep till dawn of the sixth day when sheikh abu al ruwaysh came forth to him clad in white raiment and with his hand signed to him to enter so he went in rejoicing and assured of the winning of his wish and the old man took him by the hand and leading him into the cavern fared on with him half a day's journey till they reached an arched doorway with a door of steel the sheikh opened the door and they two entered a vestibule vaulted with onyx stones and arabesqued with gold and they stayed not walking till they came to a great hall and a wide paved and walled with marble in its midst was a flower garden containing all manner of trees and flowers and fruits with birds warbling on the boughs and singing the praises of allah the almighty sovereign and there were four dadzes each facing each other and in each dads a jetting fountain at whose corners stood lions of red gold spouting gerbs from their mouths into the basin on each dads stood a chair whereon sat an elder with exceeding store of books before him and censers of gold containing fired perfumes and before each elder were students who read the books to him now when the twain entered the elders rose to them and did them honour whereupon abu al ruwaysh signed to them to dismiss their scholars and they did so then the four arose and seating themselves before that sheikh asked him of the case of hasan to whom he said tell the company thy tale and all that hath betided thee from the beginning of thine adventure to the end so hasan wept with sore weeping and related to them his story with bahram whereupon all the sheikhs cried out and said is this indeed he whom the magian caused to climb the mountain of clouds by means of the vultures sewn up in the camel hide and hasan said yes so they turned to the sheikh abu al ruwaysh and said to him o oh, our sheikh of a truth bahram contrived his mounting to the mountain top but how came he down and what marvel saw he there and abu al ruwaysh said o oh, hasan tell them how thou camest down and acquaint them with what thou sawest of marvels so he told them all that had befallen him first and last how he had gotten the magian into his power and slain him how he had delivered the youth from him and sent him back to his own country and how he had captured the king's daughter of the jinn and married her yet had she played him false and taken the two boys she had borne him and flown away brief he related to them all the hardships and horrors he had undergone whereat they marvelled each and every and said to abu al ruwaysh o elder of elders verily by allah this youth is to be pitied but be like thou wilt aid him to recover his wife and wees and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section nine recorded by sylvia m b in washington state Section ten of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume eight, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, eighteen twenty one through eighteen ninety. Section ten when it was the eight hundred and third night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hasan told his tale to the elders they said to sheikh abu al ruwaysh this youth is to be pitied and haply thou wilt aid him to recover his wife and weeds he replied o my brothers in very sooth this is a grave matter and a perilous and never saw i any loath his life save this youth you know that the islands of wak are hard of access and that none may come to them but at risk of life and ye know also the strength of their people and their guards moreover i have sworn an oath not to tread their soil nor transgress against them in aught so how shall this man come at the daughter of the great king and who hath power to bring him to her or help him in this matter replied the other o sheikh of sheikhs verily this man is consumed with desire 
and he hath endangered himself to bring thee a scroll from thy brother abd al kadus wherefore it behoveth thee to help him and hasan arose and kissed abu al ruwaysh's feet and raising the hem of his garment laid it on his head weeping and crying i beseech thee by allah to reunite me with my wife and children though it cost me my life and soul the four elders all wept for his weeping and said to abu al ruwaysh deal generously with this unhappy and show him kindness for the sake of thy brother abd al kadus and profit by this occasion to earn reward from allah for helping him quoth he this wilful youth weeteth not what he undertaketh but inshallah we will help him after the measure of our means nor leave aught feasible undone when hasan heard the shaykh's word he rejoiced and kissed the hands of the five elders one after other imploring their aidance thereupon abd al ruwaysh took ink-case and a sheet of paper and wrote a letter which he sealed and gave to hasan together with a pouch of perfumed leather containing incense and fire-sticks and other needs and said to him take strictest care of this pouch and whenas thou fallest into any strait burn a little of the incense therein and name my name whereupon i will be with thee forthright and save thee from thy stress moreover he bade one of those present fetch him an ifrit of the flying jinn and he did so incontinently whereupon quoth abu al ruwaysh to the fire drake what is thy name replied the ifrit thy thrall is hight danash bin faktash and the shaykh said draw near to me so danash drew near to him and he put his mouth to his ear and said somewhat to him whereat the ifrit shook his head and answered i accept o elder of elders then said abu al ruwaysh to hasan arise o my son mount the shoulders of this ifrit danash the flyer but when he heaveth thee heavenwards and thou hearest the angels glorifying god a welkin with subhana allah have a care lest thou do the like else wilt thou perish and he too hasan replied i will not say a word no never and the old men continued o hasan after faring with thee all this day to-morrow at peep of dawn he will set thee down in a land cleanly white like unto camphor whereupon do thou walk on ten days by thyself till thou come to the gate of a city then enter and inquire for the king of the city and when thou comest to his presence salute him with the salam and kiss his hand then give him this scroll and consider well what so he shall counsel thee hasan replied hearing and obeying and rose up and mounted the ifrit's shoulders whilst the elder rose and offered up prayers for him and commended him to the care of danash the fire drake and when he had perched on the flyer's back the ifrit soared with him to the very confines of the sky till he heard angels glorifying god in heaven and flew on with him a day and a night till at dawn of the next day he set him down in a land white as camphor and went his way leaving him there when hasan found himself in the land aforesaid with none by his side he fared on night and day for ten days till he came to the gate of the city in question and entering inquired for the king they directed him and told him that his name was king hasun lord of the land of camphor and that he had troops and soldiers enough to fill the earth in its length and breadth so he sought audience of him and being admitted to his presence found him a mighty king and kissed ground between his hands quoth the king what is thy want whereupon hasan kissed the letter and gave it to him the king read it and shook his head a while then said to one of his officers take this youth and lodge him in the house of hospitality so he took him and established him in the guest-house where he tarried three days eating and drinking and seeing none but the eunuch who waited on him and who entertained him with discourse and cheered him with his company questioning him of his case and how he came to that city whereupon he told him his whole story and the perilous condition wherein he was on the fourth day that eunuch carried him before the king who said to him o hasan thou comest to me seeking to enter the islands of wak as the sheikh of sheikhs adviseth me o my son i would send thee thither this very day but that by the way are many perils and thirsty wolds full of terrors yet do thou have patience and naught save fair shall befall thee for needs must i devise to bring thee to thy desire inshallah know o my son that here is a mighty host equipped with arms and steeds and warlike gear who long to enter the wak islands and lack power thereto but o my son for the sake of the sheikh abu al ruwaysh son of bilkis the daughter of muin i may not send thee back to him unfulfilled of thine affair 
presently there will come to us ships from the islands of Wak, and the first that shall arrive i will send thee on board of her and give thee in charge to the sailors so they may take care of thee and carry thee to the islands if any question thee of thy case and condition answer him saying i am kinsman to king hasun lord of the land of camphor and when the ship shall make fast to the shore of the islands of Wak, and the master shall bid thee land do thou land now as soon as thou comest ashore thou wilt see a multitude of wooden settles all about the beach of which do thou choose thee one and crouch under it and stir not when dark night sets in thou wilt see an army of women appear and flock about the goods landed from the ship and one of them will sit down on the settle under which thou hast hidden thyself whereupon do thou put forth thy hand to her and take hold of her and implore her protection and know thou o my son that an she accord thee protection thou wilt win thy wish and regain thy wife and children but if she refuse to protect thee make thy mourning for thyself and give up all hope of life and make sure of death for indeed thou art a dead man understand o my son that thou adventurest thy life and this is all i can do for thee and the peace and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and fourth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that king hasun spake these words to hasan and charged him as we have related ending with this is all i can do for thee and know that except the lord of heaven has aided thee thou hadst not come hither the youth wept till he swooned away and when he recovered he recited these two couplets a term decreed my lot i spy and when its day shall end i die though lions fought with me in lair if time be mine i beat them i then having ended his verse he kissed the ground before the sovereign and said to him o mighty king how many days remain till the coming of the ships replied the other in a month's time they will come and will tarry here selling their cargson other two months after which they will return to their own country so hope not to set out save after three whole months then the king bade him return to the house of hospitality and bade supply him with all that he needed of meat and drink and raiment fit for kings hasan abode in the guest-house a month at the end of which the vessels arrived and the king and the merchants went forth to them taking hasan with them amongst them he saw a ship with much people therein like the shingles for number none knew their tale save he who created them she was anchored in mid-harbour and had cocks which transported her ladding to the shore so hasan abode till the crew had landed all the goods and sold and bought and to the time of departure there wanted but three days whereupon the king sent for him and equipped him with all he required and gave him great gifts after which he summoned the captain of the great ship and said to him take this youth with thee in the vessel so none may know of him save thou and carry him to the islands of wak and leave him there and bring him not back and the race said to hear is to obey with love and gladness then quoth the king to hasan look thou tell none of those who are with thee in the ship thine errand nor discover to them aught of thy case else thou art a lost man and quoth he hearing and obedience with this he farewelled the king after he had wished him long life and victory over his enviers and his enemies wherefore the king thanked him and wished him safety and the winning of his wish then he committed him to the captain who laid him in a chest which he embarked in a dinghy and bore him aboard whilst the folk were busy in breaking bulk and no man doubted but the chest contained somewhat of merchandise after this the vessels set sail and fared on without ceasing ten days and on the eleventh day they made the land so the race set hasan ashore and as he walked up the beach he saw wooden settles without number none knew their count save allah even as the king had told him he went on till he came to one that had no fellow and hid under it till nightfall when there came up a mighty many of women as they were locusts over swarming the land and they marched afoot and armed caperpie and hauberks and straight-knit coats of mail hending drawn swords in their hands who seeing the merchandise landed from the ships busied themselves therewith presently they sat down to rest themselves and one of them seated herself on the settle under which hasan had crouched whereupon he took hold of the hem of her garment and laid it on his head and throwing himself before her fell to kissing her hands and feet and weeping and crying thy protection thy good will quoth she ho thou arise and stand up ere any see thee and slay thee 
so he came forth and springing up kissed her hands and wept and said to her o oh, my mistress i am under thy protection adding have ruth on one who is parted from his people and wife and children one who hath haste to rejoin them and one who adventureth life and soul for their sake take pity on me and be assured that therefore paradise will be thy reward or an thou wilt not receive me i beseech thee by allah the great the concealer to conceal my case the merchants stared to see him talking with her and she hearing his words and beholding his humility was moved to ruth for him her heart inclined to him and she knew that he had not ventured himself and come to that place save for a grave matter so she said to him o my son be of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool and clear hearten thy heart and take courage and return to thy hiding-place till the coming night and allah shall do as he will then she took leave of him and hasan crept under the wooden settle as before whilst the troops lighted flambeaux of wax mixed with aloes wood and nadd perfume and crude ambergris and passed the night in sport and delight till the morning at daybreak the boats returned to the shore and the merchants busied themselves with buying and selling and the transport of the goods and gear till nightfall whilst hasan lay hidden beneath the settle weeping-eyed and woeful-hearted knowing not what was decreed to him in the secret preordainment of allah as he was thus behold the merchant woman with whom he had taken refuge came up to him and giving him a habergeon and a helmet a spear a sword and a gilded girdle bade him don them and seat himself on the settle after which she left him for fear of the troops so he arose and donned the mail coat and helmet and clasped the girdle about his middle then he slung the sword over his shoulder till it hung under his armpit and taking the spear in his hand sat down on that saddle whilst his tongue neglected not to name allah almighty and call on him for protection and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and fifth night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hasan received the weapons which the merchant woman had given to him saying sit thee upon the settle and let none wot thy case he armed himself and took his seat whilst his tongue neglected not to name allah almighty and to call upon him for protection and behold there appeared cressets and lanthorns and flambeaux and up came the army of women so he arose and mingling with them became as one of them a little before daybreak they set out and hasan with them and fared on till they came to their camp where they dispersed each to her tent and hasan followed one of them and lo it was hers for whose protection he had prayed when she entered she threw down her arms and doffed her hauberk and veil so hasan did the like and looking at his companion saw her to be a grizzled old woman blue-eyed and big-nosed a calamity of calamities the foulest of all created things with face pockmarked and eyebrows bald gap-tooth and chap-fallen with hair hoary nose running and mouth slavering even as saith the like of her the poet in her cheek corners nine calamities wone and when shown each one jehanam is hideous the face and favour foulest foul as cheek of hog yea tis a cesspool fizz and indeed she was like a pied snake or a scald she-wolf now when the old woman looked at hasan she marvelled and said how came this one to these lands and in which of the ships was he and how arrived he hither in safety and she fell to questioning him of his case and admiring at his arrival whereupon he fell at her feet and rubbed his face on them and wept till he fainted and when he recovered himself he recited these couplets when will time grant we meet when shall we be again united after severance stark and shall i win my choicest wish in view blame end and love abide without remark were nile to flow as freely as my tears twould leave no region but with watermark twould overthrow hijaz and egypt land twould deluge syria and twould drown iraq this o oh my love is caused by thy disdain be kind and promise meeting fair and fain then he took the crone's skirt and laid it on his head and fell to weeping and craving her protection when she saw his ardency and transport and anguish and distress her heart softened to him and she promised him her safeguard saying have no fear whatsoever then she questioned him of his case and he told her the manner of his coming thither and all that had befallen him from the beginning to end whereat she marvelled and said this 
that that hath betide thee methinks never betide it any save thyself and except thou hadst been vouchsafed the especial protection of allah thou hadst not been saved but now o my son take comfort and be of good courage thou hast nothing more to fear for indeed thou hast won thy wish and attained thy desire if it please the most high thereat hasan rejoiced with joy exceeding and she sent to summon the captains of the army to her presence and it was the last day of the month so they presented themselves and the old woman said to them go out and proclaim to all the troops that they come forth to-morrow at daybreak and let none tarry behind for whoso tarrieth shall be slain they replied we hear and obey and going forth made proclamation to all the host anent a review next morning even as she bade them after which they returned and told her of this whereby hasan knew that she was the commander-in-chief of the army and the vice-regent in authority over them and her name was shawahi the fascinator entitled um al dawahi or mother of calamities she ceased not to bid and forbid and hasan doffed not off his arms from his body that day now when the morning broke all the troops fared forth from their places but the old woman came not out with them and as soon as they were sped and the stead was clear of them she said to hasan draw near unto me o my son so he drew near unto her and stood between her hands quoth she why and wherefore hast thou adventured thyself so boldly as to enter this land and how came thy soul to consent to its own undoing tell me the truth and the whole truth and fear aught of ill come of it for thou hast my plighted word and i am moved to compassion for thy case and pity thee and have taken thee under my protection so if thou tell me the truth i will help thee to win thy wish though it involve the undoing of souls and the destruction of bodies and since thou hast come to seek me no hurt shall betide thee from me nor will i suffer any to have at thee with harm of all who be in the islands of wak so he told her his tale from first to last acquainting her with the matter of his wife and of the birds how he had captured her as his prize from amongst the ten and married her and abode with her till she had borne him two sons and how she had taken her children and flown away with them whenas she knew the way to the feather dress brief he concealed from her no whit of his case from the beginning to that day but when shawahi heard his relation she shook her head and said to him glory be to god who hath brought thee hither in safety and made thee hap upon me for hadst thou happened on any but myself thou hadst lost thy life without winning thy wish but the truth of thine intent and thy fond affection and the excess of thy love-longing for thy wife and yearning for thy children these it was that have brought thee to the attainment of thine aim didst thou not love her and love her to distraction thou hadst not thus imperilled thyself and alhamdulillah praised be allah for thy safety wherefore it behoveth us to do thy desire and conduce to thy quest so thou mayst presently attain that thou seekest if it be the will of almighty allah but know my son that thy wife is not here but in the seventh of the islands of wak and between us and it is seven months journey night and day from here we go to an island called the land of birds wherein for the loud crying of the birds and the flapping of their wings one cannot hear other speak and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section ten recorded by sylvia m b in washington state section eleven of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight by anonymous translated by richard francis burton eighteen twenty one through eighteen ninety section eleven when it was the eight hundred and sixth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that the old woman said to hasan indeed thy wife is in the seventh island the greatest among the islands of wak and betwixt us and it is a seven months journey from here we fare for the land of birds whereon for the force of their flying and the flapping of their wings we cannot hear one other speak over that country we journey night and day eleven days after which we come forth of it to another called the land of pharaohs 
where for stress of roaring of lions and howling of wolves and laughing of hyenas and the crying of other beasts of prey we shall hear not and therein we travel twenty days journey then we issue therefrom and come to a third country called the land of the jann where for stress of the crying of the jinn and the flaming of fires and the flight of sparks and smoke from their mouths and the noise of their groaning and their arrogance in blocking up the road before us our ears will be deafened and our eyes blinded so that we shall neither hear nor see nor dare any look behind him or he perisheth but there horseman boweth head on saddle-bow and raiseth not for three days after this we abut upon a mighty mountain and a running river contiguous with the isles of wak which are seven in number and the extent whereof is a whole year's journey for a well-girt horseman and thou must know o my son that these troops are all virgin girls and that the ruler over us is a woman of the archipelago of wak on the bank of the river aforesaid is another mountain called mount wak and it is thus named by reason of a tree which beareth fruits like heads of the sons of adam when the sun riseth on them the heads cry out all saying in their cries wak wak glory be to the creating king al kalak and when we hear their crying we know that the sun is risen in like manner at sundown the heads set up the same cry wak wak glory to al kalak and so we know that the sun hath set no man may abide with us or reach to us or tread our earth and betwixt us and the abiding place of the queen who ruleth over us in a month's journey from this shore all the lieges whereof are under her hand as are also the tribes of the jinn marids and satans while of the warlocks none kenneth the number save he who created them wherefore an thou be afraid i will send with thee one who will convey thee to the coast and there bring one who will embark thee on board a ship that bear thee to thine own land but an thou be content to tarry with us i will not forbid thee and thou shalt be with me in mine eyes till thou win thy wish inshallah quoth he o my lady i will never quit thee till i foregather with my wife or lose my life and quoth she this is a light matter be of good heart for soon shalt thou come to thy desire allah willing and there is no help but that i let the queen know of thee that she may help thee to attain thy name hasan blessed her and kissed her head and hands thanking her for her good deed and exceeding kindness and firm will then he set out with her pondering the issue of his case and the horrors of his strangerhood wherefore he fell a weeping and a wailing and recited these couplets a zephyr bloweth from the lover's sight and thou canst view me in the saddest plight the night of union is as brilliant morn and black the severance day as black as night farewelling friend is sorrow sorest sore parting from lovers merest undelight i will not blame her harshness save to her and mid mankind nor friend nor fear i sight how can i be consoled for loss of you base censor's blame shall not console my sprite o thou in charms unique unique's my love o peerless thou my heart hath peerless might who maketh semblance that he loveth you and dreadeth blame is most blameworthy wight then the old woman bade beat the kettle-drums for departure and the army set out hasan fared with her drowned in the sea of solicitude and reciting verses like those above while she strave to comfort him and exhort him to patience but he awoke not from his tristesse and heeded not her exhortations they journeyed thus till they came to the boundaries of the land of birds and when they entered it it seemed to hasan as if the world were turned topsy-turvy for the exceeding clamour his head ached and his mind was dazed his eyes were blinded and his ears deafened and he feared with exceeding fear and made certain of death saying to himself if this be the land of birds how will be the land of beasts but when the crone hight shawahi saw him in this plight she laughed at him saying o oh, my son if this be thy case in the first island how will it fare with thee when thou comest to the others so he prayed to allah and humbled himself before the lord beseeching him to assist him against that wherewith he had afflicted him and bring him to his wishes and they ceased not going till they passed out of the land of birds and traversing the land of beasts came to the land of the jann which when hasan saw he was sore affrighted and repented him of having entered it with them but he saw aid of allah the most high and fared on with them 
till they were quit of the land of the jann and came to the river and set down their loads at the foot of a vast mountain and a lofty and pitched their tents by the stream bank then they rested and ate and drank and slept in security for they were come to their own country on the morrow the old woman set hasan a couch of alabaster inlaid with pearls and jewels and nuggets of red gold by the river-side and he sat down thereon having first bound his face with a chin kerchief that discovered naught of him but his eyes then she bade proclaim among the troops that they should all assemble before her tent and put off their clothes and go down into the stream and wash and thus she did that she might parade before him all the girls so haply his wife should be amongst them and he know her so the whole army mustered before her and putting off their clothes went down into the stream and hasan seated on his couch watched them washing their white skins and frolicking and making merry whilst they took no heed of his inspecting them deeming him to be of the daughters of the kings when he beheld them stripped of their clothes his cord stiffened for that looking at them mother naked he saw what was between their thighs and that of all kinds soft and rounded plump and cushioned large-lipped perfect redundant and ample and their faces were as moons and their hair as night upon day for that they were of the daughters of the kings when they were clean they came up out of the water stark naked as the moon on the night of fullness and the old woman questioned hasan of them company by company if his wife were among them but as often as she asked him of a troop he made answer she is not among these o my lady and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and seventh night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that the old woman questioned hasan of the girls company after company if haply his wife were among them but as often as she asked him of a troop he made answer she is not among these o my lady last of all there came up a damsel attended by ten slave girls and thirty waiting women all of them high-bosomed maidens they put off their clothes and went down into the river where the damsel fell to riding the high horse over her women throwing them down and ducking them on this wise she continued for a full hour after which all came up out of the water and sat down and they brought her napkins of gold perfled silk with which she dried herself then they brought her clothes and jewels and ornaments of the handiwork of the jinn and she donned them and rose and walked with graceful pace among the troops she and her maidens when hasan saw her his heart was ready to fly from his breast and he said verily this girl is the likest of all folk to the bird i saw in the basin atop the palace of my sisters the princesses and she lorded it over her lieges even as doth this one the old woman asked o hasan is this thy wife and he answered no but thy life o my lady this is not my wife nor ever in my life have i set eyes on her neither among all the girls have i seen in these islands is there the like of my wife nor her match for symmetry and grace and beauty and loveliness then said shawaki describe her to me and acquaint me with all her attributes that i may have her in my mind for i know every girl in the island of wak being commander of the army of maids and governor over them wherefore an thou describe her to me i shall know her and will contrive for thee to take her quoth he my wife hath the fairest face and a form all grace smooth is she of cheeks and high of breasts with eyes of liquid light calves and thighs plump to sight teeth snowy white with dulcet speech dight in speech soft and bland as she were a willow wand her gifts are a moral and lips are red as coral her eyes were natural cold dye and her lower labia in softness lie on her right cheek is a mole and on her waist under her navel is a sign her face shines as the rondeur of the moon in sheen her waist is slight her hips a heavy weight and the water of her mouth the sick doth heal as it were causer or salsabil said the old woman give me an increased account of her allah increase thee of passion for her quoth he my wife hath a face the fairest fair and oval cheeks the rarest rare neck long and spare and eyes that coal wear her side face shows the anemones of nu'uman her mouth is like a seal of cornelian and flashing teeth that lure and stand one instead of cup and ewer she is cast in the mould of pleasantness and between her thighs is the throne of the caliphate 
there is no such sanctuary among the holy places as saith in its praise the poet the name of what drave me distraught hath letters renowned among men a four into five multiplied and a multiplied six into ten then hasan wept and chanted the following mawal o heart and lover false thee shun the parting bane nor to forgetfulness thy thoughts constrain be patient thou shalt bury all thy foes allah near falseth man of patience vain and this also and wouldst be the life long safe vaunt not delight never despair nor wone or joyed in sprite forbear rejoice not mourn not o'er thy plight and in ill day have not we open recite thereupon the old woman bowed her head groundwards awhile then raising it said laud be to the lord the mighty of award indeed i am afflicted with thee o hasan would heaven i had never known thee this woman whom you describeth to me as thy wife i know by description and i know her to be none other than the eldest daughter of the supreme king she who ruleth over all the islands of wak so open both eyes and consider thy case and if thou be asleep awake for if this woman be indeed thy wife it is impossible for thee ever to obtain her and though thou come to her yet couldst thou not avail to her possession since between thee and her the distance is as that between earth and heaven wherefore o my son return presently and cast not thyself into destruction nor cast me with thee for me seemeth thou hast no lot in her so return whence thou camest lest our lives be lost and she feared for herself and for him when hasan heard her words he wept till he fainted and she left not sprinkling water on his face till he came to himself when he continued to weep so that he drenched his dress with tears for the much cark and care and chagrin which betided him by reason of her words and indeed he despaired of life and said to the old woman o oh, my lady and how shall i go back after having come hither verily i thought not thou wouldst forsake me nor fail of the winning of my wish especially as thou art the commander-in-chief of the army of the girls answered sawahi o oh, my son i doubted not but thy wife was a maid of the maids and had i known she was the king's daughter i had not suffered thee to come hither nor had i shown the troops to thee for all the love i bear thee but now o oh, my son thou hast seen all the girls naked so tell me which of them pleaseth thee and i will give her to thee in lieu of thy wife and do thou put it that thy wife and children are dead and take her and return to thine own country in safety ere thou fall into the king's hand and i have no means of delivering thee so allah upon thee o my son hearken unto me choose thyself one of these damsels in the stead of yonder woman and return presently to thy country in safety and cause me not to quaff the cup of thy anguish for by allah thou hast cast thyself into affliction sore and peril galore wherefrom none may avail to deliver thee evermore but hasan hung down his head and wept with long weeping and recited these couplets blame not said i to all who blamed me mine eyelids not but tears were made to dree the tears that brim these orbs have overflowed my cheeks for lovers and love's cruelty leave me to love though waste this form of me for i of love adore the insanity and o oh, my dearling passion grows on me for you and you why grudge me clemency you wronged me after swearing troth and plight false to my companionship and turned to flee a cup of humbling for your rigour sore ye made me drain what day departed ye then melt o oh heart with longing for their sight and o oh, mine eyes with crowns of tears be dight and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and eighth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the old woman said to hasan by allah o my son hearken to my words choose thee one of these girls in lieu of thy wife and presently return to thy country in safety he hung down his head and recited the couplets quoted above then he wept till he swooned away and shawali sprinkled water on his face till he revived when she addressed him o oh my lord i have no shift left because if i carry thee to the city thy life is lost and mine also for when the queen cometh to know of this she will blame me for admitting thee into her lands and islands whereto none of adam's sons hath access and will slay me for bringing thee with me 
and for suffering mortal to look upon the virgin seen by thee in the sea whom neer touched male nor neither approached mate and hasan sware that he had never looked on them with evil eye she resumed o my son hearken to me and return to thy country and i will give thee wealth and treasures and things of price such as shall suffice thee for all the women in the world moreover i will give thee a girl of the best of them so lend an ear to my words and return presently and imperil not thyself indeed i counsel thee with good counsel but he wept and rubbed both cheeks against her feet saying o my lady and mistress and coolth of mine eyes how can i turn back now that i have made my way hither without the sight of those i desire and now that i have come near the beloved sight hoping for meeting forthright so haply there may be a portion in reunion to my plight and he improvised these couplets o kings of beauty grace to prisoner tame of eyelids fit to rule the chosro's reign yet past the wafts of musk in perfumed breath your cheeks the charms of blooming rose disdain the softest zephyr breathes where pitchy camp and thence far scattered sweetness fills the plain censure of me leave blame and stint advice thou bringest wearying words and wisdom vain why heat my passion with this flame and upbraid me when naught thou knowest of its bane captured me eyes with passion maladiths and overthrew me with love's might and main i scatter tears the while i scatter verse you are my theme for rhyme and prosy strain melted my vitals glow of rosy cheeks and in the lazalo my heart is lain tell me and i leave to discourse of you what speech my breast shall broaden tell me deign life long i love the lovelings fair but ah to grant my wish eke allah must be fain hearing his verses the old woman was moved to ruth for him and allah planted the seed of affection for him in her heart so coming up to him she consoled him saying be of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool and clear and put away trouble from thy thought for by allah i will venture my life with thee till thou attain thine aim or death undo me with this hasan's heart was comforted and his bosom broadened and he sat talking with the old woman till the end of day when all the girls dispersed some entering their town mansions and others nighting in the tents then the old woman carried him into the city and lodged him in a place apart lest any should come to know of him and tell the queen of him and she should slay him and slay her who had brought him thither moreover she served him herself and strave to put him in fear of the awful majesty of the supreme king his wife's father whilst he wept before her and said o oh, my lady i choose death for myself and loath this worldly life if i foregather not with my wife and children and i have set my existence on the venture and will either attain my aim or die the old woman fell to pondering the means of bringing him and his wife together and casting about how to do in the case of this unhappy one who had thrown himself into destruction and would not be diverted from his purpose by fear or aught else for indeed he recked not of his life and the sayer of bywords saith lover in no wise hearkeneth he to the speech of the man who is fancy free now the name of the queen of the island wherein they were was nur al huda eldest daughter of the supreme king and she had six virgin sisters abiding with their father whose capital and court were in the chief city of that region and who had made her ruler over all the lands and islands of wak so when the ancient dame saw hasan on fire with yearning after his wife and children she rose up and repaired to the palace and going in to queen nur al huda kissed ground before her for she had a claim on her favour because she had reared the king's daughters one and all and had authority over each and every of them and was high in honour and consideration with them and with the king nur al huda rose to her as she entered and embracing her seated her by her side and asked her of her journey she answered by allah o my lady twas a blessed journey and i have brought thee a gift which i will presently present to thee adding o my daughter o queen of the age and the time i have a favour to crave of thee and i fain would discover it to thee that thou mayest help me to accomplish it and but for my confidence that thou wilt not gainsay me therein i would not expose it to thee asked the queen and what is thy need expound it to me and i will accomplish it to thee for i and my kingdom and troops are all at thy commandment and disposition therewithal the old woman quivered as quivereth the reed on a day when the storm wind is abroad and saying in herself o protector protect me from the queen's mischief 
fell down before her and acquainted her with hasan's case saying o my lady a man who had hidden himself under my wooden settle on the seashore sought my protection so i took him under my safeguard and carried him with me among the army of girls armed and accoutred so that none might know him and brought him into the city and indeed i have striven to affright him with thy fierceness giving him to know of thy power and prowess but as often as i threatened him he weepeth and reciteth verses and saith needs must i have my wife and children or die and i will not return to my country without them and indeed he hath adventured himself and come to the islands of wab and never in all my days saw i mortal heartier of heart than he or doughtier of daring do save that love hath mastered him to the utmost of mastery and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section eleven recorded by sylvia m b in washington state section twelve of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, 1821-1890. to 1890. Section 12. When it was the eight hundred and ninth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the old woman related to Queen Nur al Huda the adventure of Hasan, ending with, Never I saw any one heartier of heart than he, save that love hath mastered him to the utmost of mastery. The queen, after lending an attentive ear and comprehending the case, waxed wroth at her with exceeding wrath and bowed her head a while groundwards. Then raising it, she looked at Shawahi and said to her, O ill omened beldam, Art thou come to such a pass of lewdness that thou carriest males, men, with thee into the islands of Wak, and bringest them into me, unfearing of my mischief? Who hath forgone thee with this fashion that thou shouldst do thus? By the head of the king, but for thy claim on me for fosterage and service, I would forthwith do both him and thee to die the foulest of deaths, that travellers might take warning by thee. O oh, accursed! lest any other do the like of this outrageous deed thou hast done, which none durst hitherto. But go and bring him hither forthright, that I may see him, or I will strike off thy head, O accursed. So the old woman went out from her, confounded, unknowing whither she went, and saying, All this calamity hath Allah driven upon me from this queen, because of Hassan. And going in to him, said, Rise, speak with the queen, O white, whose last hour is at hand. So he rose and went with her, whilst his tongue ceased not to call upon Almighty Allah, and say, O oh my God, be gracious to me in thy decrees, and deliver me from this thine affliction. And Shawahi went with him, charging him by the way how he should speak with the queen. When he stood before Nur al-Huda, he had found that she had donned the chin-veil, so he kissed the ground before her, and saluted her with the salam, improvising these two couplets. God make thy glory last in joy of life. Allah confirm the boons he deigned bestow. Thy grace and grandeur may our Lord increase, and I, the Almighty, aid thee o'er thy foe. When he ended his verse, Nur al-Huda bade the old woman ask him questions before her, that she might hear his answers. So she said to him, The queen returneth thy salam greeting, and saith to thee, What is thy name and that of thy country? And what are the names of thy wife and children, on whose account thou art come hither? Quoth he, and indeed he had made firm his heart, and destiny aided him, O queen of the age and tide, and peerless joy of the epoch and the time, my name is Hassan, the fulfilled of sorrow, and my native city is Basorah. I know not the name of my wife, but my children's names are Nasir and Mansur. When the queen heard his reply and his provenance, she bespoke him herself, and said, And whence took she her children? He replied, O queen, she took them from the city of Baghdad, and the place of the caliphate. Quoth Nur al-Huda, And did she say naught to thee at the time she flew away? And quoth he, Yes, she said to my mother, Whenas thy son cometh to thee, and the nights of severance upon him longsome shall be, and he craveth meeting and reunion to see, and whenas the breezes of love and longing shake him dolefully, let him come in the islands of walk to me. 
whereupon Queen Nur al-Huda shook her head and said to him, Had she not desired thee, she had not said to thy mother this say, and had she not yearned for reunion with thee, never had she bidden thee to her stead, nor acquainted thee with her abiding-place. Rejoined Hasan, O mistress of kings and asylum of prince and pauper, whatso happened I have told thee, and have concealed naught thereof, and I take refuge from evil with Allah and with thee, Wherefore, oppress me not, but have compassion on me, and earn recompense and requital for me in the world to come, and aid me to regain my wife and children. Grant me my urgent need, and cool mine eyes with my children, and help me to the sight of them. Then he wept and wailed, and lamenting his lot, recited these two couplets. Yea, I will laud thee while the ring-dove moans, though fail my wish of due and lawful scope. Ne'er was I whirled in bliss and joys gone by, wherein I found thee not both root and rope. The queen shook her head, and bowed it in thought a long time. Then, raising it, she said to Hassan, and indeed she was wroth, I have ruth on thee, and am resolved to show thee in review all the girls in the city and in the provinces of my island, and in case thou know thy wife, I will deliver her to thee. But, and thou know her not, and know her not her place, I will put thee to death, and crucify thee over the old woman's door. Replied Hassan, I accept this from thee, O queen of the age, and am content to submit to this thy condition. There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. And he recited these couplets. You've roused my desire, and remain at rest, waked my wounded lids, while you slept with zest. And ye made me a vow ye would not hang back, but your guile, when you chained me, waxed manifest. I loved you in childhood unknowing love, then slay me not, who am sore oppressed. Fear ye not from Allah when slaying a friend, who gazeth on stars when folk sleep their best. By Allah, my kinsman, indite on my tune. This man was the slave of love's harshest hest. Haps a noble youth like me love's own thrall, when he sees my grave on my name shall call. Then Queen Nur al-Huda commanded that not a girl should abide in the city, but should come up to the palace and pass in review before Hassan, and moreover she bade Shawahi go down in person and bring them up herself. Accordingly, all the maidens in the city presented themselves before the queen, who caused them to go in to Hassan, hundred after hundred, till there was no girl left in the place but she had shown her to him. Yet he saw not his wife amongst them. Then said she to him, Seest thou her amongst these? And he replied, by thy life, O queen, she is not amongst them. With this she was sore enraged against him, and said to the old woman, Go in and bring out all who are in the palace, and show them to him. So she displayed to him every one of the palace girls, but he saw not his wife among them, and said to the queen, By the life of thy head, O queen, she is not among these. Whereat the queen was wroth, and cried out at those around her, saying, Take him and hale him along, face to earth, and cut off his head, lest any adventure himself after him, and intrude upon us in our country, and spy out our estate by thus treading the soil of our islands. So they threw him down on his face and dragged him along, then covering his eyes with his skirt, stood at his heads with bared brands, awaiting royal permission. Thereupon Shawahi came forward, and kissing the ground before the queen, took the hem of her garment, and laid it on her head, saying, O queen, by my claim for fosterage be not hasty with him, more by token of thy knowledge that this poor wretch is a stranger, who hath adventured himself, and suffered what none ever suffered before him, and Allah, to whom belong might and majesty, preserved him from death, for that his life was ordained to be long. He heard of thine equity, and entered the city in guarded sight. Wherefore, if thou put him to death, the report will dispread abroad of thee, by means of the travellers, that thou hatest strangers, and slayest them. He is in any case at thy mercy, and the slain of thy sword, if his wife be not found in thy dominions. And whensoever thou desireth his presence, I can bring him back to thee. Moreover, in very sooth I took him under my protection, only of my trust in thy magnanimity, through my claim on thee for fosterage so that I engage to him that thou wouldst bring him to his desire, for my knowledge of thy justice and quality of mercy. But for this I had not brought him into thy kingdom, for I said to myself, The queen will take pleasure in looking upon him, and hearing him speak his verses, and his sweet discourse, and eloquent, which is like unto pearls strung on string. Moreover, he hath entered our land, and eaten of our meat, wherefore he hath a claim upon us. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the eight hundred and tenth night, she continued, 
it hath reached me o auspicious king that when queen nur al huda bade her pages seize hasan and smite his neck the old woman shawahi began to reason with her and say verily he hath entered our land and eaten of our meat wherefore he hath a claim upon us the more especially since i promised him to bring him in company with thee and thou knowest that parting is a grievous ill and severance hath power to kill especially separation from children now he hath seen all our women save only thyself so do thou show him thy face the queen smiled and said how can he be my husband and have had children by me that i should show him my face then she made them bring hasan before her and when he stood in the presence she unveiled her face which when he saw he cried out with a great cry and fell down fainting the old woman ceased not to tend him till he came to himself and as soon as he revived he recited these couplets o breeze that blowest from the land iraq and from their corners who so cry whack whack bear news of me to friends and say for me i've tasted passion food of bitter smack o dearlings of my love show grace and ruth my heart is melted for this severance rack when he ended his verse he rose and looking on the queen's face cried out with a great cry for stress whereof the palace was like to fall upon all therein then he swooned away again and the old woman ceased not to tend him until he revived when she asked him what ailed him and he answered in very sooth this queen is either my wife or else the likest of all folk to my wife and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and eleventh night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when the old woman asked hasan what ailed him he answered in very sooth this queen is either my wife or else the likest of all folk to my wife quoth nur al huda to the old woman woe to thee o nurse this stranger is either jinn mad or out of his mind for he stareth me in the face with wide eyes and saith i am his wife quoth the old woman o queen indeed he is excusable so blame him not for the saying saith for the lovesick is no remedy and alike are the madman and he and hasan wept with sore weeping and recited these two couplets I sight their track and pine for longing love, and o'er their homesteads weep I and I yearn, and I pray heaven who willed we should part, will deign to grant us boon of safe return. Then said Hasan to the queen once more, By Allah, thou art not my wife, but thou art the likest of all folk to her. Hereupon Nur al Huda laughed till she fell backwards and rolled round on her side. Then she said to him, O oh, my friend, Take thy time, and observe me attentively. Answer me at thy leisure, what I shall ask thee, and put away from thee insanity and perplexity and inadvertency, for the relief is at hand. Answered Hasan, O mistress of kings, and asylum of all princes and paupers, when I looked upon thee I was distracted, seeing thee to be either my wife or the likest of all folk to her, but now ask me whatso thou wilt. Quoth she, What is it in thy wife that resembleth me? And quoth he, o oh, my lady all that is in thee of beauty and loveliness elegance and amorous grace such as the symmetry of thy shape and the sweetness of thy speech and the blushing of thy cheeks and the jutting of thy breasts and so forth all resembleth her and thou art her very self in thy faculty of parlance and the fairness of thy favour and the brilliancy of thy brow when the queen heard this she smiled and gloried in her beauty and loveliness and her cheeks reddened and her eyes wantoned then she turned to shawawi um Dawawi, and said to her o my mother carry him back to the place where he tarried with thee and tend him thyself till i examine into his affair for an he be indeed a man of manliness and mindful of friendship and love and affection it behoveth we help him to win his wish more by token that he hath sojourned in our country and eaten of our victual not to speak of the hardships of travel he hath suffered and the travail and horrors he hath undergone but when thou hast brought him to thy house commend him to the care of thy dependents and return him to me in all haste and allah almighty willing all shall be well thereupon shawahi carried him back to her lodging and charged her handmaids and servants and sweet wait upon him and bring him all he needed nor fail in what was his due then she returned to queen nur al huda who bade her don her arms and set out taking with her only a thousand doughty horsemen so she obeyed and donned her war-gear and having collected the thousand riders reported them ready to the queen who bade her march upon the city of the supreme king her father there to alight at the abode of her youngest sister manar al sana and say to her clothe thy two sons in the coats of mail which their aunt hath made them and send them to her 
for she longeth for them. Moreover, the queen charged her keep Hassan's affair secret, and say to Manar al-Sana, after securing her children, Thy sister inviteth thee to visit her. Then, she continued, bring the children to me in haste, and let her follow at her leisure. Do thou come by a road other than the, her road, and journey night and day, and beware of discovering this matter to any. And I swear by all manner of oaths, that if my sister prove to be his wife, and it appear that her children are his, I will not hinder him from taking her and them, and departing with them to his own country. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the eight hundred and twelfth night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the queen said, I swear by Allah, and by all manner of oaths, that if she prove to be his wife, I will not hinder him from taking her, but will aid him thereto, and eke to departing with them to his motherland. And the old woman put faith in her words, knowing not what she purposed in her mind. For the wicked Jezebel had resolved that if she were not his wife, she would slay him, but if the children resembled him, she would believe him. The queen resumed, O oh, my mother, and my thought tell me true, my sister Manar al-Sana is his wife, but Allah alone is all-knowing. Seeing that these traits of surpassing beauty and excelling grace of which he spoke are found in none except my sisters, and especially in the youngest. The old woman kissed her hand, and returning to Hassan, told him what the queen had said, whereat he was like to fly for joy, and coming up to her kissed her head. Quoth she, O my son, kiss not my head, but kiss me on the mouth, and be this kiss by way of sweetmeat for thy salvation. Be of good cheer, and keep thine eyes cool and clear, and grudge not to kiss my mouth, for I and only I was the means of thy foregathering with her. So take comfort, and hearten thy heart, and broaden thy breast, and gladden thy glance, and console thy soul, for Allah willing, thy desire shall be accomplished at my hand. So saying, she bade him farewell and departed, whilst he recited these two couplets. Witnesses unto love of thee I've four, and wants each case two witnesses no more. A heart eye fluttering, limbs that ever quake, a wasted frame and tongue that speech forswore. And also these two. Two things there be, and blood tears thereover, wept eyes till not one trace thou couldst discover. Eyes ne'er could pay the tithe to them is due, the prime of youth and severance from lover. Then the old woman armed herself, and taking with her a thousand weaponed horsemen, set out and journeyed, till she came to the island and the city where dwelt the lady Manar al-Sana, and between which and that of her sister Queen Nur al-Huda was three days' journey. When Shawahi reached the city she went in to the princess, and saluting her, gave her her sister's salam, and acquainted her with the queen's longing for her and her children, and that she reproached her for not visiting her. Quoth Manar al-Sana, Verily, I am beholden to my sister, and have failed of my duty to her in not visiting her, but I will do so forthright. Then she bade pitch her tents without the city, and took with her for her sister a suitable present of rare things. Presently the king her father looked out a window of his palace, and seeing the tents pitched by the road, asked of them, and they answered him, The princess Marnar al-Sana hath pitched her tents by the wayside, being minded to visit her sister, Queen Nur al Huda. When the king heard this, he equipped troops to escort her to her sister, and brought out to her from his treasures meat and drink and monies and jewels and rarities which beggar description. Now the king had seven daughters, all sisters German by one mother and father except the youngest. The eldest was called Nur al-Hudur, the second Najim al-Sabah, the third Shams al-Zur, the fourth Shajarat al-Dur, the fifth Kut al kulub the sixth Sharaf al-Banat, and the youngest Manar al-Sana, Hassan's wife, who was their sister by the father's side only. Anon, the old woman again presented herself, and kissed ground before the princess, who said to her, Hast thou any need, O my mother? Quoth Shawahi, Thy sister, Queen Nur al-Huda, biddeth thee clothe thy sons in the two Habersians, which she fashioned for them, and send them to her by me, and I will take them and forego thee with them, and be the harbinger of glad tidings, and the announcer of thy coming to her. When the princess heard these words, her colour changed, and she bowed her head for a long time, after which she shook it, and looking up, said to the old woman, O my mother, my vitals tremble, and my heart fluttereth when thou namest my children, for from the time of their birth none hath looked on their faces, either jinn or man, male or female, and I am jealous for them of the zephyr when it breatheth in the night. Exclaimed the old woman, What words are these, O my lady? 
Dost thou fear for them from thy sister? And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 12《Section Thirteen of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruby Huck. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Eight, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, eighteen twenty-one to eighteen ninety. Section thirteen, night eighteen thirty to eighteen eighteen, when it was the eight hundred and thirteenth night, she said, "It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the old woman said to the princess Manar al Sana, "What words be these, O my lady? Dost thou fear for them from thy sister? Allah safeguard thy reason. Thou mayst not cross the queen's majesty in this matter." for she would be wroth with thee however o my lady the children are young and thou art excusable in fearing for them for those that love well are wont to deem ill but o my daughter thou knowest my tenderness and mine affection for thee and thy children for indeed i reared thee before them i will take them in my charge and make my cheek their pillow and open my heart and set them within nor is it needful to charge me with care of them in the like of this case so be of cheerful heart and tearless eye and send them to her for at the most i shall but precede thee with them a day or at most two days and she ceased not to urge her till she gave way fearing her sister's fury and unknowing what lurked for her in the dark future and consented to send them with the old woman so she called them and bade them and equipped them and changed their apparel then she clad them in the two little coats of mail and delivered them to shawahi who took them and sped on with them like a bird by another road than that by which their mother should travel even as the queen had charged her nor did she cease to fare on with all diligence being fearful for them till she came in sight of nurul huda's city when she crossed the river and entering the town carried them in to their aunt the queen rejoiced at their sight and embraced them and pressed them to her breast after which she seated them one upon the right thigh and the other upon the left and turning round said to the old woman fetch me hassan forthright for i have granted him my safeguard and have spared him from my sabre and he hath sought asylum in my house and taken up his abode in my courts after having endured hardships and horrors and passed through all manner mortal risks each terribler than the other yet hitherto is he not safe from drinking the cup of death and from cutting off his breath and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and fourteenth night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when queen nurul huda bade the old woman bring hasan she said verily he hath endured hardships and horrors and passed through all manner mortal risks each terribler than other yet hitherto he is not saved from death and from the cutting off of his breath replied shawahi and i bring him to thee wilt thou reunite him with these his children or if they prove not his wilt thou pardon him and restore him to his own country hearing these her words the queen waxed exceedingly wroth and cried to her fie upon thee o ill-omened old woman how long wilt thou false us in the matter of this strange man who hath dared to intrude himself upon us and hath lifted our veil and pried into our conditions say me thinkest thou that he shall come to our land and look upon our faces and betray our honour and after return in safety to his own country and expose our affairs to his people wherefore our report will be bruited abroad among all the kings of the quarters of the earth and the merchants will journey bearing tidings of us in all directions saying a mortal entered the isles of wak 
and traversed the land of the jinn and the lands of the wild beasts and the islands of birds and set foot in the country of the warlocks and the enchanters and returned in safety this shall never be no never and i swear by him who made the heavens and builded them yea by him who dispread the earth and smoothed it and who created all creatures and counted them that and they be not no never and i swear by him who made the heavens and builded them yea by him who dispread the earth and smoothed it and who created all creatures and counted them that and they be not his children i will assuredly slay him and strike his neck and mine old hand then she cried out at the old woman who fell down for fear and set upon her the chamberlain and twenty mamelukes saying go with this crone and fetch me in haste the youth who is in her house so they dragged shawahi along yellow with fright and with side muscles quivering till they came to her house where she went into hasan who rose to her and kissed her hands and saluted her she returned not his salam but said to him come speak the queen did i not say to thee return presently to thine own country and i will give thee that to which no mortal may avail and did i forbid thee from all this but thou wouldst not obey me nor listen to my words nay thou rejectest my counsel and choosest to bring destruction to me on, on thyself up then and take that which thou hast chosen for death is near hand arise speak with yonder vile harlot f n number one fifty one and tyrant that she is so hasan rose broken spirited heavy-hearted and full of fear and crying o preserver preserver thou me o my god be gracious to me in that which thou hast decreed to me of thine affliction and protect me o thou the most merciful of the mercifuls then despairing of his life he followed the twenty mamelukes the chamberlain and the crone to the queen's presence where he found his two sons nasir and mansur sitting in her lap while she played and made merry with them as soon as his eyes fell on them he knew them and crying a great cry fell down a fainting for excess of joy at the sight of his children and shahzad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and fifteenth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hasan's eyes fell upon his two sons he knew them both and crying a great cry fell down a fainting they also knew him f n were number one fifty two and natural affection moved them so that they freed themselves from the queen's lap and fell upon hasan and allah to whom belong might and majesty made them speak and say to him o our father whereupon the old woman and all those who were present wept for pity and tenderness over them and said praise be allah who hath reunited you with your sire presently hasan came to himself and embracing his children wept till again he swooned away and when he revived he recited these verses by rights of you his heart of mine could ne'er abide severance from you albeit union death imply your phantom saith to me a morrow we shall meet shall i despite the foe the morrow day espy by rights of you i swear my lords that since the day of severance near the sweets of lips enjoyed i and allah bade me perish for the love of you mid greatest martyrs for your love i lief will die after gazelle doth make my heart her brows instead the while her form of flesh like sleep eludes mine eye if in the lists of law my bloodshed she deny prove it to witnesses whose cheeks of ruddy dye when nurul huda was assured that the little ones were indeed hasan's children and that her sister the princess manarul sana was his wife of whom he was come in quest she was wroth against her with wrath beyond measure and shahzad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and sixteenth night she pursued it had reached me o auspicious king that when nurul huda was certified that the little ones were hasan's children and that her sister manar al sana was his wife of whom he had come in quest she raged with exceeding rage too great to be assuaged and screamed in hasan's face and reviled him and kicked him in the breast so that he fell on his back in a swoon 
when she cried out at him saying arise fly for thy life but that i swore that no evil should betide thee from me should thy tale prove true i would slay thee with mine own hand forthright and she cried out at the old woman who fell on her face for fear and said to her by allah but that i am loath to break the oath that i swore i would put both thee and him to death after the foulest fashion presently adding arise go out from before me in safety and return to thine own country for i swear by my fortune if ever mine eye espy thee or if any bring thee in to me after this i will smite off my head and that of whoso bringeth thee then she cried out to her officers saying put him out from before me so they thrust him out and when he came to himself he recited these couplets you're far yet to my heart you're nearest near absent yet present in my sprite you appear by allah ne'er to other i've inclined but tyranny of time and patience bear nights pass while still i love you when they end and burns my breast with flames of fell sire f n number one fifty three i was a youth who parting for an hour bore not then what of months that make a year jealous am i of breeze breath fanning thee yea jealous mad of fair soft-sided fair then he once more fell down in a swoon and when he came to himself he found himself without the palace whither they had dragged him on his face so he rose stumbling over his skirts and hardly crediting his escape from nur al huda now this was grievous to shawahi but she dared not remonstrate with the queen by reason of the violence of her wrath and forthright hasan went forth distracted and knowing not whence to come or whither to go the world for all its wideness was straitened upon him and he found none to speak a kind word with him and comfort him nor any to whom he might resort for counsel or to apply for refuge wherefore he made sure of death for that he could not journey to his own country and knew none to travel with him neither wist he the way thither nor might he pass through the wadi of the jan and the land of beasts and the islands of birds so giving himself up for lost he bewept himself till he fainted and when he revived he bethought him of his children and his wife and of that might befall her with her sister repenting him of having come to those countries and of having hearkened to none and recited these couplets suffer mine eye babes weep lost of love and tears express rare is my solace and increases my distress the cup of severance chances to the dregs are drained who is the man to bear love loss with manliness ye spread the carpet of disgrace f n number one fifty four betwixt us twain ah when shalt be uprolled o carpet of disgrace i watched the while you slept and if you deemed that i forgot your love but i forget forgetfulness woes me indeed my heart is pining for the love of you the only leeches who can cure my case see ye not what befell me from your fair disdain debased am i before the low and high no less i hid my love of you but longing laid it bare have kept our troth in secrecy and patent place would heaven i watch shall time ere deign us twas rejoin you are my heart's desire my sprite soul happiness my vitals bear the severance wound would heaven that you with tidings from your camp would deign my soul to bless then he went on till he came without the city where he found the river and walked along its bank knowing not whither he went such was hasan's case but as regards his wife manar al sana as she was about to carry out her purpose and to set out on the second day after the departure of the old woman with her children behold there came in to her one of the chamberlains of the king her sire and kissed crown between his hands and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and seventeenth night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that when manar al sana was about to set out upon the journey behold a chamberlain of the king her sire came in to her and kissing the ground before her said o princess the supreme king thy father saluteth thee and biddeth thee to him so she rose and accompanied the chamberlain to learn what was required by her father who seated her by his side on the couch and said to her 
O my daughter, know that I have this night had a dream which maketh me fear for thee, and that long sorrow will betide thee from this thy journey. Quoth she, How so, O my father, and what didst thou see in thy dream? And quoth he, I dreamt that I entered a hidden hoard, wherein was great store of monies, of jewels, of jacinths, and other riches. But twas as if naught pleased me of all this treasure and jewellery, save seven gazelles, which were the finest things there. I chose out one of the seven jewels, for it was the smallest, finest, and the most lustrous of them, and its water pleased me. So I took it in my hand palm, and fared forth of the treasury. When I came without the door, I opened my hand, rejoicing, and turned over the jewel, and behold, there swooped down on me out of a welkin, a strange bird from a far land for it was not of the birds of our country and snatching it from my hand returned it with it whence it came f n one fifty five whereupon sorrow and concern and sore vexation overcame me and my exceeding chagrin so troubled me that i awoke mourning and lamenting for the loss of the jewel at once on awaking i summoned the interpreters and expounders of dreams and declared to them my dream f n one fifty six and they said to me thou hast seven daughters the youngest of whom thou wilt lose and she will be taken from thee perforce without thy will now thou o my girl art the youngest and dearest of my daughters and the most affectionate of them to me but look ye thou art about to journey to thy sister and i know not what may befall thee from her so go thou not but return to thy palace but when the princess heard her father's words her heart fluttered and she feared for her children and bent earthwards her head awhile then she raised it and said to her sire o king queen nur al huda hath made ready for me an entertainment and awaiteth my coming to her hour by hour these four years she hath not seen me and if i delay to visit her she will be wroth with me the utmost of my stay with her shall be a month and then i will return to thee besides who is the mortal who can travel our land and make his way to the islands of wak who can gain access to the white country and the black mountain and come to the land of camphor and the castle of crystal and how shall he traverse the islands of birds and the wadi of wild beasts and the valley of the jan and enter our islands if any stranger came hither he would be drowned in the seas of destruction so be of good cheer and eyes without a tear and end my journey for none may avail it to tread our earth and she ceased not to persuade him till he deigned give her leave to depart and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and eighteenth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the princess ceased not to persuade him till he deigned give her leave to depart and bade a thousand horse escort her to the river and abide there till she entered her sister's city and palace and returned to them when they should take her and carry her back to him moreover he charged her tarry with her sister but two days and returned to him in haste and she answered hearing and obedience then rising up she went forth and he with her and farewelled her now his words had sunken deep into her heart and she feared for her children but it availeth not to fortify herself by any device against the onset of destiny so she set out and fared on diligently three days till she came to the river and pitched her tents on its bank then she crossed the stream with some of her counsellors pages and suite and going up to the city and the palace went in to queen nur al huda with whom she found her children who ran to her weeping and crying out o oh, our father at this the tears railed from her eyes and she wept then she strained them to her bosom saying what have you seen your sire at this time would the hour had never been in which i left him if i knew him to be the house of the world i would carry you to him then she bemoaned herself and her husband and her children weeping and reciting these couplets my friends despite this distance and this cruelty i pine for you incline to you where'er you be my glance for ever turns toward your health and home, and mourns my heart and bygone days you wound with me. How many a night foregathered we without in fear, one loving, other faithful, ever fain and free. 
when her sister saw her fold her sister to her bosom saying tis i who have done thus with myself and my children and have ruined my own house she saluted her not but said to her o war whence hadst thou these children say hast thou married unbeknown to thy sire or hast thou committed fornication f n one fifty seven and thou hast played the piece it behoveth thou be exempt laterally punished and if thou have married sans our knowledge why didst thou abandon thy husband and separate thy sons from thy sire and bring them hither and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section thirteen Section 14 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, 1821 through 1890. Section 14 when it was the eight hundred and nineteenth night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that quoth nur al huda the queen to her sister manar al sana the princess and thou have married sans our knowledge why didst thou abandon thy husband and separate thy sons from their sire and bring them to our land thou hast hidden thy children from us thinkest thou we know not of this allah almighty he who is cognizant of the concealed hath made known to us thy case and revealed thy condition and bared thy nakedness then she bade her guards seize her and pinion her elbows and shackle her with shackles of iron so they did as she commanded and she beat her with a grievous beating so that her skin was torn and hanged her up by the hair after which she cast her in prison and wrote the king her father a writ acquainting him with her case and saying there hath appeared in our land a man a mortal by name hasan and our sister manar al sana avoucheth that she is lawfully married to him and bare him two sons whom she hath hidden from us and thee nor did she discover aught of herself till there came to us this man and informed us that he wedded her and she tarried with him a long while after which she took her children and departed without his knowledge bidding as she went his mother tell her son when as longing began to rack to come to her in the islands of wak so we laid hands on the man and sent the old woman shawahi to fetch her and her offspring enjoining her to bring us the children in advance of her and so she did whilst manar al sana equipped herself and set out to visit me when the boys were brought to me and ere the mother came i sent for hasan the mortal who claimeth her to wife and he on entering and at first sight knew them and they knew him whereby was i certified that the children were indeed his children and that she was his wife and i learned that the man's story was true and he was not to blame but that the reproach and the infamy rested with my sister now i feared the rending of our honour veil before the folk of our isles so when this wanton this traitoress came into me i was incensed against her and cast her into prison and bastinadoed her grievously and hanged her up by the hair behold i have acquainted thee with her case and it is thine to command and whatso thou orderest us that we will do thou knowest that in this affair is dishonour and disgrace to our name and to thine and haply the islanders will hear of it and we shall become amongst them a byword wherefore it befitteth thou return us an answer with all speed then she delivered the letter to a courier and he carried it to the king who when he read it was wroth with exceeding wrath with his daughter manar al sana and wrote to nur al huda saying i commit her case to thee and give thee command over her life so if the matter be as thou sayest kill her without consulting me when the queen had received and read her father's letter she sent for manar al sana and they set before her the prisoner drowned in her blood and pinioned with her hair shackled with heavy iron shackles and clad in hair cloth and they made her stand in the presence abject and abashed when she saw herself in this condition of passing humiliation and exceeding abjection she called to mind her former high estate and wept with sore weeping and recited these two couplets 
o lord my foes are fain to slay me in despite nor deem i anywise to find escape by flight i have recourse to thee to annual what they have done thou art the asylum lord of fearful suppliant wight then wept she grievously till she fell down in a swoon and presently coming to herself repeated these two couplets troubles familiar with my heart are grown and i with them erst shunning for the generous are sociable still not one mere kind alone of woe doth leaguer with me lie praised be god there are with me thousands of kinds of ill and also these oft times mischance shall straighten noble breast with grief whence issue is for him to shape but when the meshes straightest tightest seem they loose though deemed i near to find escape and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and twentieth night she pursued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when queen nur al huda ordered into the presence her sister princess manar al sana they set her between her hands and she pinioned as she was recited the verses aforesaid then the queen sent for a ladder of wood and made the eunuchs lay her on her back with her arms spread out and bind her with cords thereto after which she bared her head and wound her hair about the ladder rungs and indeed all pity for her was rooted out from her heart when manar al sana saw herself in this state of abjection and humiliation she cried out and wept but none succoured her then said she to the queen o my sister how is thy heart hardened against me hast thou no mercy on me nor pity on these little children but her words only hardened her sister's heart and she insulted her saying o wanton o harlot allah hath no ruth on whoso sueth for thee how should i have compassion on thee o traitorous replied manar al sana who lay stretched on the ladder i appeal from thee to the lord of heavens concerning that wherewith thou revilest me and whereof i am innocent by allah i have done no whoredom but am lawfully married to him and my lord knoweth and i speak sooth or not indeed my heart is wroth with thee by reason of thine excessive hard-heartedness against me how canst thou cast at me the charge of harlotry without knowledge but my lord will deliver me from thee and if that whoredom whereof thou accused me be true may he presently punish me for it quoth nur al huda after a few moments of reflection how durst thou be speak me thus and rose and beat her till she fainted away whereupon they sprinkled water on her face till she revived and in truth her charms were wasted for excess of beating and the straightness of her bonds and the sore insults she had suffered then she recited these two couplets if aught i've sinned in sinful way or, or done ill deed and gone astray then past repent i and i come to you and for your pardon pray when nur al huda heard these lines her wrath redoubled and she said to her wilt speak before me in verse o whore and seek to excuse thyself for the mortal sins thou hast sinned twas my desire that thou shouldst return to thy husband that i might witness thy wickedness and matchless brazen facedness for thou gloriest in thy lewdness and wantonness and mortal heinousness then she called for palm stick and when as they brought the jared she arose and bearing arms to elbows beat her sister from head to foot after which she called for a whip of plaited thongs wherewith if one smote an elephant he would start off at full speed and came down therewith on her back and her stomach and every part of her body till she fainted when the old woman shahawi saw this she fled forth from the queen's presence weeping and cursing her but nur al huda cried out to her eunuch saying fetch her to me so they ran after her and seizing her brought her back to the queen who bade throw her on the ground and making them lay hold of her rose and took the whip with which she beat her till she swooned away when she said to her waiting women drag this ill-omened beldam forth on her face and put her out and they did as she bade them so far concerning them but as regards hasan he walked on beside the river in the direction of the desert distracted troubled and despairing of life and indeed he was dazed and knew not night from day for stress of affliction he ceased not faring on thus till he came to a tree whereto he saw a scroll hanging so he took it and found written thereon these couplets when in thy mother's womb thou wast i cast thy case the bestest best and turned her heart to thee so she fostered thee on fondest breast we will suffice thee in whate'er shall cause thee trouble or unrest will aid thee in thine enterprise 
so rise and bow to our behest when he had ended reading this scroll he made sure of deliverance from trouble and of winning reunion with those he loved then he walked forward a few steps and found himself alone in a wild and perilous wold wherein there was none to company with him upon which his heart sank within him for horror and loneliness and his side muscles trembled for that fearsome place and he recited these couplets o zephyr of morn and thou pass where the dear ones dwell bear greeting of lover who ever in love longing wones and tell them i pledge to yearning and pawned to pine and the might of my passion all passion of lovers unthrones their sympathies haply shall breathe in a breeze like thee and quicken forthright this framework of rotting bones and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and twenty-first night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that when hasan read the scroll he was certified of deliverance from his trouble and made sure of winning reunion with those he loved then he walked forward a couple of steps and stopped finding himself alone in a wild and perilous wold wherein was none to company with him so he wept sore and recited the verses before mentioned then he walked on a few steps further beside the river till he came upon two little boys of the sons of the sorcerers before whom lay a rod of copper graven with talismans and beside it a skull-cap of leather made of three gores and rotten in steel with names and carracks the cap and rod were upon the ground and the boys were disputing and beating each other till the blood ran down between them whilst each cried none shall take the wand but i so hasan interposed and parted them saying what is the cause of your contention and they replied o oh, uncle be thou judge of our case for allah the most high hath surely sent thee to do justice between us quoth hasan tell me your case and i will judge between you and quoth one of them we twain are brothers german and our sire was a mighty magician who dwelt in a cave on yonder mountain he died and left us this cap and rod and my brother saith none shall have the rod but i whilst i say the like so be thou judge between us and deliver us each from other hasan asked what is the difference between the rod and the cap and what is their value the rod appears to be worth six coppers and the cap three whereto they answered thou knowest not their properties and what are their properties each of them hath a wonderful secret virtue wherefore the rod is worth the revenue of all the islands of wak and their provinces and dependencies and the cap the like by allah o my sons discover to me their secret virtues so they said o uncle they are extraordinary for our father wrought an hundred and thirty and five years at their contrivance till he brought them to perfection and engrafted them with secret attributes which might serve him extraordinary services and engraved them after the likeness of the revolving spear and by their aid he dissolved all spells and when he had made an end of their fashion death which all needs must suffer overtook him now the hidden virtue of the cap is that whoso setteth it on his head is concealed from all folk's eyes nor can any see him whilst it remaineth on his head and that of the rod is that whoso owneth it hath authority over seven tribes of the jinn who all serve the order and ordinance of the rod and whenever he who possesseth it smiteth therewith on the ground their kings come to do him homage and all the jinn are at his service now when hasan heard these words he bowed his head groundwards awhile and then said in himself by allah i shall conquer every foe by means of this rod and cap inshallah and i am worthier of them both than these two boys so i will go about forthright to get them from the twain by craft that i may use them to free myself and my wife and children from yonder tyrannical queen and then we will depart from this dismal stead whence there is no deliverance for mortal man nor flight doubtless allah caused me not to fall in with these two lads but that i might get the rod and cap from them then he raised his head and said to the two boys if ye would have me decide the case i will make trial of you and see what each of you deserveth he who overcometh his brother shall have the rod and he who faileth shall have the cap they replied o oh, uncle we depute thee to make trial of us and do thou decide between us as thou deemst fit hasan asked will ye hearken to me and have regard for my words and they answered yes then said he i will take a stone and throw it and he who outrunneth his brother thereto and picketh it up shall take the rod 
and the other who is outraced shall take the cap and they said we accept and consent to this thy proposal then hasan took a stone and threw it with his might so that it disappeared from sight the two boys ran under and after it and when they were at a distance he donned the cap and hending the rod in hand removed from his place that he might prove the truth of that which the boys had said with regard to their scant properties the younger outran the elder and coming first to the stone took it and returned with it to the place where they had left hasan but found no signs of him so he called to his brother saying where is the man who was to be umpire between us quoth the other i espy him not neither what i whether he hath flown up to heaven above or sunk into earth beneath then they sought for him but saw him not though all the while he was standing in his stead hard by them so they abused each other saying rod and cap are both gone they are neither mine nor thine and indeed our father warned us of this very thing but we forgot what so he said then they retraced their steps and hasan also entered the city wearing the cap and bearing the rod and none saw him now when he was thus certified of the truth of their speech he rejoiced with exceeding joy and making the palace went up into the lodging of shawahi who saw him not because of the cap then he walked up to a shelf over her head upon which were vessels of glass and chinaware and shook it with his hand so that what was thereon fell to the ground the old woman cried out and beat her face then she rose and restored the fallen things to their places saying in herself by allah methinks queen nur al huda hath sent a satan to torment me and he hath tricked me this trick i beg allah almighty deliver me from her and preserve me from her wrath for o lord if she deal thus abominably with her half-sister beating and hanging her dear as she is to her sire how will she do with a stranger like myself against whom she is incensed and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and twenty-second night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the ancient lady of calamities cried when queen nur al huda doeth such misdeed to her sister what will she do to a stranger like myself against whom she is incensed then said she i conjure thee o devil by the most compassionate the bountiful great the high of estate of dominion elate whom man and jinn did create and by the writing upon the seal of solomon david's son and both be the peace speak to me and answer me quoth hasan i am no devil i am hasan the afflicted the distraught then he raised the cap from his head and appeared to the old woman who knew him and taking him apart said to him what has come to thy reason that thou returnest hither go hide thee for if this wicked woman have tormented thy wife with such torments and she her sister what will she do and she light on thee then she told him all that had befallen his spouse and that wherein she was of travail and torment and tribulation and straightly described all the pains she endured adding and indeed the queen repenteth her of having let thee go and hath sent one after thee promising him an hundred weight of gold and my rank in her service and she hath sworn that if he bring thee back she will do thee and thy wife and children dead and she shed tears and discovered to hasan what the queen had done with herself whereat he wept and said o oh, my lady how shall i do to escape from this land and deliver myself and my wife and children from this tyrannical queen and how devise to return with them in safety to my own country replied the old woman woe to thee save thyself quoth he there is no help but i deliver her and my children from the queen perforce and in her despite and quoth shahawi how canst thou forcibly rescue them from her go and hide thyself o my son till allah almighty empower thee then hasan showed her the rod and the cap whereat she rejoiced with joy exceeding and cried glory be to him who quickeneth the bones though they be rotten by allah o my son thou and thy wife were but of lost folk now however thou art saved thou and thy wife and children for i know the rod and i know its maker who was my sheikh in the science of grammari he was a mighty magician and spent a hundred and thirty-five years working at this rod and cap till he brought them to perfection when death the inevitable overtook him and i have heard him say to his two boys o oh, my sons these two things are not of your lot for there will come a stranger from a far country who will take them from you by force and ye shall not know how he taketh them 
said they o our father tell us how he will avail to take them but he answered i wot not and o my son added she how availest thou to take them so he told her how he had taken them from the two boys whereat she rejoiced and said o my son since thou hast gotten the whereby to free thy wife and children give ear to what i shall say to thee for me there is no woning with this wicked woman after the foul fashion in which she durst use me so i am minded to depart from her to the caves of the magicians and there abide with them until i die but do thou o my son don the cap and hem the rod in hand and enter the place where thy wife and children are unbind her bonds and smite the earth with a rod saying be ye present o servants of these names whereupon the servants of the rod will appear and if there present himself one of the chiefs of the tribes command him whatso thou shalt wish and will so he farewelled her and went forth donning the cap and hending the rod and entered the place where his wife was he found her well-nigh lifeless bound to the ladder by her hair tearful-eyed and woeful-hearted in the sorriest of plights knowing no way to deliver herself her children were playing under the ladder while she looked at them and wept for them and herself because of the barbarities and sore treatings and bitter penalties which had befallen her and he heard her repeat these couplets there remaineth not aught save a fluttering breath and an eye whose owner is confounded and as desirous lover whose bowels are burned with fire notwithstanding which she is silent the exulting foe pitieth her at the sight of her alas for her whom the exulting foe pitieth when hasan saw her in this state of torment and misery and ignominy and infamy he wept till he fainted and when he recovered he saw his children playing and their mother a swoon for excess of pain so he took the cap from his head and the children saw him and cried out o oh, our father then he covered his head again and the princess came to herself hearing their cry but saw only her children weeping and shrieking o oh, our father when she heard them name their sire and weep her heart was broken and her vitals rent asunder and she said to them what maketh you in mind of your father at this time and she wept sore and cried out from a burst in liver and an aching bosom where are ye and where is your father then she recalled the days of her union with hasan and what had befallen her since her desertion of him and wept with sore weeping till her cheeks were seared and furrowed and her face was drowned in a briny flood her tears ran down and wetted the ground and she had not a hand loose to wipe them from her cheeks whilst the flies fed their fill on her skin and she found no helper but weeping and no solace but improvising verses then she repeated these couplets i call to mind the parting day that rent our loves in twain when as i turned away the tears in very streams did rain the cameleer urged on his beast with them what while i found nor strength nor fortitude nor did my heart with me remain yea back i turned unknowing of the road nor might shake off the trance of grief and longing love that numbed my heart and brain and worst of all betided me on my return was one who came to me in lowly guise to glory in my pain since the beloved's gone o soul forswear the sweet of life nor covet its continuance for wanting him twere vain list o my friend unto the tale of love and god forbid that i should speak and that thy heart to hearken should not deign as twere el asmad himself of passion i discourse fancies rare and marvellous linked in an endless chain and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section fourteen recorded by sylvia m b in washington state Section 15 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruhi Huck. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8 by Anonymous translated by richard francis burton eighteen twenty one to eighteen ninety section fifteen when it was the eight hundred and twenty-third night she continued when hasan went in to his wife 
he saw his children and heard her repeating the verses aforementioned then she turned right and left seeking the cause of her children's crying out o oh, our father but saw no one and marvelled that her sons should name their sire at that time and call upon him but when hasan heard her verses he wept till he swooned away and the tears railed down his cheeks like rain then he drew near the children and raised the cap from his head unseen of his wife whereupon they saw him and they knew him and cried out saying o oh, our father their mother fell a weeping again when she heard them name their sire's name and said there is no avoiding the doom which almighty allah hath decreed adding o oh strange what gareth them think of their father at this time and call upon him albeit it is not of their want then she wept and recited these couplets the land of lamping moon is bare and dear o oh, eyne of me pour forth the brimming tear they marched how shall i now be patient that i no heart no patience own i swear o ye who marched yet bide in heart of me will you o lords of me return to that we were what harm if they return and i enjoy meeting and they had wrath on tears of care upon the parting day they dimmed their eyne for sad surprise and lit the flames that flare so longed i for their stay but fortune stayed longings and turned my hope to mere despair return to us o love by allah deign enow of tears have flowed for absence bane then hasan could no longer contain himself but took the cap from his head whereupon his wife saw him and recognizes him screamed a scream which startled all in the palace and said to him how camest thou hither from the sky hast thou dropped or through the earth hast thou come up and her eyes brimmed with tears and hasan also wept quoth she o man this be no time for tears or blame faith hath its course and the sight was blinded and the pen hath run with what was ordained of allah when time was begun so allah upon thee whensoever thou comest go hide lest i espy thee and tell my sister and she do thee and me die answered he o my lady and lady of all queens i have adventured myself and come hither and either i will die or i will deliver thee from this strait and travel with thee and my children to my country despite the nose of this thy wickedest sister but as she heard his words she smiled and for a while fell to shaking her head and said far o oh my life far is it from the power of any except allah almighty to deliver me from this my strait save thyself by flight and wend thy ways and cast not thyself into destruction for she hath conquering hosts none may withstand given that thou tookest me and wentest forth how canst thou make thy country and escape from these islands and the perils of these awesome places verily thou hast seen on thy way hither the wonders the marvels the dangers and the terrors of the road such as none may escape not even one of the rebel jinns depart therefore forthright and add not a cark to my cark and care to my care neither do thou pretend to rescue me from this my plight for who shall carry me to thy country through all these vales and thirsty wolds and fatal steads rejoined hasan by thy life o light of mine eyes i will not depart this place nor fare but with thee quoth she o man thou canst not avail unto this thing and what manner of man art thou thou knowest not what thou sayest none can escape from these realms even had he command over jinns ifrits magicians chiefs of tribes and marids save thyself and leave me perchance allah will bring about good after ill answered hasan o lady of fair ones i came not safe to deliver thee with this rod and with this cap and he told her what had befallen him with the two boys but whilst he was speaking behold up came the queen and heard their speech now when he was ware of her he donned the cap and was hidden from sight and she entered and said to the princess o wanton who is he with whom thou wast talking answered manar al sanar who is with me that should talk with me except these children 
then the queen took the whip and beat her whilst hasan stood by and looked on nor did she leave beating her till she fainted whereupon she bade transport her to another place so they loosed her and carried her to another chamber whilst hasan followed unseen there they cast her down senseless and stood gazing upon her till she revived and recited these couplets i have sorrowed on account of our disunion with a sorrow that made the tears to overflow from my eyelids and i vowed that if fortune reunite us i would never again mention our separation and i would say to the envious die ye with regret by allah i have now attained my desire joy hath overwhelmed me to such a degree that by its success it hath made me weep o i how hath weeping become thy habit thou weepest in joy as well as in sorrows when she ceased her verse the slave girls went out from her and hasan took off the cap whereupon his wife said to him see o man all this befell me not save by reason of my having rebelled against thee and transgressed thy commandment and gone forth without thy leave so allah upon thee blame me not for my sins and know that women never wot a man's worth till they have lost him indeed i have offended and done evil but i crave pardon of allah almighty for whatso i did and if he unite us i will never again gainsay thee in aught no never and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and twenty-fourth night she pursued it had reached me o auspicious king that hasan's wife besought pardon of him saying blame me not for my sin and indeed i crave mercy of allah almighty quoth hasan and indeed his heart ached for her twas not thou that wast in fault nay the fault was mine and mine only for i fared forth and left thee with one who knew not thy rank neither thy worth nor thy degree but know o beloved of my heart and fruit of my vitals and light of mine eyes that allah blessed be he hath ordained to me power of releasing thee so say me wouldst thou have me carry thee to my father's home there to accomplish what allah decreeth unto thee or wilt thou forthright depart with me to mine own country now that relief is come to thee quoth she who can deliver me save the lord of the heavens go to thy motherland and put away from thee false hope for thou knowest not the perils of these parts which and thou obey me not soon shalt thou sight and she improvised these couplets on me and with me bides thy volunty why then such anger such despite to me whate'er befell us heaven forbid that love fade for long time or e'er forgotten be cease not the spy to haunt our sides till seen our love estranged and then estranged was he in truth i trusted to fair thoughts of thine though spake the wicked spy maliciously we'll keep the secret twixt us twain and behold although the brand of flame unsheathed we see the live-long day in longing love i spend hoping acceptance message from my friend then wept she and her children and the handmaidens heard them so they came in to them and found them weeping but saw not hasan with them wherefore they wept for ruth of them and damned queen nur al huda then hasan took patience till night came on and her guards had gone to their sleeping places when he arose and girded his waist then went up to her and loosing her kissed her on the head and between the eyes and pressed her to his bosom saying how long have we wearied for our motherland and for reunion there is this our meeting in sleep or on a wake then he took up the elder boy and she took up the younger and they went forth the palace and allah veiled them with the veil of his protection so that they came safe to the outer gate which closed the entrance to the queen's seraglio by finding it locked from without hasan said there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great verily we are allah's and unto him shall we return with this they despaired of escape and hasan beat hand upon hand saying o dispeller of dolors 
indeed i had bethought me of everything and considered its conclusion but this and now when it is daybreak they will take us and what device have we in this case and he recited the following two couplets thou madest fair thy thought of faith when as the days were fair and fearest not the unknown ills that they to thee might bring the nights were fair and calm to thee thou wast deceived by them for in the peace of night is born full many a troublous thing then hasan wept and his wife wept for his weeping and for the abasement she had suffered and the cruelties of time and fortune box me my fate as though she were my foe each day she showeth me new cark and care fate when i aim at good brings clear reverse and lets foul morrow wait on day that's fair and also these irks me my fate and cleans unknows that i of my high worth her shifts and shafts despise she nights parading what ill will she works i night parading patience to her eyes then his wife said to him by allah there is no relief for us but to kill ourselves and be at rest from this great and weary travail else we shall suffer grievous torment on the morrow at this moment behold they heard a voice from without the door say by allah o my lady manar al-sana i will not open to thee and thy husband hasan except ye obey me in whatso i shall say to you when they heard these words they were silent for excess of fright and would have returned whence they came when lo the voice spake again saying what aileth you both to be silent and answer me not therewith they knew the speaker for the old woman shawahi lady of calamities and said to her whatsoever thou biddest us we will do but first open the door to us this being no time for talk replied she by allah i will not open to you until ye both swear to me that you will take me with you and not leave me with yonder war whatever befalleth you shall befall me and if ye escape i shall escape and if ye perish i shall perish for yonder abominable woman tribade that she is entreateth me with indignity and still tormenteth me on your account and thou o my daughter knowest my worth now recognizing her they trusted in her and swear to her an oath such as contented her whereupon she opened the door to them and they fared forth and found her riding on a greek jar of red earthenware with a rope of palm fibres about its neck which rolled under her and ran faster than a nagy colt and she came up to them and said follow me and fear not for i know forty modes of magic by the least of which i could make the city a dashing sea swollen and clashing billows and in corsel each damsel therein to a fish and all before dawn but i was not able to work aught of my mischief for fear of the king her father and of regard to her sisters for that they are formidable by reason of their many guards and tribesmen and servants however soon i will show you wonders of my skill in witchcraft and now let us on relying upon the blessing of allah and his good aid now hasan and his wife rejoiced in this making sure of escape and shahrzad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and twenty-fifth night she resumed it had reached me o auspicious king that when hasan and his wife accompanied by the ancient dame shawahi fared forth from the palace they made sure of deliverance and they walked on till they came without the city when he fortified his heart and smiting the earth with the rod cried ho ye servants of these names appear to me and acquaint me with your conditions thereupon the earth clave asunder and out came ten ifrits with their feet in the bowels of the earth and their heads in the clouds they kissed the earth three times before hasan and said as with one voice adsumus here we are at thy service o our lord and ruler over us what dost thou bid us do for we hear and obey thy commandment and thou wilt we will dry the up seas and remove mountains from their places so hasan rejoiced in their words and at their speedy answer to his evocation then taking courage and bracing up his resolution he said to them 
who are ye and what be your names and your races and to what tribes and clans and companies appertain ye they kissed the earth once more and answered as with one voice saying we are seven kings each ruling over seven tribes of the jinn and all conditions and satans and marids flyers and divers dwellers in mountains and wastes and wolds and haunters of the seas so bid us do whatso thou wilt for we are thy servants and thy slaves and whoso possesseth this rod hath dominion over all our necks and we owe him obedience now when hassan heard this he rejoiced with joy exceeding as did his wife and the old woman and presently he said to the kings of the jinn i desire of you that ye show me your tribes and hosts and guards o our lord answered they if we show thee our tribes we fear for thee and these who are with thee for their name is legion and they are various in form and fashion figure and favour some of us are heads sans bodies and others bodies sans heads and others again are in the likeness of wild beasts and ravening lions however if this be thy will there is no help but we first show thee those of us who are like unto wild beasts but o our lord what wouldst thou of us at this present quoth hasan i would have you carry me forthwith to the city of baghdad me and my wife and this honest woman but hearing his words they hung down their heads and were silent whereupon hasan asked them why do ye not reply and they answered as with one voice o our lord and ruler over us we are of the covenant of solomon son of david on the twain be peace and he aware us in that we would bear none of the sons of adam on our backs since which time we have borne no mortal on back or shoulder but we will straightway harness thee horses of the jinn that shall carry thee and thy company to thy country hasan inquired how far are we from baghdad and they seven years journey for a diligent horseman hasan marvelled at this and said to them then how came i hither in less than a year and they said allah softened to thee the hearts of his pious servants else hadst thou never come to this country nor hast thou set eyes on these regions no never for the shaykh abd al kudus who mounted thee on the elephant and the magical horse traversed with thee in ten days three years journey for a well-girt rider and the ifrit dahnash to whom the shaykh committed thee carried thee a three years march in a day and a night all which was of the blessing of allah almighty for that the shaykh abu al rukwaish is of the seed of asif bin barkhia and knoweth the most great name of allah moreover from baghdad to the palace of the damsels is a year's journey and this maketh up the seven years when hasan heard this he marvelled with exceeding marvel and cried glory be to god facilitator of the heart fortifier of the weak heart approximator of the far and humbler of every froward tyrant who hath eased us of every accident and carried me to these countries and have subjected to me these creatures and reunited me with my wife and children i know not whether i am asleep or awake or if i be sober or drunken then he turned to the jinn and asked when ye have mounted me upon your steeds in how many days will they bring us to baghdad and they answered they will carry you thither under the year but not till after ye have endured terrible perils and hardships and horrors and ye have traversed thirsty wadies and frightful wastes and horrible steeds without number and we cannot promise thee safety o our lord from the people of these islands and shahrzad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section 15section sixteen of the book of a thousand nights and a night this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by ruhi huck the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight by anonymous translated by richard francis burton eighteen twenty one to eighteen ninety section sixteen when it was the eight hundred and twenty-sixth night 
she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the jan said to hasan we cannot promise thee safety o our lord from this islandry nor from the mischief of the supreme king and his enchanters and warlocks it may be they will overcome us and take you from us and we fall into affliction with them and all to whom the tidings shall come after this will say to us ye are wrongdoers how could ye go against the supreme king and carry a mortal out of his dominions and eke the king's daughter with him adding wert thou alone with us the thing were light and he who conveyed thee hither is capable to carry thee back to thy country and reunite thee with thine own people forthright and in readiest plight so take heart and put thy trust in allah and fear not for we are at thy service to convey thee to thy country hasan thanked them therefore and said allah requite you with good but now make haste with the horses they replied we hear and we obey and struck the ground with their feet whereupon it opened and they disappeared within it and were absent a while after which they suddenly reappeared with three horses saddled and bridled and on each saddle bow a pair of saddle bags and a leathern bottle of water in one pocket and the other full of provant so hasan mounted one steed and took a child before him whilst his wife mounted a second and took the other child before her then the old woman alighted from the jar and bestrode the third horse and they rode on without ceasing all night at break of day they turned aside from the road and made for the mountain whilst their tongues ceased not to name allah then they fared on under the highland all that day till hasan caught sight of a black object afar as if it were a tall column of smoke a twisting skywards so he recited somewhat of the quran and holy writ and sought refuge with allah from satan the stoned the black thing grew plainer as they drew near and when hard by it they saw that it was an ifrit with a head like a huge dome and tusks like grapnels and jaws like a lane and nostrils like ewers and ears like leathern targes and mouth like a cave and teeth like pillars of stone and hands like winnowing forks and legs like masts his head was in the cloud and his feet in the bowels of the earth had ploughed when as hasan gazed upon him he bowed himself and kissed the ground before him saying o hasan have no fear of me for i am the chief of the dwellers of this land which is the first of the isles of wok and i am a muslim and an adorer of the one god i have heard of you and your coming and when i knew of your case i desired to depart from the land of the magicians to another land void of inhabitants and far from men and jinn that i might dwell there alone and worship allah till my fated end came upon me so i wish to accompany you and be your guide chilly fare forth of the walk islands and i will not appear save at night and do ye hearten your hearts on my account for i am a muslim even as ye are muslims when hasan heard the ifrit's words he rejoiced with exceeding joy and made sure of deliverance and he said to him allah requite thee weel go with us relying upon the blessing of allah so the ifrit forewent them and they followed talking and making merry for their hearts were pleased and their breasts were eased and hasan fell to telling his wife all that had befallen him and all the hardships he had undergone while she excused herself to him and told him in turn all that she had seen and suffered they ceased not faring all that night and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and twenty-seventh night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that they ceased not faring all that night and the horses bore them like the blinding leaven and when the day rose all put their hands to the saddle-bags and took forth provant which they ate and water which they drank then they sped diligently on their way preceded by the ifrit who turned aside with them from the beaten track into another road till then untrodden along the sea-shore and they ceased not faring on without stopping across wadis and wolds a whole month 
till on the thirty-first day there arose before them a dust cloud that walled the world and darkened the day and when hasan saw this he was confused and turned pale and more so when a frightful crying and clamour struck their ears thereupon the old woman said to him o my son this is the army of the wak islands that hath overtaken us and presently they will lay their violent hands on us hasan asked what shall i do o my mother and she answered strike the earth with a rod he did so whereupon the seven kings presented themselves and saluted him with the salam kissing ground before him and saying fear not neither grieve hasan rejoiced at these words and answered them saying well said o princess of the jinn and the ifrits this is your time quoth they get ye up to the mountain top thou and thy wife and children and she who is with thee and leave us to deal with them for we know that you all are in the right and they in the wrong and allah will aid us against them so hasan and his wife and children and the old woman dismounted and dismissing the horses ascended the flank of the mountain and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and twenty eight night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that hasan and his wife his children and the ancient dame ascended the mountain flank after they had dismissed the coursers presently up came queen nurul huda with the troops right and left and the captains went round among the host and raged them rank by rank in battle array then the host charged down upon each other and clashed together the twain with a mighty strain the brave pressed on amain and the coward to fly was fain and the jinn clasped flames of fire from their mouths while the smoke of them rose up to the confines of the sky and the two armies appeared and disappeared the champions fought and heads flew from trunks and the blood ran in rills nor did brand leave to play and blood to flow and battle fire to flow till the murk o night came when the two hosts drew apart and slighting from their steeds rested upon the field by the fires they had kindled therewith the seven kings went up to hasan and kissed the earth before him he pressed forwards to meet them and thanked them and prayed allah to give them the victory and asked them how they had fared with the queen's troops quoth they they will not withstand us more than the three days for we had the better of them to-day taking some two thousand of them prisoners and slaying of them much folk whose compt may not be told so be of good cheer and broad of breast then they farewelled him and went down to look after the safety of their troops and they ceased not to keep up the fires till the morning rose with its sheen and shone when the fighting men mounted their horses of noble strain and smote one another with thin-edged skein and with brawn of bill they thrust amain nor did they cease that day battle to derain moreover they passed the night on horseback clashing together like dashing seas raged among them the fires of war and they stinted not from battle and jar till the armies of wak were defeated and their power broken and their courage quelled their feet slipped and whither they fled so ever defeat was before them wherefore they turned tail and of flight began to avail but the most part of them were slain and their queen and her chief officers and the grandees of her realm were captain tain when the morning morrowed the seven kings presented themselves before hasan and set for him a throne of alabaster inlaid with pearls and jewels and he sat down thereon they also set thereby a throne of ivory plated with glittered gold for the princess manar al sana and another for the ancient dame shawahi zat al dawahi then they brought before them the prisoners and among the rest queen nur al huda with elbows pinioned and feet fettered whom when shawahi saw she said to her thy recompense o harlot o tyrant shall be that two bitches be starved and two mares stinted of water till they be athirst then shalt thou be bound to the mares tails and those driven to the river with the bitches following thee that they may rend thy skin and after thy flesh shall be cut off and given them to eat how couldst thou do with thy sister such deed o strumpet seeing that she was lawfully married after the ordinance of allah and his apostle for there is no monkery in al-islam and marriage is one of the institutions of the apostles on whom be the peace nor were women created but for men 
then hassan commanded to put all the captives to his sword and the old woman cried out saying slay them all and spare none but when princess manar al sana saw her sister in this plight a bondswoman and in fetters she wept over her and said o my sister who is this hath conquered us and made us captives in our own country quoth nur al huda verily this is a mighty matter indeed this man hasan hath gotten the mastery over us and allah hath given him dominion over us and over all our realm and he hath overcome us us and the kings of the jinn and quoth her sister indeed allah aided him not against you nor did he overcome you nor capture you save by means of his cap and rod so nur al huda was certified and assured that he had conquered her by means thereof and humbled herself to her sister till she was moved to wrath for her and said to her husband what wilt thou do with my sister behold she is in thy hands and she hath done thee no misdeed that thou shouldst punish her replied hasan her torturing of thee was misdeed enow but she answered saying she hath excuse for all she did with me as for thee thou hast set my father's heart on fire for the loss of me and what will be his case if he lose my sisters also and he said to her tis thine to decide do what so thou wilt so she bade loose her sister and the rest of the captives and they did her bidding then she went up to queen nur al huda and embraced her and they wept together for a long while after which quoth the queen o my sister bear me not malice for that i did with thee and quoth manar al sana o my sister this was for ordained to me by fate then they sat on the couch talking and manar al sana made peace between the old woman and her sister after the goodliest fashion and their hearts were set at ease thereupon hasan dismissed the servants of the rod thanking them for the succour which they had afforded him against his foes and manar al sana related to his sister all that had befallen her with hasan her husband and everything he had suffered for her sake saying o my sister since he had done these deeds and is possessed of this might and allah almighty hath gifted him with such exceeding prowess that he hath entered our country and beaten thine army and taken thee prisoner and defied our father the supreme king who had dominion over all the princes of the jinn it behoveth us to fail not of what is due to him replied nur al huda by allah o my sister thou sayest sooth in what so thou tellest me of the marvels which this man had seen and suffered and none may fail of respect to him but was all this on thine account o my sister and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and twenty-ninth night she pursued it had reached me o auspicious king that when princess minar al sana repeated to her sister these praises of hasan the other replied by allah this man can claim all respect more by token of his generosity but was all this on thine account yes answered manar al sana and they passed the night in converse till the morning morrowed and the sun rose and they were minded to depart so they farewelled one another and manar al sana gave god speed to the ancient dame after the reconciling her with queen nur al huda thereupon hasan smote the earth with the rod and its servants the jinn appeared and saluted him saying praise be allah who hath set thy soul at rest command us what thou wilt and we will do it for thee in less than the twinking of an eye he thanked them for their saying and said to them allah requite you with good saddle me two steeds of the best so they brought him and forthwith two saddled coursers one of which he mounted taking his elder son before him and his wife rode the other taking the younger son in front of her then the queen and the old woman also backed horse and departed hasan and his wife following the right and nur al huda and shahabi the left hand rode the spouses fared on with their children without stopping for a whole month till they drew in sight of a city which they found compassed about with trees and streams and making the trees dismounted beneath them thinking to rest there as they sat talking behold they saw many horsemen coming towards them whereupon hasan rose and going to meet them saw that it was king hasan lord of the land of camphor and 
castle of crystal with his attendants so hasan went up to the king and kissed his hands and saluted him and when hasan saw him he dismounted and seating himself with hasan upon carpets under the trees returned his salam and gave him joy of his safety and rejoiced in him with exceeding joy saying to him o hasan tell me all that had befallen thee first and last so he told him all of that whereupon the king marvelled and said to him o my son none ever reached the islands of wok and returned thence but thou and indeed thy case is wondrous but alhamdulillah praised be god for safety then he mounted and bade hasan ride with his wife and children into the city where he lodged them in the guest house of his palace and they abode with him three days eating and drinking in mirth and merriment after which hasan sought hasan's leave to depart to his own country and the king granted it accordingly they took horse and the king rode with them ten days after which he farewelled them and turned back whilst hasan and his wife and children fared on a whole month at the end of which time they came to a great cavern whose floor was of brass quoth hasan to his wife kennest thou yonder cave quoth she no said he therein dwelleth a sheikh abu al ruvesh hight to whom i am greatly beholden for that he was the means of my becoming acquainted with king hasan then he went on to tell her all that had passed between him and abu al ruvaish and as he was thus engaged behold the sheikh himself issued from the cavern mouth when hasan saw him he dismounted from his steed and kissed his hands and the old man saluted him and gave him joy of his safety and rejoiced in him then he carried him into the anter and sat down with him whilst hasan related to him what had befallen him in the islands of wak whereat the elder marvelled with exceeding marvel and said o hasan how didst thou deliver thy wife and children so he told them the tale of the cap and the rod hearing which he wondered and said o hasan o my son but for this rod and cap thou hadst never delivered thy wife and children and he replied even so o my lord as they were talking there came a knocking at the door and abu al rawaish went out and found abd al kadus mounted on his elephant so he saluted him and brought him into the cavern where he embraced hasan and congratulated him on his safety rejoicing greatly in his return said abu al rawaish to hasan tell the sheikh abd al kadus all that hath befallen thee o hasan he repeated to him everything that had passed first and last till he came to the tale of the rod and cap and shahrzad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section 16section 17 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 8 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by sylvia m b in washington state the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 8 by anonymous translated by richard francis burton 1821 through 1890 section 17 when it was the eight hundred and thirtieth night she resumed it hath reached me o auspicious king that hasan began relating to sheikh abd al kadus and sheikh abu al ruwaysh who sat chatting in the cave all that had passed first and last till he came to the tale of the rod and cap whereupon quoth abd al kadus o my son thou hast delivered thy wife and thy children and hast no further need of the two now we were the means of thy winning to the islands of wak and i have done thee kindness for the sake of my nieces the daughters of my brother wherefore i beg thee of thy bounty and favour to give me the rod and to shake abu al ruwaysh the cap when hasan heard this he hung down his head being ashamed to reply i will not give them to you and said in his mind indeed these two sheikhs have done me great kindness and were the means of my winning to the islands of wak and but for them i had never made the place nor delivered my children nor had i gotten me this rod and cap so he raised his head and answered yes i will give them to you but o oh my lords i fear lest the supreme king my wife's father come upon me with his commando and combat with me in my own country 
and i be unable to repel them for want of the rod and cap replied abd al kadus fear not o my son we will continually succour thee and keep watch and ward for thee in this place and whosoever shall come against thee from thy wife's father or any other him we will fend off from thee wherefore be thou of good cheer and keep thine eyes cool of tear and hearten thy heart and broaden thy breast and feel not whatsoever of fear for no harm shall come to thee when hasan heard this he was abashed and gave the cap to abu al ruwaysh saying to abd al kadus accompany me to my own country and i will give thee the rod at this the two elders rejoiced with exceeding joy and made him ready riches and treasures which beggar all description he abode with them three days at the end of which he set out again and the sheikh abd al kadus made ready to depart with him so he and his wife mounted their beasts and abd al kadus whistled when behold a mighty big elephant trotted up with forehand and feet on amble from the heart of the desert and he took it and mounted it then they farewelled abu al ruwaysh who disappeared within his cavern and they fared on across country traversing the land in its length and breadth wherever abd al kadus guided them by a short cut and an easy way till they drew near the land of the princesses whereupon hasan rejoiced at finding himself once more near his mother and praised allah for his safe return and reunion with his wife and children after so many hardships and perils and thanked him for his favours and bounties reciting these couplets haply shall allah deign us twain unite and locked in strict embrace we'll hail the light and wonders that befell me all recount and all i suffered from the severance blight and fain i'll cure my eyes by viewing you for ever yearned my heart to see your sight i hid a tale for you my heart within which when we meet o morn i'll fain recite i'll blame you for the deeds by you were done but while blame endeth love shall stay in sight hardly had he made an end of these verses when he looked and behold there rose to view the green dome and the jetting fount and the emerald palace and the mountain of clouds showed to them from afar whereupon quoth abd al kadus rejoice o hasan in good tidings to-night shalt thou be the guest of my nieces at this he joyed with exceeding joy and also did his wife and they alighted at the domed pavilion where they took their rest and ate and drank after which they mounted horse again and rode on till they came upon the palace as they drew near the princesses who were daughters of the king brother to sheikh abd al kadus came forth to meet them and saluted them and their uncle who said to them o daughters of my brother behold i have accomplished the need of this your brother hasan and i have helped him to regain his wife and children so they embraced him and gave him joy of his return in safety and health and of his reunion with his wife and children and it was a day of festival with them then came forward hasan's sister the youngest princess and embraced him weeping with sore weeping whilst he also wept for his long desolation after which she complained to him of that which she had suffered for the pangs of separation and weariness of spirit in his absence and recited these two couplets after thy fairy never chanced i spy a shape but did thy form therein descry nor closed mine eyes in sleep but thee i saw e'en as though dwelling twixt the lid and i when she had made an end of her verses she rejoiced with joy exceeding and hasan said to her o my sister i thank none in this matter save thyself over all thy sisters and may allah almighty vouchsafe thee aidance and countenance then he related to her all that had passed in his journey from first to last and all that he had undergone telling her what had betided him with his wife's sister and how he had delivered his wife and wees and he also described to her all that he had seen of marvels and grievous perils even to how queen nur al huda would have slain him and his spouse and children and none save them from her but the lord the most high moreover he related to her the adventure of the cap and the rod and how abd al kadus and abu al ruwaysh had asked for them and he had not agreed to give them to the twain save for her sake wherefore she thanked him and blessed him wishing him long life and he cried by allah i shall never forget all the kindness thou hast done me from incept to conclusion and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and thirty-first night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king 
that when hasan foregathered with the princesses he related to his sister all that he had endured and said to her never will i forget what thou hast done for me from incept to conclusion then she turned to his wife manar al sana and embraced her and pressed her children to her breast saying to her o daughter of the supreme king there was no pity in thy bosom that thou partest him and his children and settest his heart on fire for them say me didst thou desire by this deed that he should die the princess laughed and answered thus was it ordained of allah extolled and exalted be he and whoso beguileth folk him shall allah beguile then they set on somewhat of meat and drink and they all ate and drank and made merry they abode thus ten days in feast and festival mirth and merry-making at the end of which time hasan prepared to continue his journey so his sister rose and made him ready riches and rarities such as defy description then she strained him to her bosom because of leave-taking and threw her arms round his neck whilst he recited on her account these couplets the solace of lovers is not but far and parting is not save grief singular and ill-will and absence are not but woe and the victims of love not but martyrs are and how tedious is night to the loving wight from his true love parted neath evening star his tears course over his cheeks and so he cries o tears be there more to flow with this hasan gave the rod to sheikh abd al kadus who joyed therein with exceeding joy and thanking him and securing it mounted and returned to his own place then hasan took horse with his wife and children and departed from the palace of the princesses who went forth with him to farewell him then they turned back and hasan fared on over wild and wold two months and ten days till he came to the city of baghdad the house of peace and repairing to his home by the private postern which gave upon the open country knocked at the door now his mother for long absence had forsworn sleep and given herself to mourning and weeping and wailing till she fell sick and ate no meat neither took delight in slumber but shed tears night and day she ceased not to call upon her son's name albeit she despaired of his returning to her and as he stood at the door he heard her weeping and reciting these couplets by allah heal o my lords the unwhole of wasted frame and heart worn with dole and you grant her a meeting tis but your grace shall whelm in the boons of the friend her soul i despair not of union the lord can grant and to weal of meeting our woes control when she had entered her verses she heard her son's voice at the door calling out o oh, mother mother ah fortune hath been kind and hath vouchsafed our reunion hearing his cry she knew his voice and went to the door between belief and misbelief but when she opened it she saw him standing there and with him his wife and children so she shrieked aloud for excess of joy and fell to the earth in a fainting fit hasan ceased not soothing her till she recovered and embraced him then she wept with joy and presently she called his slaves and servants and bade them carry all his baggage into the house so they brought in every one of the loads and his wife and children entered also whereupon hasan's mother went up to the princess and kissed her head and bust her feet saying o daughter of the supreme king if i have failed of thy due behold i crave pardon of almighty allah then she turned to hasan and said to him o my son what was the cause of this long strangerhood he related to her all his adventures from beginning to end and when she heard tell of all that had befallen him she cried a great cry and fell down a fainting at the very mention of his mishaps he solaced her till she came to herself and said by allah o my son thou hast done unwisely in parting with the rod and the cap for hadst thou kept them with the care due to them thou wert master of the whole earth and its breadth and length but praised be allah for thy safety o my son and that of thy wife and children they passed the night in all pleasance and happiness and on the morrow hasan changed his clothes and donning a suit of the richest apparel went down into the bazaar and bought black slaves and slave girls and the richest stuffs and ornaments and furniture such as carpets and costly vessels and all manner of other precious things whose like is not found with kings moreover he purchased houses and gardens and estates and so forth and abode with his wife and his children and his mother eating and drinking and pleasuring nor did they cease from all joy of life in its solace till there came to them the destroyer of delights and the severer of societies 
and glory be to him who hath dominion over the seen and the unseen who is the living the eternal who dieth not at all and men also recount the adventures of khalifa the fisherman of baghdad there was once in tides of yore and in ages and times long gone before in the city of baghdad a fisherman khalifa hight a pauper wight who had never once been married in all his days it chanced one morning that he took his net and went with it to the river as was his wont with the view of fishing before the others came when he reached the bank he girt himself and tucked up his skirts then stepping into the water he spread his net and cast it a first cast and a second but it brought up naught he ceased not to throw it till he had made ten casts and still naught came up therein wherefore his breast was straitened and his mind perplexed concerning his case and he said i crave pardon of god the great there is no god but he the living the eternal and unto him i repent there is no majesty and there is no might save allah the glorious the great whatso he willeth is and whatso he nilleth is not upon allah to whom belong honour and glory dependeth daily bread whenas he giveth to his servant none denieth him and whenas he denieth a servant none giveth to him and of the excess of his distress he recited these two couplets and fate afflict thee with grief manifest prepare thy patience and make broad thy breast for of high shall send to wait upon unrest sweet rest then he sat awhile pondering his case and with his head bowed down recited also these couplets patience with sweet and with bitter fate and weet that his will he shall consummate night oft upon woe as on abscess acts and brings it up to the bursting state and chance and change shall pass o'er the youth and fleet from his thoughts and no more shall bait then he said in his mind i will make this one more cast trusting in allah so haply he may not disappoint my hope and he rose and casting into the river the net as far as his arm availed gathered the cords in his hands and waited a full hour after which he pulled at it and finding it heavy and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section seventeen recorded by sylvia Emby in washington state section eighteen of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight by anonymous translated by richard francis burton eighteen twenty one to eighteen ninety section eighteen when it was the eight hundred and thirty-second night she continued it hath reached me o auspicious king that when khalifa the fisherman had cast his net sundry times into the stream yet it brought up naught he pondered his case and improvised the verses afore quoted then he said in his mind i will make one more cast trusting in allah who haply will not disappoint my hope so he rose and threw the net and waited a full hour after which time he pulled at it and finding it heavy handled it gently and drew it in little by little till he got it ashore when lo and behold he saw in it a one-eyed lame-legged ape seeing this quoth khalifah there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah verily we are allah's and to him we are returning what meaneth this heart-breaking miserable ill-luck and hapless fortune what is come to me this blessed day but all this is of the destinies of almighty allah then he took the ape and tied him with a cord to the tree which grew on the river bank and grasping a whip he had with him raised his arm in the air thinking to bring down the scourge upon the quarry when Allah made the ape speak with a fluent tongue, saying, O Khalifa, hold thy hand, and beat me not, but leave me bounden to this tree, and go down to the river, and cast thy net, confiding in Allah, for he will give thee thy daily bread. Hearing this, Khalifa went down to the river, and casting his net, let the cords run out. 
Then he pulled it in and found it heavier than before, so he ceased not to tug at it till he brought it to land, when, behold, there was another ape in it, with front teeth wide apart, coal darkened eyes, and hands stained with henna dyes, and he was laughing, and he wore a tattered waistcloth about his middle. Quoth Khalifa, Praised be Allah, who hath changed the fish of the river into apes. Then, going up to the first ape, who was still tied to the tree, he said to him, See, O unlucky, how fulsome was the counsel thou gavest me. None but thou made me light on this second ape, and for that thou gavest me good morrow with thy one eye and thy lameness, I am become distressed and weary, without durham or dinar. So saying, he hent in his hand a stick, and flourishing it thrice in the air, was about to come down with it upon the lame ape, when the creature cried out for mercy, and said to him, I conjure thee by Allah, spare me for the sake of this, my fellow, and seek of him thy need, for he will guide thee to thy desire. So he held his hand from him, and throwing down the stick, went up and stood by the second ape, who said to him, O Khalifa, this my speech will profit thee not, except thou hearken to what I say to thee. But, an thou do my bidding, and cross me not, I will be the cause of thine enrichment. Asked Khalifa, And what hast thou to say to me, that I may obey there therein? The ape answered, Leave me bound on the bank, and hie thee down the river, then cast thy net a third time, and after I will tell thee what to do. So he took his net, and going down to the river, cast it once more, and waited a while. Then he drew it in, and finding it heavy, labored at it, and ceased not his travail, until he got it ashore, where he found in it yet another ape, but this one was red, with a blue waistcloth about his middle, his hands and feet were stained with henna, and his eyes blackened with coal. When Khalifa saw this, he exclaimed, Glory to God the Great! Extolled be the perfection of the Lord of Dominion! Verily, this is a blessed day from first to last. Its ascent was fortunate in the countenance of the first ape, and the scroll is known by a superscription. Verily, today is the day of apes. There is not a single fish left in the river, and we are come out today but to catch monkeys. Then he turned to the third ape, and said, And what thing art thou also, O unlucky? Quoth the ape, Dost thou not know me, O Khalifa? And quoth he, Not I. The ape cried, I am the ape of Abu al-Sadat, the Jew, the Shroff, asked Khalifa. And what dost thou for him? And the ape answered, I give him good morrow at the first of the day, and he gaineth five ducats, and again at the end of the day I give him good even, and he gaineth another five ducats. Whereupon Khalifa turned to the first ape, and said to him, See, O unlucky, what fine apes other folks have! As for thee, thou givest me good morrow with thy one eye, and thy lameness, and thy ill-omened fizz and I become poor and bankrupt and hungry. So saying, he took the cattle stick, and flourishing it thrice in the air, was about to come down on it, on the first ape, when Abu al-Sadat's ape said to him, Let him be, O Khalifa, hold thy hand, and come hither to me, that I may tell thee what to do. So Khalifa threw down the stick, and walking up to him cried, and what hast thou to say to me, O monarch of all monkeys? replied the ape. Leave me and the other two apes here, and take thy net, and cast it into the river, and whatever cometh up, bring it to me, and I will tell thee what shall gladden thee. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the eight hundred and thirty-third night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the ape of Abu al-Sadat said to Khalifa, Take thy net, and cast it into the river, and whatever cometh up, bring it to me, and I will tell thee what 
shall gladden thee. He replied, I hear and obey, and took the net and gathered it on his shoulder, reciting these couplets. When straightened is my breast, I will of my Creator pray, who may and can the heaviest weight lighten in easiest way. For ere man's glance can turn or close his eye by God his grace, waxeth the broken whole and yieldeth jail its prison prey. Therefore, with Allah one and all of thy concerns commit, whose grace and favor men of wit shall never more gainsay. And also these twain. Thou art the cause that castest men in ban and bane, sorrow e'en so, and sorrow's cause thou canst assain. Make me not covet aught that lies beyond my reach, how many a greedy wight his wit hath failed to gain. Now, when Khalifa had made an end of his verse, he went down to the river, and casting his net, waited a while, after which he drew it up, and found therein a fine young fish, with a big head, a tail like a ladle, and eyes like two gold pieces. When Khalifa saw this fish, he rejoiced, for he had never in his life caught its like, so he took it, marvelling, and carried it to the ape of Abu al-Sadat the Jew, as twere he had gotten possession of the universal world. Quoth the ape, O Khalifa, what wilt thou do with this and with thine ape? And quoth the fisherman, I will tell thee, O monarch of monkeys, all I am about to do. Know then that first I will cast about to make away with yonder accursed, my ape, and take thee in his stead, and give thee every day to eat of whatso thou wilt rejoined the ape. Since thou hast made choice of me, I will tell thee how thou shalt do wherein, if it please Allah Almighty, shall be the mending of thy fortune. Lend thy mind, then, to what I say to thee, and tis this. Take another cord, and tie me also to a tree, where leave me, and go to the midst of the dyke, and cast thy net into the tigress. Then after waiting a while, draw it up, and thou shalt find therein a fish, then, which thou never sawst a finer in thy whole life. Bring it to me, and I will tell thee how thou shalt do after this. So Khalifa rose forthright, and casting his net into the tigress, drew up a great catfish, the bigness of a lamb. Never had he set eyes on its like, for it was larger than the first fish. He carried it to the ape, who said to him, Gather thee some green grass, and set half of it in a basket. Lay the fish therein, and cover it with the other moiety. Then, leaving us here tied, shoulder the basket, and betake thee to Baghdad. If any bespeak thee, or question thee by the way, answer him not, but fare on till thou comest to the market street of the money-changers, at the upper end whereof thou wilt find the shop of master. Abu al-Sadat the Jew, shake off the shroffs, and wilt see him sitting on a mattress with a cushion behind him and two coffers, one for gold and one for silver, before him, while around him stand his mamelukes and negro slaves and servant lads. Go up to him, and set the basket before him, saying, O Abu al-Sadat, Verily I went out to-day to fish, and cast my net in thy name, and Allah Almighty sent me this fish. He will ask, Hast thou shown it to any but me? And do thou answer, No, by Allah. Then he will take it of thee, and give thee a dinar. Give it him back, and he will give thee two dinars. But do thou return them also, and do so with everything he may offer thee, and take naught from him though he give thee a fish's weight in gold. Then will he say to thee, Tell me what thou wouldst have. And do thou reply, By Allah, I will not sell the fish save for two words. He will ask, What are they? And do thou answer, Stand up and say, Bear witness, O ye who are present in this market, that I give Khalifa the fisherman my ape in exchange for his ape, and that I barter for his lot my lot, and luck for his luck. This is the price of the fish, and I have no need for gold. 
If he do this, I will every day give thee good morrow and good even, and every day thou shalt gain ten dinars of good gold, whilst this one-legged, lame-eyed ape shall daily give the Jew good morrow, and Allah shall afflict him every day with an avenue, which he must needs pay, nor will he cease to be thus afflicted, till he is reduced to beggary and hath not. Hearken then to my words, so shalt thou prosper and be guided aright. Quoth Khalifa, I accept thy counsel, O monarch of the monkeys. But, as for this unlucky, may Allah never bless him. I know not what to do with him. Quoth the ape, Let him go into the water, and let me go also. I hear and obey, answered Khalifa, and unbound the three apes, and they went down into the river. Then he took up the catfish, which he washed, and then laid it in the basket upon some green grass, and covered it with other, and lastly shouldering his load, set out chanting the following, Mawal. Thy case commit to a heavenly lord, and thou shalt safely see. Act kindly through thy worldly life, and live repentance free. Mate not with folk suspected, lest eke thou shouldst suspected be, and from reviling keep thy tongue, lest men revile at thee. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the eight hundred and thirty-fourth night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Caliph the fisherman, after ending his song, set out with a basket upon his shoulder, and ceased not faring until he entered the city of Baghdad. And as he threaded the streets, the folk knew him, and cried out to him, saying, What hast thou there, O Khalifa? But he paid no heed to them, and passed on until he came to the market, street of the money-changers, and fared between the shops as the ape had charged him, till he found the Jew seated at the upper end, with his servants in attendance upon him, as if he were a king of the kings of Khorasan. He knew him at first sight, so he went up to him and stood before him, whereupon Abu al-Sadat raised his eyes and recognized him, said, Welcome, O Khalifa, what wantest thou, and what is thy need? If any have missaid thee, or spited thee, tell me, and I will go with thee to the chief of police, who shall do thee justice on him replied Khalifa, Nay, as thy head liveth, O chief of the Jews, none hath missaid me. But I went forth this morning to the river, and, casting my net into the Tigris on thy luck, brought up this fish. Therewith he opened the basket, and threw the fish before the Jew, who admired it, and said, By the Pentateuch and the Ten Commandments, I dreamt last night that the virgin came to me and said, No, O Abu al-Sadat, that I have sent thee a pretty present, and doubtless tis this fish. Then he turned to the Caliphah and said to him, By thy faith, hath any seen it but I? Caliphah replied, No, by Allah and by Abu Bakr the veridical, none hath seen it save thou, O chief of the Jews. Whereupon the Jew turned to one of his lads and said to him, Come, carry this fish to my house, and bid Sada dress it, and fry it, and broil it, against I make an end of my business, and hie me home. And Kalevah said, Go, O my lad, let thy master's wife fry some of it, and broil the rest. Answered the boy, I hear and I obey, O my lord. And taking the fish, went away with it to the house. Then the Jew put out his hand, and gave Kalevah the fisherman a dinar, saying, Take this for thyself, O Khalifa, and spend it on thy family. When Khalifa saw the dinar in his palm, he took it, saying, Laud to the Lord of Dominion, as if he had never seen aught of gold in his life, and went somewhat away. But before he had gone too far, he was minded of the ape's charge, and turning back threw down the ducat, saying, Take thy gold, and give folk back their fish. Dost thou make a laughing stock of folk? The Jew, hearing this, thought he was jesting, and offered him two dinars upon the other. But Khalifa said, Give me the fish, and no nonsense. How knewest thou I would sell it at this price? 
Whereupon the Jew gave him two more dinars and said, Take these five ducats for thy fish and leave greed. So Khalifa hent the five dinars in his hand and went away rejoicing, and gazing and marvelling at the gold and saying, Glory be to God, there is not with the Caliph of Baghdad what is with me today. Then he ceased not faring on until he came to the end of the market street, when he remembered the words of the ape in his charge, and returning to the Jew, threw him back the gold. Quoth he, What aileth thee, O Khalifa? Dost thou want silver in exchange for gold? Khalifa replied, I want nor dirhams nor dinars, I only want thee to give me back folk's fish. With this the Jew waxed wroth and shouted at him, saying, O fisherman, thou bringest me a fish not worth a sequin, and I give thee five for it, yet art thou not content? Art thou gin mad? Tell me for how much you will sell it. Answered Khalifa, I will not sell it for silver nor for gold, only for two sayings thou shalt say me. When the Jew heard speak of the two sayings, his eyes sank into his head, and he breathed hard and ground his teeth for rage, and said to him, O nail-pairing of the Moslems, wilt thou have me throw off my faith for the sake of thy fish, and wilt thou debauch me from my religion and stultify my belief and my conviction which I inherited of old from my forebears? Then he cried out to the servants who were waiting, and said, Out on you! Bash me this unlucky rogue's neck, and bastinado him soundly. So they came down upon him with blows, and ceased not bearing him, until he fell beneath the shop. And the Jew said to them, Leave him, and let him rise. Whereupon Khalifa jumped up as if naught ailed him, and the Jew said to him, Tell me what price thou askest for this fish, and I will give it thee, for thou hast gotten but scant good of us this day. Answered the fisherman, Have no fear for me, O master, because of the beating, for I can eat ten donkeys' rations of stick. The Jew laughed at his words, and said, Allah upon thee, tell me what thou wilt have, and by the right of my faith I will give it thee. The fisherman replied, Not from thee will remunerate me, for this fish save two words whereof I spake. And the Jew said, Meseemeth thou wouldst have me become a Muslim? Khalifa rejoined, By Allah, O Jew, and thou Islamized will nor advantage the Muslims, nor damage the Jews, and in like manner, and thou hold to thy misbelief, twill nor damage the Muslims, nor advantage the Jews. But what I desire of thee is that thou rise to thy feet and say, Bear witness against me, O people of the market, that I barter my ape for the ape of Khalifa the fisherman, and my lot for the world for his lot, and my luck for his luck quoth the Jew. If this be all thou desirest, twill sit lightly upon me. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. Section 19 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, 1821 through 1890. Section 19. When it was the eight hundred and thirty-fifth night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the Jew said to Khalifa the fisherman, if this be all thou desirest, twill sit lightly upon me. So he rose without stay or delay, and standing on his feet, repeated the required words, after which he turned to the fisherman and asked him, Hast thou aught else to ask of me? No, answered he, and the Jew said, Go in peace. Hearing this, Khalifa sprung to his feet forthright, took up his basket and net, and returned straight to the Tigris, where he threw his net and pulled it in. He found it heavy, and brought it not ashore but with travail, when he found it full of fish of all kinds. Presently up came a woman with a dish, who gave him a dinar, and he gave her fish for it, and after her a eunuch, who also bought a dinar's worth of fish, and so forth, till he had sold ten dinars' worth. 
and he continued to sell ten dinars worth of fish daily for ten days till he had gotten an hundred dinars now khalifa the fisherman had quarters in the passage of the merchants and as he lay one night in his lodging much bemused with hashish he said to himself o khalifa the folk all know thee for a poor fisherman and now thou hast gotten an hundred golden dinars needs must the commander of the faithful harun al rashid hear of this from some one and haply he will be wanting money and will send for thee and say to thee i need a sum of money and it hath reached me that thou hast a hundred dinars so do thou lend them to me those same i shall answer o commander of the faithful i am a poor man and whoso told thee that i had an hundred dinars lied against me for i have naught of this thereupon he will commit me to the chief of police saying strip him of his clothes and torment him with the bastinado till he confess and give up the hundred dinars in his possession wherefore me seemeth to provide against this predicament the best thing i can do is to rise forthright and bash myself with a whip so to use myself to beating and his hashish said to him rise doff thy dress so he stood up and putting off his clothes took a whip he had by him and set handy a leathern pillow then he fell to lashing himself laying every other blow upon the pillow and roaring out the while alas alas by allah tis a false saying o my lord they have lied against me for i am a poor fisherman and have naught of the goods of the world the noise of the whip falling on the pillow and on his person resounded in the still of night and the folk heard it and amongst others the merchants and they said whatever can ail the poor fellow that he crieth and we hear the noise of blows falling on him twould seem robbers have broken in upon him and are tormenting him presently they all came forth of their lodgings at the noise of the blows and the crying and repaired to khalifa's room but they found the door locked and said one to other be like the robbers have come in upon him from the back of the adjoining saloon it behoveth us to climb over by the roofs so they clomb over the roofs and coming down through the skylight saw him naked and flogging himself and asked him what aileth thee o khalifa he answered know o folk that i have gained some dinars and fear lest my case be carried up to the prince of true believers harun al rashid and he send for me and demand of me those same gold pieces whereupon i should deny and i fear that if i deny he will torture me so i am torturing myself by way of accustoming me to what may come the merchants laughed at him and said leave this fooling may allah not bless thee and the dinars thou hast gotten verily thou hast disturbed us this night and hast troubled our hearts so khalifa left flogging himself and slept till the morning when he rose and would have gone about his business but bethought him of his hundred dinars and said in his mind and i leave them at home thieves will steal them and if i put them in a belt about my waist peradventure some one will see me and lay in wait for me till he come upon me in some lonely place and slay me and take the money but i have a device that should serve me well right well so he jumped up forthright and made him a pocket in the collar of his gabardine and tying the hundred dinars up in a purse laid them in the collar pocket then he took his net and basket and staff and went down to the tigris and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and thirty-sixth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that khalifa the fisherman having set his hundred dinars in the collar pocket took basket staff and net and went down to the tigris where he made a cast but brought up naught so he removed from that place to another and threw again but once more the net came up empty and he went on removing from place to place till he had gone half a day's journey from the city ever casting the net which kept bringing up naught so he said to himself by allah i will throw my net a stream but his once more whether ill come of it or weal then he hurled the net with all his force of the excess of his wrath and the purse with the hundred dinars flew out of his collar pocket and lighting in mid-stream was carried away by the strong current whereupon he threw down the net and plunged into the water after the purse he dived for it nigh a hundred times till his strength was exhausted and he came up for sheer fatigue without chancing on it when he despaired of finding the purse he returned to the shore where he saw nothing but staff net and basket 
and sought for his clothes, but could light on no trace of them. So he said in himself, O oh, vilest of those, wherefore was made the byword, The pilgrimage is not perfected, save by copulation with the camel. Then he wrapped the net about him, and taking staff in one hand and basket in the other, went trotting about like a camel in rut, running right and left and backwards and forwards, dishevelled and dusty, as he were a rebel merid let loose from Solomon's prison. So far for what concerns the fisherman Khalifa. But as regards the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, he had a friend, a jeweller called Ibn al-Qurnas, and all the traders, brokers, and middlemen knew him for the Caliph's merchant, wherefore there was not sold in Baghdad by way of rarities and things of price, or mamelukes or handmaidens, but was first shown to him. As he sat one day in his shop, behold, there came up to him the sheikh of the brokers, with a slave-girl, whose like seers never saw for she was of passing beauty and loveliness, symmetry and perfect grace, and among her gifts was that she knew all arts and sciences, and could make verses, and play upon all manner of musical instruments. So Ibn al Kirnis bought her for five thousand golden dinars, and clothed her with other thousand, after which he carried her to the prince of true believers, with whom she lay that night, and who made trial of her in every kind of knowledge and accomplishment, and found her versed in all sorts of arts and sciences, having no equal in her time. Her name was Kut al Kalub, and she was even as saith the poet, I fix my glance on her whene'er she wends, and non acceptance of my glance breeds pain. She favours graceful necked gazelle at gaze, and graceful as gazelle to say we're fain. And where is this beside the saying of another? Give me brunettes, the Syrian spears, so limber and so straight. Tell of the slender, dusky maids, so lithe and proud of gait. Languid of eyelids, with a down like silk upon her cheek. Within her wasting lover's heart, she queens it still in state. On the morrow the caliph sent for Ibn al Kirnas the jeweller, and bade him receive ten thousand dinars as to her price. And his heart was taken up with the slave-girl Kut al Kalub and he forsook the lady Zubaydah bint al Qasim, for all she was the daughter of his father's brother, and he abandoned all his favourite concubines, and abode a whole month without stirring from Kut al Kalub's side, save to go to the Friday prayers, and return to her in all haste. This was grievous to the lords of the realm, and they complained thereof to the wazir Jafar, the Barmecide, who bore with the commander of the faithful, and waited till the next Friday, when he entered the cathedral mosque, and foregathering with the caliph related to him all that occurred to him of extraordinary stories anent seld seen love and lovers with intent to draw out what was in his mind quoth the caliph by allah o jafar this is not of my choice but my heart is caught in the snare of love and what i not what is to be done the wazir jafar replied o commander of the faithful thou knowest how this girl kut al kalub is become at thy disposal and of the number of thy servants, and that which hand possesseth, soul coveteth not. Moreover, I will tell thee another thing, which is that the highest boast of kings and princes is in hunting, and the pursuit of sport and victory, and if thou apply thyself to this, perchance it will divert thee from her, and it may be thou wilt forget her. Rejoined the caliph, Thou sayest well, O Jafar, come, let us go a-hunting forthright, without stay or delay. So soon as Friday prayers were prayed, they left the mosque, and at once, mounting their she-mules, rode forth to the chase. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the eight hundred and thirty-seventh night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the caliph Harun al-Rashid and the wazir Jafar would go forth a-hunting and a-chasing, they mounted two she-mules, and fared on into the open country, occupied with talk, and their attendants outwent them. Presently the heat became overhot, and al-Rashid said to his wazir, O Jafar, I am sore athirst. Then he looked around, and espying a figure in the distance on a high mound, asked Jafar, Seest thou what I see? answered the wazir, Yes, O commander of the faithful, I see a dim figure on a high mound, belike he is the keeper of a garden or of a cucumber plot and in what so wise water will not be lacking in his neighbourhood, presently adding, I will go to him and fetch thee some. But al-Rashid said, My mule is swifter than thy mule. 
so do thou abide here on account of the troops whilst i go myself to him and get of this person drink and return so saying he urged his she mule which started off like racing wind or railing water and in the twinkling of an eye made the mound where he found the figure he had seen to be none other than khalifa the fisherman naked and wrapped in the net and indeed he was horrible to behold as to and fro he rolled with eyes for very redness like cresset gleam and dusty hair in dishevelled trim as he were an ifrit or a lion grim al rashid saluted him and he returned his salutation but he was wroth and fires might have been lit at his breath quoth the caliph o man hast thou any water and quoth khalifa ho thou art thou blind or jinn mad get thee to the river tigris for tis behind this mound so al rashid went around the mound and going down to the river drank and watered his mule then without a moment's delay he returned to khalifa and said to him what aileth thee o man to stand here and what is thy calling the fisherman cried this is a stranger and sillier question than that about the water seest thou not the gear of my craft on my shoulder said the caliph be like thou art a fisherman and he replied yes asked al rashid where is thy gabardine and where are thy waistcloth and girdle and where be the rest of thy raiment now these were the very things which had been taken from khalifa like for like so when he heard the caliph name them he got into his head that it was he who had stolen his clothes from the river bank and coming down from the top of the mound swiftlier than the blinding leaven laid hold of the mule's bridle saying hark ye man bring me back my things and leave jesting and joking al rashid replied by allah i have not seen thy clothes nor know aught of them now the caliph had large cheeks and a small mouth so khalifa said to him be like thou art by trade a singer or a piper on pipes but bring me back my clothes fairly and without more ado or i will bash thee with this my staff till thou be pissed thyself and befoul thy clothes when al rashid saw the staff in the fisherman's hand and that he had the vantage of him he said to himself by allah i cannot brook from this mad beggar half a blow of that staff now he had on a satin gown so he pulled it off and gave it to khalifa saying o man take this in place of thy clothes the fisherman took it and turned it about and said my clothes are worth ten of this painted abba cloak and rejoined the caliph put it on till i bring thee thy gear so khalifa donned the gown but finding it too long for him took a knife he had with him tied to the handle of his basket and cut off nigh a third of the skirt so that it fell only beneath his knees then he turned to al rashid and said to him allah upon thee o piper tell me what wage thou gettest every month from thy master for thy craft of piping replied the caliph my wage is ten dinars a month and khalifa continued by allah my poor fellow thou makest me sorry for thee why i make thy ten dinars every day hast thou a mind to take service with me and i will teach thee the art of fishing and share my gain with thee so shalt thou make five dinars a day and be my slavey and i will protect thee against thy master with this staff quoth al rashid i will well and quoth khalifa then get off thy she-ass and tie her up so she may serve us to carry the fish hereafter and come hither that i may teach thee to fish forthright so al rashid alighted and hobbling his mule tucked his skirts into his girdle and khalifa said to him o piper lay hold of the net thus and put it over thy forearm thus and cast it into the tigris thus accordingly the caliph took heart of grace and doing as the fisherman showed him threw the net and pulled at it but could not draw it up so khalifa came to his aid and tugged at it with him but the two together could not hail it up whereupon said the fisherman o piper of ill omen for the first time i took thy gown in place of my clothes but this second time i will have thine ass and will beat thee to boot till thou be piss and beskite thyself and i find my net torn quoth al rashid let the twain of us pull at once so they both pulled together and succeeded with difficulty in hauling that net ashore when they found it full of fish of all kinds and colours and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section nineteen recorded by sylvia m b in washington state section twenty of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume eight 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Sylvia M. B. in Washington State. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 8, by Anonymous. Translated by Richard Francis Burton, 1821-1890. through Section 20. When it was the eight hundred and thirty-eighth night, she pursued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Khalifa the fisherman and the caliph hauled that net ashore, they found it full of fish of all kinds. And Khalifa said to al-Rashid, By Allah, O piper, thou art foul of favor, but, an thou apply thyself to fishing, thou wilt make a mighty fine fisherman. But now twere best thou bestraddle thine ass, and make for the market, and fetch me a pair of frails. And I will look after the fish till thou return, when I and thou will load it on thine ass's back. I have scales and weights and all we want, so we can take them with us, and thou wilt have nothing to do but to hold the scales and pouch the price, for here we have fish worth twenty dinars, so be fast with the frails and loiter not. Answered the caliph, I hear and obey, and mounting, left him with his fish, and spurred his mule in high good humour, and ceased not laughing over his adventures with the fisherman, till he came up to Jafar, who said to him, O commander of the faithful, be like when thou wentest down to drink, thou foundest a pleasant flower-garden, and enterest, and took thy pleasure therein alone? At this al-Rashid fell a-laughing again, and all the barmecides rose, and kissed the ground before him, saying, O commander of the faithful, Allah make joy to endure for thee, and do away annoy from thee. What was the cause of thy delaying when thou farest to drink, and what hath befallen thee? Quoth the caliph, Verily, a right wondrous tale, and a joyous adventure, and a wondrous hath befallen me. And he repeated to them what had passed between himself and the fisherman, and his words, Thou stolest my clothes, and how he had given him his gown, and how he had cut off a part of it, finding it too long for him. Said Jafar, By Allah, O commander of the faithful, I had in mind to beg the gown of thee, but now I will go straight to the fisherman and buy it of him. The caliph replied, By Allah, he hath cut off a third part of the skirt and spoilt it. But, O Jafar, I am tired with fishing in the river, for I have caught great store of fish, which I left on the bank with my master Khalifa, and he is watching them and waiting for me to return to him with a couple of frails and a machete. Then we are to go, I and he, to the market and sell the fish and share the price. Jafar rejoined, O commander of the faithful, I will bring you a purchaser for your fish. And al-Rashid retorted, O Jafar, by the virtue of my holy forefathers, whoso bringeth me one of the fish that are before Khalifa, who taught me angling, I will give him for it a gold dinar. So the crier proclaimed among the troops that they should go forth and buy fish for the caliph, and they all rose and made for the riverside. Now, while Khalifa was expecting the caliph's return with the two frails, behold, the Mamelukes swooped down upon him like vultures, and took the fish and wrapped them in gold-embroidered kerchiefs, beating one another in their eagerness to get at the fishermen whereupon quoth khalifa doubtless these are of the fish of paradise and hending two fish in right hand and left plunged into the water up to his neck and fell a-saying o oh allah by the virtue of these fish let thy servant the piper my partner come to me at this very moment and suddenly up to him came a black slave which was the chief of the caliph's negro eunuchs he had tarried behind the rest by reason of his horse having stopped to make water by the way and finding that not remained of the fish, little or much, looked right and left till he espied Khalifa standing in the stream, with a fish in either hand, and said to him, Come hither, O fisherman. But Khalifa replied, Be gone, and none of your impudence. So the eunuch went up to him and said, Give me the fish, and I will pay thee their price. Replied the fisherman, Art thou little of wit? I will not sell them. Therewith the eunuch drew his mace upon him, and Khalifa cried out, saying, Strike not, O loon, better largesse than mace. So saying, he threw the two fishes to the eunuch, who took them and laid them in his kerchief. Then he put hand in pouch, but found not a single dirham, and said to Khalifa, O fisherman, verily thou art out of luck, for by Allah I have not a silver about me. But come to-morrow to the palace of the caliphate, and ask for the eunuch Sandal, whereupon the castrajos will direct thee to me, and by coming thither thou shalt get what falleth to thy lot, and therewith wend thy ways. Quoteth Khalifa, Indeed, this is a blessed day, and its blessedness was manifest from the first of it. Then he shouldered his net, and returned to Baghdad. And as he passed through the streets, the folk saw the caliph's gown on him, 
and stared at him till he came to the gate of his quarter, by which was the shop of the caliph's tailor, when the man saw him wearing a dress of the apparel of the caliph worth a thousand dinars, he said to him, O Khalifa, whence hadst thou that gown? replied the fisherman, What aileth thee to be impudent? I had it of one whom I taught to fish, and who has become my apprentice. I forgave him the cutting off of his hand, for that he stole my clothes, and gave me this cape in their place. So the tailor knew that the caliph had come upon him as he was fishing, and jested with him in giving him the gown. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the eight hundred and thirty-ninth night, she resumed, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the caliph came upon Khalifa the fisherman, and gave him his own gown in jest, wherewith the man fared home. Such was his case, but as regards Harun al-Rashid, he had gone out a-hunting and a-fishing, only to divert his thoughts from the damsel Kut al-Kalub. But when Zubaydah heard of her, and of the caliph's devotion to her, the lady was fired with jealousy, which the more especially fireth women, so that she refused meat and drink, and rejected the delights of sleep, and awaited the caliph's going forth on a journey or what not, that she might set a snare for the damsel. So when she learnt that he was gone hunting and fishing, she bade her women furnish the palace fairly, and decorate it splendidly, and serve up viands and confections and amongst the rest she made a china dish of the daintiest sweetmeats that can be made, wherein she had put bang. Then she ordered one of her eunuchs to go to the damsel Kut al-Kulub, and bid her to the banquet, saying, The lady Zubaydah bint al Qasim, the wife of the commander of the faithful, hath drunken medicine to-day, and, having heard tell of the sweetness of thy singing, longeth to divert herself somewhat of thine art. Kut al-Kulub replied, Hearing and obedience are due to Allah, and the lady Zubaydah, and rose without stay or delay, unknowing what was hidden for her in the secret purpose. Then she took with her what instruments she needed, and accompanying the eunuch, ceased not faring till she stood in the presence of the princess. When she entered, she kissed ground before her, again and again. Then rising to her feet, said, Peace be on the lady of the exalted seat, and the presence whereto none may avail, daughter of the house of Abbasi, and scion of the prophet's family. May Allah fulfill thee of peace and prosperity in the days and the years. Then she stood with the rest of the women and eunuchs. And presently the lady Zubaydah raised her eyes and considered her beauty and loveliness. She saw a damsel with cheeks smooth as rose, and breasts like granado, a face moon-bright, a brow flower-white, and great eyes black as night. Her eyelids were languor dight, and her face beamed with light as if the sun from her forehead arose, and the murks of the night from the locks of her brow, and the fragrance of musk from her breath strayed, and flowers bloomed in her lovely face inlaid. The moon beamed from her forehead, and in her slender shape the branches swayed. She was like the full moon shining in the nightly shade. Her eyes wantoned, her eyebrows were like a bow arched, and her lips of coral moulded. Her beauty amazed all who espied her, and her glances amated all who eyed her. Glory be to him who formed her, and fashioned her, and perfected her. Brief, she was even as saith the poet of one who favoured her. When she's incensed, thou seest folk like slain, and when she's pleased, their souls are quick again. Her eyne are armed with glances magical, wherewith she kills and quickens as she's fain. The worlds she leadeth captive with her eyes, as though the worlds were all her slavish train. Quoth the Lady Zubaydah, Welcome, and welcome, and fair cheer to thee, O Kut al-Kalub. Sit and diverse us with thine art, and the goodliness of thine accomplishments. Quoth the damsel, I hear, and I obey. And putting out her hand, took the tambourine, whereof one of its praisers speaketh in the following verses. Ho thou, O the tabret, my heart takes flight, and love smit cries while thy fingers smite. Thou takest naught but a wounded heart the while for acceptance longs the white. So say, thou word, or heavy, or light, play whate'er thou please, it will charm the sprite. Sois bon, unveil thy cheek, ma belle, rise, deftly dance, in all heart's delight. Then she smote the tambourine briskly, and so sang thereto, that she stopped the birds in the sky, and the place danced with them blithely. After which she laid down the tambourine, and took the pipe, whereof it is said, she hath eyes whose babes with their fingers sign to sweet tunes without a discordant line and as the poet also said in this couplet and whence she announceth the will to sing 
for union joy tis a time divine then she laid down the pipe after she had charmed therewith all who were present and took up the lute whereof saith the poet how many a blooming bough in glee girl's hand is fain as lute to witch great souls by charm of cunning strain she sweeps tormenting lute strings by her artful touch with finger tips that surely chain with endless chain then she tightened its pegs and tuned its strings and laying it in her lap bended over it as mother bendeth over child and it seemed as it were of her and her lute that the poet spoke in these couplets sweetly discourses she on persian string and unintelligence makes understand and teaches she that loves a murtherer who oft the reasoning muslim hath unmanned a maid by allah in whose palm of thing of painted wood like mouth can speech command with lute she stauncheth flow of love and so stops flow of blood the cunning leech's hand then she preluded in fourteen different modes and sang to the lute an entire piece so as to confound the gazers and delight her hearers after which she recited these two couplets the coming unto thee is blessed therein new joys for i attend its blisses are continuous its blessings never end and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say when it was the eight hundred and fortieth night she said it hath reached me o auspicious king that the maiden kut al kalub after singing these songs and sweeping the strings in presence of the lady zubidah rose and exhibited tricks of sleight of hand and ledger domain and all manner of pleasing arts till the princess came near to fall in love with her and said to herself verily my cousin al rashid is not to blame for loving her then the damsel kissed ground before zubaydah and sat down whereupon they set food before her presently they brought her the drugged dish of sweetmeats and she ate thereof and hardly had it settled in her stomach when her head fell backward and she sank on the ground sleeping with this the lady said to her women carry her up to one of the chambers till i summon her and they replied we hear and we obey then said she to one of her eunuchs fashion me a chest and bring it hitherto to me and shortly afterwards she bade make the semblance of a tomb and spread the report that kut al kalub had choked and died threatening her familiars that she would smite the neck of whoever should say she is alive now behold the caliph suddenly returned from the chase and the first inquiry he made was for the damsel so there came to him one of his eunuchs whom the lady zubaydah had charged to declare she was dead if the caliph should ask for her and kissing ground before him said may thy head live o my lord be certified that kut al kalub choked in eating and is dead whereupon cried al rashid god never gladden thee with good news o thou bad slave and entered the palace where he heard of her death from every one and asked where is her tomb so they brought him to the sepulchre and showed him the pretended tomb saying this is her burial place when he saw it he cried out and wept and embraced it quoting these two couplets by allah o tomb have her beauty seized and disappeared from sight and is the countenance changed and wan that shone so wonder bright o tomb o tomb thou art neither heaven nor garden verily how comes it then that swain branch and moon in thee unite the caliph weeping sore for her abode by the tomb a full hour after which he arose and went away in the utmost distress and the deepest melancholy so the lady zubaydah saw that her plot had succeeded and forthright sent for the eunuch and said hither with the chest he set it before her when she bade bring the damsel and locking her up therein said to the eunuch take all pains to sell this chest and make it a condition with the purchaser that he buy it locked then give alms with its price so he took it and went forth to do her bidding thus fared it with these but as for khalifa the fisherman when morning morrowed and shone with its light and sheen he said to himself i cannot do aught better to-day than visit the eunuch who bought the fish of me for he appointed me to come to him in the palace of the caliphate so he went forth of his lodging intending for the palace and when he came thither he found mamelukes negro slaves and eunuchs standing and sitting and looking at them behold seated amongst them was the eunuch who had taken the fish of him with the white slaves waiting on him presently one of the mameluk lads called out to him whereupon the eunuch turned to see who he was and lo it was the fisherman now when khalifa was ware that he saw him and recognized him he said to him 
i have not failed thee o my little tulip on this wise are men of their word hearing his address sandal the eunuch laughed and replied by allah thou art right o fisherman and put his hand to his pouch to give him somewhat but at that moment there arose a great clamour so he raised his head to see what was to do and finding that it was the wazir jafar the barmecide coming forth from the caliph's presence he rose to him and forewent him and they walked about conversing for a longsome time khalifa the fisherman waited a while then growing weary of standing and finding that the eunuch took no heed of him he set himself in his way and beckoned to him from afar saying o my lord tulip give me my due and let me go the eunuch heard him but was ashamed to answer him because of the minister's presence so he went on talking with jafar and took no notice whatever of the fisherman whereupon quoth khalifa o oh, slow o pay may allah put to shame all churls and all who take folk's goods and are niggardly with them i put myself under thy protection o oh, my lord Branbelly, to give me my due and let me go the eunuch heard him but was ashamed to answer him before jafar and the minister saw the fisherman beckoning and talking to him though he knew not what he was saying so he said to sandal misliking his behaviour o oh, eunuch what would yonder beggar with thee sandal replied dost thou not know him o my lord the wazir and jafar answered by allah i know him not how should i know a man i have never seen but at this moment rejoined the eunuch o oh, my lord this is a fisherman whose fish we seized on the banks of the tigris i came too late to get any and was ashamed to return to the prince of true believers empty-handed when all the mamelukes had some presently i espied the fisherman standing in midstream calling on allah with four fishes in his hands and said to him give me what thou hast there and take their worth he handed me the fish and i put my hand into my pocket purposing to gift him with somewhat but found naught therein and said come to me in the palace and i will give thee wherewithal to aid thee in thy poverty so he came to me to-day and i was putting hand to pouch that i might give him somewhat when thou camest forth and i rose to wait on thee and was diverted with thee from him till he grew tired of waiting and this is the whole story how he cometh to be standing here and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section twenty recorded by sylvia m b in washington state